go. Okay, I see that we're recording. And um, my name is Harmon Zuckerman, and I am calling my last planning board meeting to order. This is the planning board meeting for Thursday, March 4th, 2021. We're beginning here at 6.02. Um, and we have a uh, <clears throat> pretty uh, large number of folks who are here tonight for, uh, I assume, the Waterview project. Um, we've done a couple of things differently around this, uh, this project than we have in the past. Um, we created a sign-up sheet for people who want to speak to this project, and uh, we're also accepting sign-ups here in real time. If you haven't gotten on the sign-up sheet, you can um, either use it now or uh, how would you do that, Jean? Should they use the nope. sign-up link or? No, nope, the sign-up link is, is down. Um, we'll go through the folks that have signed up first, and then we'll, um, we'll use the raise hand function after that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And, and we'll, we'll explain that again when the time comes. So don't you worry. Um, the, uh, the first order of business tonight um, is just to have public participation. And for those of you who um, haven't uh, heard this speech before, public participation is for um, matters that aren't on the public hearing agenda tonight. So if you want to speak to any of the items that are on the public hearing agenda tonight, which is uh, a site review and a use review for the Waterview project at 5801 and 5847 Arapahoe Avenue, um, then you'll have to wait until after those uh, site and use reviews are heard to, uh, to make your, your, uh, your opinion heard. Uh, on the other hand, if you wanna talk about something that's of general interest to the planning board, you can do that in this first public participation matter. So to get us uh, ready to swing into public participation, I'm going to turn it over to Jean Gatza, who's our moderator for tonight, and Jean's going to go over the rules for our virtual hearing. Jean? Great. Thanks, Harmon. Um, so we, um, we are aiming to keep these meetings respectful and orderly, and as such, we have some protocol for the virtual meeting. Any activities that disrupt, delay, or interfere with the meeting are prohibited, and just as, it would, as if it would be um, if we were meeting in person, the time for speaking or asking questions is limited. Either I or Harmon, the board chair, will recognize um, the applicants or members of the public to speak and unmute you at, at the appropriate time. We need anyone intending to address the board to please use a full name displayed um, on your, um, in your Zoom box. Um, if your full name is not currently displayed and you would like to address the board, um, you can change it or you can send it to me in the chat and I'm happy to change it for you. Um, video will not be allowed except for board, staff, and applicants. All others will participate by voice only. Um, Harmon, the board chair, or Cindy, or I will enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates the rules. Um, the chat function, um, does go to all the folks that are panelists, but please use that for technical issues only to communicate with me as the host. Um, it's, we really can't have side conversations or questions about the topics at hand um, being discussed within the chat. Um, if that starts to happen, I will turn that off. Um, and only staff and board members will be allowed to share their screens. So as Harmon mentioned, we have a lot of folks here tonight to speak to the public hearing. Um, we will have the open comment first, which is three minutes each um, for topics that are not uh, the, the Waterview project that is on for the public hearing. Um, when we get to that, when we get to the Waterview public hearing, it will be um, two minutes each. We'll go through the list of folks um, that have signed up ahead. And then after that, we'll use the raise hand function. So um, for the open comment, we'll use the raise hand function. You can find that at probably at the bottom of your screen that just says raise hand. If it's not there, it may be in your participants box. You can open that participants box. Sometimes the raise hand is at that function. Um, and if you are on the phone, you can use star nine to raise your hand. If you can't find any of those things, you can send me your name in the chat to let me know that you would like to speak under the general open comment. Okay. Um, Harmon, Cindy, did I miss anything? Uh, I think um, just the only thing is for tonight, 
Um, we've had such a large number of people uh, commenting via email and so forth that we'd like to make sure that people not only put their full name uh, up on Zoom for making public comment, but also that they tell us uh, their name and address on the record as they begin their, uh, their testimony, okay? Thanks, Harmon. Okay, All so right. um, if anyone would like to address the board for open comment, now is the time to um, use that raise hand function. Okay, I'm seeing no, I'm seeing no hands for open comment. Oh, wait, there's one. Okay. There's Ryan Bonick. Ryan, um, you may unmute and um, have three minutes. I, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Uh, my name is Ryan Bonick. I live at uh, 3120 Pearl Parkway. Uh, I'm not really one for public speaking, um, but I care a lot about this housing and the positive impact that it'll have. Sorry, this is for uh, with regards to the Waterview Apartments. Okay, Ryan, we're going to open the public hearing for that um, in a little bit. Oh, okay. um, so if you could um, hold your comments, that would be great, and we'll get you signed up for that time. Okay, and I see Lynn Siegel with a hand up, and then Peter Oliveri. So, Lynn, if you would like to address the board um, on the, the um, on general topics, you may unmute. Please stop the subsidies. East Boulder is being overdeveloped without the infrastructure necessary, and we can't pay for our libraries as it is. We need rec centers, libraries, police, fire, all that stuff ahead of time, not after the fact. That isn't how it works, especially in a disastrous economic global situation like we have now. Stop already. Stop with the subsidies. Boulder cannot grow their way out of this problem. It's not gonna happen. Face up because otherwise it's gonna come back on you and you're gonna find out the hard way. This is not responsible way to grow. And if more people need to be in the society, then they need to move and start their own communities. But if you just keep on letting the community that exists get bigger and bigger, you get New York City. And guess what New York's doing right now? Caving. The virus is starting all over again in New York City because it's too big and it's too close and People can't learn on their own. Like I'm trying to impress on you and I'm so sorry that I have to come here and say this each time that you have a planning board meeting. But nothing ever changes. And I'm not gonna go down without at least having tried. Other communities can develop the way they want to. If they wanna be big, huge communities or they wanna spread out somewhere, Great, Boulder doesn't need to spread out anymore. We don't have the infrastructure to do it as it is. So let's grow responsibly. Hold to the 55 foot moratorium. And balance jobs housing. And don't worry about saving the world. Everybody has to save the world themselves in all these little outlying communities that learned from Boulder. 
But the way it is now, Boulder's just expanding irresponsibly and it's not a community to learn from. Done. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, I see Peter Oliveris has your hand up. Peter, you may speak and I'll, you, or you may unmute yourself now. There you go. Thank you. Good, good evening. Can you guys hear me? We can. Great. Hi, good evening. My name is Peter Oliveris. I'm a master's student in the environmental policy program at CU Boulder. Uh, I'm at 180 South 31st Street in South Boulder. Um, and I just wanted to say when considering new developments um, that I think it's smart to, and I'm not fully versed in the planning process, but I think it would be smart to consider uh, future climate risks when accounting for these new developments. Um, you know, will they be able to get, uh, you know, the water for their developments at a cheap price? Will they be on land that's either, um, you know, reclaimed or too dry to support any other type of activity um, or things like that? Um, so I just wanted to make the planning board aware that, uh, pursuing future sustainability efforts and accounting for climate risks in the planning process um, would be helpful for the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Peter. And then I see Ben Holland. Ben, um, you may unmute yourself. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Ben Holland. I'm a Boulder resident. I've worked at the Environmental Nonprofit Rocky Mountain Institute or RMI for about 10 years. I'm excited about this project because it is very much in keeping with the views and priorities of RMI's urban transformation team. This is a team that I work on. Hey, ben, 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 hey, are, are you talking about the Waterview project, Ben? Yeah, sorry, I, I'm jumping the okay. gun. Yeah, you're, you're supposed to, yeah, you are, but um, we're, we're gonna hope, open public comment for that after we've had the presentation. So okay. stick around yeah. if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Harmon, I see no other hands for open comment. Okay, great. Let's move on to dispositions, planning board call-ups and continuations, third item on the agenda. And we have three call-up items tonight. Um, the first one is a uh, final plat for the Saddle Creek subdivision located at 90 and 96 Arapahoe Avenue for a two lot subdivision associated with the redevelopment of the property that was approved as a site review in 2019. This approval is subject to a potential call up on or before March 5th, 2021. Um, we're gonna do two things first. One is um, we're just gonna see if any planning board member has any disclosures that they need to make or recusals that they need to uh, do. And then we're gonna have a, uh, a small, uh, a small um, quick description of what this call up's about um, by staff. So I see John's hand up for disclosures. Yeah, nothing to disclose here. Can you say that again, John? It was breaking up. Okay, I, I should I should have waited to raise my hand. I have nothing to disclose right now. Do any other planning board members, or does any planning board member, I should say, have anything to disclose or need to recuse? Okay, I think besides the fact that most of us already uh, we're part of the planning board when we approve this site review. Uh, I don't have anything to disclose. So I'm gonna turn it over to Elaine McLaughlin who is in charge of this project as the case planner. Elaine, if you wanna give a little uh, brief description of what this is about. Sure, happy to. Thanks um, everybody. Um, this is uh, the final plat and subdivision agreement that's associated with um, the subdivision for the redevelopment of a project that was approved a couple of years ago in 2019. It includes 46 attached units, 19 of which are uh, planned as permanently affordable. Um, and that's on the 90 Arapahoe site, 96 Arapahoe, just as a refresher is um, the September School, which is a nonprofit high school. Um, so this um, Annexation also included landmarking and adaptively reusing the motel buildings um, out on the site. Um, and so since this, um, it was approved, the tech docs have been um, under review and they were recently approved. And uh, so that's the current status. I'm happy to answer any questions. Anybody have any questions for Jean, John? Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, if if 
what is uh, the status of the project now if it's consistent with what was approved uh, when we dealt with it previously uh, or if there's been any significant changes? Uh, there have been no significant changes, nope. Okay, thank you. Sorry, John, could you repeat that? You're breaking up again. I'm sorry, I, I just wanted to say thank you. That, that was my question. Oh, great, okay. Okay, so is there any interest in calling this project up? All right, let's move on to the second call up item, which is a form-based code amendment to a previously approved project, case number LUR 2019-00028 for buildings 3A, 3B, 3C, and 3D, along with building 4N. Proposal includes revised architecture with the addition of 10 dwelling units at 3001 Pearl Parkway. This approval is subject to potential call up on or before March 5th, 2021. Um, are there any members of the planning board who have a disclosure or recusal oh. request? Sarah? I don't have a disclosure, but I do have some questions. Okay, that'll be in a second. Any disclosures, recusals? Okay. Um, then I'm going to give it over to Elaine to give a brief uh, description of what's going on with this call-up item, and then we can take questions. You bet. So, so this is a, a form-based code amendment, and um, it's at 30 Pearl. As some of you recall, 30 Pearl is um, site at 30th and Pearl Street and includes a mix of uses. Um, it was approved in two separate phases. Um, for a total of 294 residential units, of which 120 are permanently affordable. In this particular case, it's several buildings essentially in the uh, northeast quadrant. And unlike um, site review, form-based codes, not discretionary. In other words, the application has to meet prescriptive design considerations from things like build to zones to building length. Um, entrance locations, vertical, horizontal, facade divisions, um, a number of different types of design considerations such as window openings and transparency. So if the requirements aren't met, um, the applicant has to demonstrate the rationale for any exceptions. In this case, there's five exceptions that are requested um, that essentially have to do with an existing Piesco easement. There's that, um, uh, power line in this location. It overlaps into the build two zone along Goose Creek, this is just as it was um, when the buildings were originally approved. And so there's um, some exceptions we requested in that regard, a uh, build two corner, a type A frontage build two zone, entrance locations, blank wall segments, and where the transformers located. Um, so I'm happy to entertain any questions. Yeah, so before, before we get into that, what was the, uh, the noticing that was provided for this matter? Um, notice is provided to within 600 feet for um, all um, residents in the area, including apartments. That's part of the form-based code requirements. So that includes tenants, not just property owners? Yep. Okay, Sarah, your question? Um, thanks, um, Elaine. So my I, uh, my question is um, a little bit of actually about the tr transition, the changeover from the townhomes into flats. And I realize, as you described, the um, external form-based code changes that that seems to be the primary focus. But I didn't understand quite if there were um, in interior form-based code requirements as well, because um, it means we have no the townhome idea is sort of disappearing from this development. Uh, that's correct. So there are no uh, standards related to the interior. And so there were no, there were no particular um, modifications that were allowed as a result of the particular type of housing dwelling units that were approved no. other than the, other than the permanently affordable. Um, yeah, that's correct. It was just the permanently affordable that were mingled throughout 30 Pearl and are getting built out throughout 30 Pearl. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for staff? Any interest in calling this matter? Yeah, yes, I have a, a question. Oh, John, go ahead. Yeah, uh, also uh, following up on what's happening internally, 
Uh, I see that uh, the, the proposal for having a, a co-living arrangement or cooperative living arrangement seems to have uh, been eliminated. Is, is that the case? Uh, that's correct. It's, it's apartments. Um, and again, um, use and interiors aren't um, overseen by form-based code. But uh, so does the planning board have any role in uh, approving those changes? Um, it's, it would have to be based on the very prescriptive form-based code requirements, which are essentially form-based as it implies design um, elements um, and such. Um, It's again, it's almost like something so, you have to determine if it meets the criteria or not. Okay, well, I'm, uh, I'm a bit disappointed about that because I am concerned with the charter too about loss of the townhomes and of the uh, cooperative living arrangements. Um, but if, if, uh, if we have no control over that, then I suppose there's no point calling it up. So, but I, I, but I suppose when the next form-based code concept comes up, we could discuss whether this is something to touch on the in interior, um, uh, because because the type of dwelling units that are built actually matter as much as you know what kind of design the building is. I I, I personally think. Um, Elaine, could I give a little information on that? Sure. Jump right in. Um, thank you, John, for your question. Um, for those of you on the call, I'm Kirk Fernhauer, we're Director of Housing and Human Services. So um, if you recall on 30 Pearl, there was um, um, a couple of parcels that were market, uh, market rate uh, housing. And um, so we put those, um, those parcels up for sale in um, with um, an intent or rating according to um, sort of what they were going to deliver. And um, for that particular um, piece, John, we were asking um, or preferring some sort of co-housing type um, developments. Um, we did get um, uh, one proposal um, for a co-housing type development. Um, However, the, the proposal, um, and, and this was last summer when we got those proposals, it was, it was in the midst of, of COVID um, and at a point in COVID where we didn't really know where the market was going and the applicants didn't, or the people who are, were trying to purchase it didn't really either. Um, and so there wasn't, um, uh, it, it wasn't as competitive a, a proposal and um, it was, there was uncertainty whether they would be able to um, accomplish the, the co-housing on that site. Um, we would have also hoped for that outcome and that's what we worked towards, um, but it, it, through the process, um, it didn't end up that way. So if I can just uh, inquire, what does this imply for how things go in the future? Are you changing your attitude? I'm sorry, can you repeat that, John? I'm so, so I'm just asking how you intend to proceed with these decisions in the future. You mean if we had a similar type project or? Yes, I mean, whether you continue to be interested in co-housing arrangements. Hey, hey, John. Um, John, seems like most of the time yes. you're uh, you're you're coming in, your 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 voice and and stuff is coming in slow and garbled. Um, oh. I don't know if maybe you can change your internet connection or log out and log back in. Other trick is uh, to turn But off if you want to get video. this, if you turn off your video, yeah, you should do time. that too. Mm -hmm. Go yeah, ahead and turn off your audio, video, John, and. Maybe just do okay. audio. I may disappear for a minute. And ask your I'm... question again. Okay. It may be okay. I hope this is. I hope this is better now. Um, yeah, so I was just now. asking whether there's been a change in attitude uh, regarding co-housing uh, on upcoming projects. 
Um, not at all. Um, yeah, we would fully support um, co-housing on similar projects in the future. As well, um, we also um, would prefer to get some uh, home ownership units as well. Um, the co-housing that was proposed was actually, um, if I recall, it was it was a it was a rental approach to co-housing. Um, but um, yes, we are certainly um, hoping that we can get future uh, co-housing projects on future developments. Okay, we have any more questions okay, thank for you. staff or desire to call this up? Okay, then we're gonna move on to the third call up item, which is a final plat to subdivide the property at 4475 Broadway. It's a one lot suitable for residential development and one lot in association with the Ponderosa Community Stabilization Program. Ponderosa Habitat Subdivision Final Plat, Tech 2020, quadruple zero six. The subdivision is consistent with approved site review, number LUR 2019-0015, and the Memorandum of Understanding in lieu of annexation for case number LUR 2019-0016. This application is subject to potential call up on or before March 4th, 2021. The preliminary plat was approved through case number LUR 2020, quadruple zero six. I'm um, going to turn it over to uh, Charles. I think it's Sloan going to handle uh, giving a preamble for this before we ask questions. Yeah, I think Sloan can summarize this one quickly. Great, thanks. All right. Um, good evening. So before so, you go, Sloan, oh. is there anyone who needs to, to um, recuse or, or make any kind of uh, disclosures for this matter? Okay, go ahead, Sloan. Okay, so um, the intent of this item is basically to subdivide the site to eliminate the existing parcel lines, create an outlot for the portion of the site that extends to Broadway and dedicate necessary easements required to serve the development. Um, and I would just note that this development was phased and the first phase has been completed. All the necessary utilities have been constructed um, as well as street improvements on 10th and Cherry Avenue. So they're just moving forward to the next phase. <laughs> Okay, great. Thanks for the explanation. Any questions for Sloan or Kurt? I know this is a big piece for the housing department too. Okay, seeing none, uh, assuming no one wants to call it up, but I'll ask, does anyone want to call it up? Okay, all right, we're all done with call-ups. We haven't called up any of the items. And now we're going to move into our public hearing item for the night. Um, and I'll read the agenda title. This is a uh, public hearing and planning board consideration of the following items related to the 14.88 acre site at 5801 and 5847 Arapaho Avenue. One, a site review application to develop the site with 317 residential units and approximately 15,000 square feet of ground floor commercial space for office retail and residential uses. The proposal includes constructing 10 buildings surrounded, surrounding a loop drive with one access from Arapaho Avenue. 421 parking spaces are proposed where 439 spaces are required, a 4.1% parking reduction. The development includes 25% permanently affordable housing. The proposal requires review by planning board for the request for an increase in maximum allowable building height for three buildings. This is case number LUR 2019-0021. Second public hearing item under this agenda title is a use review application to allow for the following uses as part of the redevelopment of the site, same site as I just described, residential uses within the IG zoning district, professional technical or other offices within the RH4 zoning district, convenience retail within the RH4 zoning district, and a restaurant, brew pub or tavern within the RH4 zoning district with 144 indoor and 50 outdoor seats, case number LUR 2019-0022. Uh, first order of business under this hearing item is to check in with my planning board colleagues around uh, disclosures and possible recusals. And uh, for this project, I am going to go uh, person by person calling on planning board member Sajan. Uh, I have been walking around the area several times and uh, otherwise have nothing to, to mention. Okay, and David? Should I mute myself again? No, you sounded almost good that time. You're fine. David? Uh, yes, I have uh, done uh, numerous uh, uh, bypasses uh, past the property where I've uh, lo looked and toured around. 
Um, also, um, with the amount of publicity this has gotten, I have seen some articles come out in the paper and uh, have uh, tried not to uh, take uh, not to read them. Uh, but uh, I, I will say that I've noticed that there has been, uh, and there, I've had two individuals in the community approach me, and happily I can report that they both uh, brought their concerns to the entire board. So uh, I don't have to worry about that. So I should uh, should be fine uh, with being uh, uh, fair and, uh, uh, on this matter. Okay, so when you say you should be fine and, and fair, you mean that you can objectively review this project under the criteria. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much. Sarah, you're welcome. Sarah. <laughs> um, I also, uh, certainly during COVID, walked past that site a lot. Um, and uh, also, like David, noticed the um, significant amount of um, public uh, publicity around this site in the newspaper and um, uh, also tried to um, uh, not uh, so I, I, I read the articles and sort of left it at that. Um, and I believe I can make um, objective, what's the other language I have to use, Harmon? I guess you could say criteria-based decisions. I will make criteria-based decisions. Yes, I will. Good. Lisa. And nothing to disclose on this. Because I might briefly interrupt. Go ahead, Hella. Can I ask Sarah one more question? Sarah, yes, will you be ahead, able Ellen. to make the decision just based on the information provided for the not including uh, the answer, what the you answer read to in that is yes. Sir? I I have my six page criteria questions right in front of me. So yes. <laughs> Thanks, Hella. Lupita. Nothing to disclose. I'm fine. Okay, thank you, Peter. Nothing to disclose. Okay, I have a few things to disclose. Um, I, <clears throat> first of all, I guess I was uh, on planning board in 2017 when this project first came forward for concept review. And, uh, and so I've seen it already. Second is um, I've seen publicity around this in the newspaper, though I haven't read the articles. Um, the third is that like uh, many other projects that have been in front of planning board over the last couple of years, since I took on uh, the work as the attorney for um, the project proponent for a project in Gilpin County, um, I share the relationship with that project proponent of being employed by that project proponent with Coburn and with JV, JVA, who's the architect and the engineer. In other words, JVA and Coburn are both working for the applicant uh, in the Gilpin County project. I am the applicant's attorney. Um, that said, I don't have any contractual or pecuniary or any other kind of relationship um, with either JVA or with, um, or with Coburn. Um, and uh, we've analyzed this a lot of times. And uh, I think Ella's probably gonna ask me the same questions she's asked me a lot of times about um, that relationship or lack thereof. And then finally, one of the project proponents here is William Shutkin, who teaches in the Masters of the Environment program. I'm an instructor in the Masters of the Environment program. Um, but to the extent that um, that has anything to do with my, well, I don't think it has anything to do with my ability to be objective in reviewing this application. And I've been successful in keeping William from talking to me about um, this project for the last two years. So um, I have had no conversations with him about Waterview to disclose. So Hella, if you want to let the grilling begin. Um, Harmon, if I can just mention, yeah, I, I, I forgot to mention, I have spoken with uh, people at various times about this project, but I feel that I can be objective and, uh, and fair in my assessment of it. Okay, thank you. And Harman, you might need to be grilled by Hella too. <laughs> Harman, can you be fair and impartial in making a decision on this application today? Yes, I can. Thank you. Well, that was an easy grilling. Do you need to grill John too, or is is it fine? I think he well, 
John, um, <clears throat> will you be able to base the decision on the evidence provided for this hearing today and not your converse, what you learned during the conversation outside of the hearing? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John, and thank you, Hella, and thanks to the board. Um, so now that uh, we've gotten through our disclosures and I've read the agenda titles, I'm going to turn it over to our development review manager, the esteemed Charles Farrow. And Charles, if you would um, take us into the staff presentation for this, it would be wonderful. Thank you. I'm happy to. Uh, good evening, chair members of the board. Thanks for having us this evening. So um, before you tonight, we have a, a fairly complex proposal. Um, and as Harmon mentioned, it's uh, been in conceptual development for quite some time last before the board in 2017. Um, so uh, consequently, both staff and the applicant have requested uh, a bit of longer periods of time for our presentations so that we can be as thorough as possible, uh, particularly for the benefit of the viewing public this evening. So uh, we appreciate you granting us a bit of uh, extra time to do that this evening. I'd also like to note that um, we have a number of members from our staff team here tonight to answer specific questions. Kristen Shepard is with us to respond to uh, flood related questions. Edward Stafford um, from our public works engineering team is also here to respond to flood and transportation related questions, as well as Kurt Fernhaber uh, to respond to any questions related to uh, affordable housing. So with that said, I'm pleased to turn it over to Sloan Wahlberg. She's gonna take you through staff's analysis tonight. Sloan, before you get going, how how much time has, uh, do you expect to need and how much time has the applicant requested over the typical 15 minutes? Um, the applicant's aiming for 15 minutes. I'll probably be more like 20, if that's okay, or I can okay. cut back if you'd prefer. No, I'll, I'll say that's okay. And, uh, and I'll make that a decision of the board um, unless they feel like voting me down, you can have your 20. And, um, and then I'll just remind the applicant that after their presentation and we've heard public comment, um, we reserve three minutes for, um, for rebuttal purposes only, not for any kind of continuation of the applicant's presentation, but if anything came up that they want to correct, uh, they can do that after public comment. So go ahead, Sloan, take your time. Okay, let me go ahead and share and bring up my notes. All right, can everyone see that okay? All right, awesome. Um, well, thanks for the introduction. So for the agenda tonight is a mixed use development at 5801 and 5847 Arapahoe Avenue. I'm gonna attempt to give sort of a high level overview of the proposal and the staff memo. Um, but as Charles mentioned, I'm happy to answer any more detailed questions that you may have. Um, so just to start, why are we here? So. Site review is required based on the area of the site and prior approvals. And a concept plan was reviewed by the planning board on August 17th of 2017. There is a number of modifications requested through the site review, including um, a building height modification for buildings one, two, and 10. Also in the number of stories for building 10, a front yard setback reduction for the restaurant patio and a 4.1% parking reduction for the development. Um, there's also a number of uses that require use review as you described in the title. And planning board um, decision and a public hearing is required for the item based on the height modification request. So as part of the public process, written notice was sent um, and notice was posted on the property. In response to the public notice, there was a large number of comments received, um, primarily from residents of Old Tail Road, but um, from others in the community as well. The large nearly 15 acre property is located in East Boulder on the north side of East Arapahoe Avenue, west of Cherryvale. The site is comprised of two separate properties um, and is bounded by the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway to the north and South Boulder Creek runs through the site. Um, just to give some background, the site is vacant and has been for some time. The property was annexed to the city in 1982 and was zoned industrial as part of annexation. The Eastern property was um, part of the Boulder Auto Park PUD approved in 1985. 
In 2001, the parcel was changed to the high density residential and light industrial land use designations. And that was approved based on a request by the owner to redevelop the property into a mix of light industrial and residential uses and heights up to 55 feet. Um, that was generally referred to as the Waterview Center. That mm -hmm. site review um, was approved but has since expired. There was a number of subsequent concept plans um, with a similar use or types of uses proposed, but those were not pursued. And as I mentioned, the most recent being in 2017, the concept plan review um, related to this site review. And I would just note too, as um, Charles said, a lot of work has been done since that time in refining the proposal and um, the plans. So the site is designated as light industrial and open space on the land use map of the comprehensive plan. The South Boulder Creek corridor is protected by public easements over the multi-use path, including an open space in Mountain Park's scenic easement over portions. And these areas are designated as open space development rights. And um, I would just note too that the addition of residential development and industrial zones was originally permitted as a result of the jobs population project completed in 2003. Um, and residential development is permitted in industrial zones, mostly located on the edges of the city like this one. Uh, in terms of zoning, the property is split zoned with the majority of the site located within the IG district, but with that Southeast corner within the RH4 zone district, that RH4 zoning um, is a remnant of the land use designation change that I described in um, 2001, 2002. Um, in terms of adopted plans, the East Arapaho Transportation Plan was adopted in 2018, which is a long range plan um, for a number of potential transportation improvements along the East Arapaho Corridor, including most notably um, bus rapid transit. The next phases in the plan include finalizing the corridor design and um, completing some of the shorter term localized improvements along the corridor. The property is also located within the boundaries of the East Boulder subcommunity plan, which is currently undergoing an area planning process. Um, as you can see in this graphic, it's currently in the concept development phase of work. So as it relates to this project, it's just important to note that we're still fairly early in the planning process on that plan. As I described, um, South Boulder Creek runs north south through the site. There's also a pond located on the north west corner of the site. The property is impacted by the South Boulder Creek floodplains, including the 500 year, 100 year conveyance zone and high hazard zones. And the city in cooperation with the prior and current owner has been working to receive um, FEMA approval to optimize the conveyance zone on the site. And a letter of map revision has received technical approval by FEMA and has been formally issued. So these plans reflect the new flood um, boundaries. Um, similarly, the areas surrounding the creek and pond are considered high functioning wetlands. Both the inner and outer buffer impact the sites um, and development has been located outside of those buffers. Just to provide some further context, um, the East Boulder area is one of the city's primary employment centers with Ball Aerospace and Boulder Foothills Community Hospital located to the west. Um, there's two large car dealerships located to the east across the creek. Um, Flatirons Golf Course is located just across Arapaho Avenue to the southwest. And um, the recently completed Boulder JCC development is located in the vicinity um, across from Cherryvale. The Boulder County Recycling Facility and the Flatirons Industrial Park are located to the north across the railroad tracks. And the Old Tail um, neighborhood is located directly to the south, which consists of low density single family development. So moving on to the proposal, 317 residential units are proposed. The unit mix proposed is 182 efficiency living units. 
Those are defined as dwelling units that contain a bathroom and a kitchen, but do not exceed a floor area of 475 square feet. So um, commonly known as studios. 91 one bedroom units, 22 two bedroom apartment units, and 22 three bedroom townhome units. 80 units are proposed to be permanently affordable. There's also a community center proposed to serve the development. Um, as was described earlier, a restaurant, brew pub, or tavern is proposed in building one. It's um, approximately 4,500 square feet in area. There's also um, ground, floor, ground floor office and retail space totaling approximately 10,000 square feet. The plan includes 421 vehicular parking spaces that's provided as surface parking both in lots and along the streets structured parking um, within a central parking garage and then individual garage parking for the townhomes. A majority of the spaces, about 75% of them are located within that structured parking garage. And as you described, 4.1% parking reductions requested. In terms of bike parking, um, the proposal does provide the required 449 long-term secure park bike parking spaces. Um, and 169 short-term spaces are proposed across the site. Um, moving on to the site plan, the project is situated predominantly in the central area of the site outside of those floodplain and wetland buffers. The design centered around a four-story parking structure that is wrapped in residential units. There's one access point from Arapahoe Avenue um, the loop access drive is designed as a complete street with detached sidewalks, tree lawns, and parallel parking that's similar to what we would see in the transit village. <clears throat> the mixed use buildings are located on the southeast corner of the site within the RH district. There's um, two surface parking lots proposed there. There's a two story community building just located just north of those. There's four three-story apartment buildings located on the south and west ends of the site. One of those is directly addressing Arapahoe Avenue. There's also two three-story townhome buildings with private garages proposed on the north end of the site. Um, we can move on there. Ooh, uh-oh. My PowerPoint has locked up. Take your time, Sloan. Sorry about this. <laughs> it's okay. It's probably a pretty big, heavy PowerPoint. Yeah, it, uh, no, it's restarting. I can continue. It'd just be nice to have some graphics. Mm Just think, if this didn't happen, we would never have gotten to see how wonderfully organized your files are. Oh, sorry if you're seeing all of this. <laughs> I just didn't say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> If it doesn't open for you, Sloan, I can see if I can present it for you or something. Yeah, it says it, it's working on it. Okay. It just isn't letting me share it now for some reason. Oh, technology. It's our friend. <laughs> like, I might have to leave and come back. All right, it, it's, I think I'm going to have to leave and come right back. Sorry about this. Okay, do it.
should have some of that really bad recorded waiting music. Do 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 do. <laughs> Who needs a recording, Sarah? You can just keep going. <laughs> Just as an information item, I was I was hoping that I had the settings to where um, folks could see how many people were in the meeting, and I know some folks like to know that. So we have 113 folks um, attending as attendees here um, tonight. So quite a full house. And that's in addition to all of the the applicant and staff and planning board members up here. That's correct. So given that we probably, I know that um, we were thinking if it was more than 30 or 40 people, we'd probably stick with that two minute, right, Harmon? So we could probably mm -hmm. almost say that now, just so people know that it will be two minutes. Well, we also, we, we wanted to give um, folks the, the uh, two minute limitation when they were preparing their comments. So on the sign up sheet, and on the website, uh, it already has informed everyone that it's two minutes per person for public comment. What other interesting facts do you have for us, Jean, while we wait for Sloan to return? I wish I had the other ones. <laughs> okay. Sloan is saying she's in, I don't see her, Jean. And she's texting me too, and I'm like, I don't see you. Okay, so maybe we have to let her in as, as a host. I can yeah. offer that, um, and maybe we already knew this, but um, I was at Landmarks last night, and then I was in the main branch of the library briefly today, and Carnegie Library is again taking historical inquiries by email. Um, so they're staffing back up. So I can't, I couldn't remember what specific things we had talked about wanting to ask them. Um, but I remember that mm -hmm. that comes up from time to time. So it sounds like they're more able to be in the library um, and to do research by request. Awesome. I don't see her, do you? No. I can see her. Um, I went up. Do yep. You can toggle between panelists and attendees, and I toggled to attendees and I searched Sloan. Yeah. And I found C O B Sloan Walbert. Oh, there she is. Mm -hmm. That's so odd. That she. I just promoted her, Jean. Okay. Great. Okay, is. I'm back. That was fun. Great. <laughs> All right. So where were we? Let's... Lost in hyperspace. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, assuming you all can see this. Um, yep. So talking about the site plan. The design is organized to accommodate a street connection um, to the west, if that's desired in the future. That was something mentioned at concept plan. The existing pond and wooded area are proposed to remain on the north portion of the site. There's a three quarter movement access point on Arapahoe. And the applicants also proposing a U-turn lane and a deceleration lane to accommodate the expected traffic on Arapahoe. In addition, um, a missing link of the multi-use path along Arapahoe would be constructed as well as an enhanced transit stop. In terms of open space, uh, the proposal includes privates, both patios and decks and shared active areas. The stars on this plan are indicating the common gathering spaces proposed, uh, which includes a community building, there's an amenity room, picnic amenity areas, community gardens, there's a bike wash and a dog run proposed. The buildings are three stories in height, except for that central parking structure in the center of the site, um, which is four stories and the community building, which is two stories. 
The structure with the largest print print is located in the center of, of the site and as I described is wrapped is in residential units. The building design is contemporary with flat roofs and um, simple forms. The design is intended to be a mix of agrarian and industrial design elements. Buildings are oriented toward the streets and there's pedestrian scale architectural features um, and materials utilized at the pedestrian level. Proposed building materials include um, corrugated metal panels, lap siding, board and batten siding, prefinished metal panels, brick, cement board in differ differing colors and storefront windows at the ground level. Um, staff identified it four key issues for discussion, which I will just run through quickly. Uh, the first being consistency with the site review criteria. Staff finds that the proposed project meets all applicable site review criteria. The last major update to the comprehensive plan specifically addressed Boulder's jobs housing imbalance and among the land use related policy changes for that were to aim to um, to allow for additional housing in commercial and industrial areas. And considering the proximity to office parks and major employers, the development would contribute to a 15 minute mixed use neighborhood. Uh, it also supports a compact development pattern in, um, in the city. As I mentioned, 80 units are proposed to be permanently affordable. The proposal includes a mixture of housing sizes and types which contribute to a diverse housing stock. The site design and um, improvements as part of the proposal would encourage walking, biking, or other alternatives to the single occupancy vehicle. There's also frequent pedestrian connections proposed which would connect to the existing multimodal network. The proposed parking structure does make efficient use of the land <clears throat> and reduces the visual impacts of parking. The development's designed to take advantage of that bus rapid transit planned as part of the East Arapaho corridor. Um, I would just note that the character of East Arapaho is eclectic. The site is unique in that major barriers exist to the north with the railroad, to the east with South Boulder Creek, and to the south with that state highway Arapaho. Um, and that said, the pr project represents an infill development that is compatible with the surrounding industrial uses. Uh, it's also sensitive in that natural areas are protective and um, design solutions are proposed that to reduce the perception of the mass and scale of the buildings. Um, so moving on to the height modifications, as I described, the applicant is requesting a height modification to um, the 35 foot height limit for these two mixed use buildings in the RH4 district. The proposed building height is approximately 43 feet. <clears throat> and that height modification is essentially necessary to provide a larger floor to ceiling height for the commercial units at the ground floor. There's also a height modification requested to the 40 foot height limit for that central parking structure in the IG districts to allow a height of um, 54.4 feet. Uh, the applicant is eligible for a height modification because they have demonstrated that at least 40% of the floor area of these buildings is used for units that meet the requirements for permanently affordable units. Um, the intent of this allowance was to encourage the provision of providing affordable housing on site. And in granting that ex exemption, City Council did acknowledge that um, heights greater than 35 feet or 40 feet in this case would be appropriate through the site review process. So staff finds considering the objectives achieves in granting the height modification, the height of the buildings is in general proportion to the heights of existing and proposed buildings in the vicinity. Um, the majority of the structures are proposed as human scale three-story structures. And the proposed siting of that four-story structure reduces impacts to neighboring properties. <clears throat> uh, moving on, the proposal is consistent with the use review criteria. The development meets the standards for residential development in industrial zoning districts with a minimum of 40% of the required 
usable open space configured as a common contiguous area to provide um, active and passive open space for the residents. The project site was also found to be an appropriate location for residential development. Um, an environmental assessment that was given states that the use would not be affected by any adverse health or safety impacts. And I would just note as well that the applicant would be required to utilize construction methods that um, limit the uh, noise levels within the units themselves. And the intent of the mix of uses is really to allow walkability within the neighborhood and contribute to that pet pedestrian oriented 15 minute neighborhood. Um, the convenience retail use and the restaurant, brew pub, tavern, whatever it ends up being, would provide a direct service or convenience to the development and the neighborhood at large, including employees of the industrial uses. Uh, the area does have very limited local services. The closest services, retail restaurant uses are located approximately half mile to the west. Um, I would also just note that the mixed use development fosters a number of comprehensive plan policies as I described earlier. Um, and in particular, allowing for residential uses in industrial zones. <clears throat> and lastly, staff finds that the proposal meets the criteria for a 4.1% parking reduction based on transportation demand management strategies, the site context, and enhanced transit and multimodal access. Um, parking would be shared between the commercial and residential uses on the site. Um, so the proposal does include a robust, a robust TDM plan. Eco passes would be provided for residents through the neighborhood eco pass program and for employees through uh, employees of the commercial uses through the business eco pass program. The site is very well connected to the larger multimodal network. Um, as I mentioned also that transit stop on Arapahoe would be improved and would be designed to capitalize on future BRT access along Arapahoe. Um, <clears throat> the applicant's also proposing a bike share program with 20 standard bikes and 10 e-bikes. Uh, there are e-bike charging stations proposed for privately owned e-bikes. So there's also a bike wash station, um, storage is proposed for skateboards and electric scooters as well. So based on this analysis, planning staff finds that the applicant meets the site review criteria and use review criteria. Therefore, staff recommends planning board approval uh, with the motion shown on the screen and subject to the conditions that were listed in the staff memo. And we're happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot, Sloan, appreciate you bearing with and um, getting through to the end of that for us. Um, now for uh, planning board members, um, if you can um, hold questions that might really be better asked of the applicant for after the applicant presentation and try to focus questions um, to the staff members who are here on, on things related to the staff's analysis, that would be great. And I will uh, open it up to planning board members questions of staff. Uh, we'll start with David and then John and Sarah. Great, thank you. Uh, and thanks for a great presentation, Sloan. Um, I uh, just wanted to check with the um, uh, East Arapahoe transportation plan. Since the corridor design is not complete, do we feel we're maximizing our opportunity to make sure that the amount of space for sidewalk and multi-use along that this, you know, that the opportunity is taken advantage of either to the best of our ability. I, I just wondered if you had a take on how well we can approximate what we expect those design uh, standards to be. Um, I, I know we've done a preliminary analysis and shown that um, we can accommodate the improvements in that area along Arapahoe. Okay. And I believe they're um, dedicating a portion of right away. I'd have to double check that though. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's John next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, John, maybe drop the, drop the video for... Uh, Oh, okay. John, maybe you should turn your video off. It is coming in and out. Okay. With respect to the land that is to the east of South Boulder Creek, can you can you hear me now? Yeah, you sound uh, great. 
Okay. I was just wondering to what extent any of this uh, proposal required the, the, any of the use or crediting or accounting for the land that is on to the east of South Boulder Creek that's presently uh, being used by the Subaru dealership. So uh, that area was part of the concept plan. I think there was a discussion of using it for like community gardens. Um, since that time, it, it's been determined it's, it's going to be nearly impossible for the residents to gain access to that. So what they've done is they're going to subdivide that off as an outlet for future consideration and none of the open space or density calculations consider that area in this proposal. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sarah. Okay, thank you. Um, so I had, uh, emailed this question to um, Charles and Chris um, in the hopes that they would be able to answer it. Um, and the question was, um, uh, because this uh, there are 80 permanently affordable units, and one of the questions I will ask the, develop the applicant is, what are the dwelling unit types that fall into that category? I wanted to ask city man, the, in this case, the acting city manager um, to explain um, uh, under 913-9-13-6B, the city manager is authorized to establish minimum and maximum sizes for permanently affordable units um, annually to reflect the types of units that are sized to meet our unmet community needs. And I really am curious to, under, to know what, um, what this year's um, needs are, how, how the city manager has identified them. And because I'll be curious how they match with what the applicant is proposing for affordable units. It's probably the best question for our housing staff. I'm hoping Michelle. I think Kurt is still on. Or Kurt could possibly answer that. Um, yes, Sarah, thank you. Um, so we have um, livability standards um, that we update. Those livability standards were updated um, just a few months ago. They're, they're pretty recent. Um, and um, so they um, identify sort of minimum standards for certain types of units um, and sizes. Um, they have standards for storage and closet areas and that sort of thing. So that's a, a recently updated document. Um, this project um, adheres to those livability standards for unit types. Um, I'll also say that um, generally speaking, um, I mean, we are, we are creating a variety of housing types as far as sizes and bedrooms um, within our various pro uh, projects throughout the city uh, currently. Um, we have seen a trend um, over the last few years towards um, uh, smaller units, um, and those are um, that, that's what the market, the affordable sort of market is is asking for. Um, we have an easier time um, renting um, smaller units than we do the larger units, um, and so you'll I think you'll see with this project that it's sort of. Um, reflects um, some, some of those um, market realities. But um, I also noticed Michelle Allen is on. She's part of my team. I don't know if she has anything um, additional to add. Um, I would just add uh, that, um, Sarah, I saw that question earlier. And um, so for inclusionary housing, which of course is only one way that the city produces affordable housing, one of the many ways that we do, the program is set up so that the affordable units reflect what is in the market rate project. And the assumption is that the market rate project is meeting the needs of the community, that that's what the market developers do. And, the, and that the market is driving the types of units that they're proposing. And then inclusionary housing simply gets a subset of those units, um, same size, same number of bedrooms and that type of thing. So the assumption built into inclusionary housing is that the market development is meeting the needs of the community and the affordable housing follows. I don't know if that's helpful, but. Uh, so that helps. So the, 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 pre, the, the I'm making these percentages up. 50% are one type, 30% are one type and 20% are one type is the developer's projection or understanding of the market. 
-hmm. And then the affordable units will be an equal number of each of those percent uh, percentages or a percentage of those percentages? Yes, correct. So correct. Won't... they are directly proportional to the market rate units. So if there's 50% studios, the affordables will be 50% studios. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. You sure. Any other questions for staff or John? Yeah, I'll. Uh... So, uh, something about the uh, the letter of map revision that that you referred to, Sloan. Um, I was unclear about whether that which has recently been uh, uh, approved by FEMA assumes that the CU South uh, flood mitigation work has been done and, and is in effect, or whether uh, that is, uh, it, it's based on existing conditions right now. I would ask either Kristen Shepard or Edward to answer that. Okay, should, should we do that now? Make it all pop up? Yep, she, she's ready. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> so, um, and Edward, sorry, to, I'll just jump in. Um, so the, the current LOMER, the letter of map revision does not include the proposed CU South development. It only includes current um, existing conditions. Okay, if I can just follow up on that. Uh, one of the comments that was received from the public refers to that letter of map revision and uh, indicates that it, doesn't include any of the flow that would come in from the West Valley uh, flood conditions. And I was wondering, uh, is that something you've looked into and, uh, and uh, find appropriate? <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how to answer that because it's a, um, the, the, the letter of map revision and the mapping analysis takes into account the flows that are in the model and um, utilizes, uses that. <laughs> I'm feeling a little stuck. I'm not, please do. Thank you, Edward. <laughs> so first, the, the overall answer, John, to your question is yes, it is appropriate under the, the regulations of the NFIP and under the city's regulations that a future unknown condition is not included. The CU South project, as it moves forward, assuming it does, and I can't make that assumption 100%, we'll have to consider what that float rate is that it's able to discharge to not further adversely impact South Boulder Creek as those flows no longer go into the West Valley. When they do that, and that's the reason for the detention facility, it won't have uh, an additional negative impact because the flooding is primarily caused by that rate, not that quantity uh, that's coming down through the creek in terms of how the mapping is gonna be impacted. So it, it should not change the overall mapping in this particular stretch. Um, given that they will have a detention facility that's really metering it out to continue to meet the conditions that we see today. Okay, so so staff has considered that issue and is satisfied with the proposal. Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other, Sarah? Before I give give it to Sarah, are there any people that haven't asked a question on planning board who would like to? I didn't ask that before John jumped in. Okay, Sarah. Thanks. Um, so this was also a topic that was brought up in some of the letters we received. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that what was written was accurate. So Sloan, I'd like your responses to whether it's accurate and if it is an answer um, that uh, several writers um, brought up the possibility that one of the options in the East Boulder subcommunity planning process conceives of this area as remaining sort of a flood zone, a, a flood mitigation area or a flood, a, an area where that could be flooded. Um, and I don't know if that is in fact accurate. Um, and if it is, um, how, how would this uh, address, how would this impact the discussions about the East Boulder subcommunity plan planning process? Um, I would just say I, I was not aware of that. Um, my understanding is that it, the East Boulder plan is still in the very conceptual phases. So uh, that would not factor into our analysis in this case until that plan's adopted. 
I think I might be able to answer that. I think this is just outside the area that is um, potentially considered for that in one of the concepts. But Sloan's right; um, the, the, that that work is still um, pretty is still conceptual. that answer your question then? Okay, any other questions from planning board for staff? John, again. Yeah, the, this will be fast, I think. Uh, wanted to check if there's been any contact with the Open Space and Mountain Parks Department about the impact of this project on the uh, open space uh, uh, facilities along South Boulder Creek, and also whether uh, the, the pond at the north part of that uh, of, of the project, whether anyone's looked into ownership of the pond and whether there's any water rights associated with it. Um, I think I can potentially address the pond and then we have Bethany Collins from OSMP on the line to address the easement. Um, I do believe there are some water rights associated with that pond, um, but it, my understanding is that would not impact the amount or quality of open space provided if that was to change the the makeup of that pond area. Bethany, do you want to um, speak to the scenic easements? Um, sure. I can, uh, uh, we've, uh, open space has been involved along the uh, development review process and um, as as proposed in the, the application that's before you for review, there is no, uh, the area along that, that is under open space purview is in scenic easements. It is not owned by open space. Um, and those areas are not, you know, the restrictions there are no development um, that the scenic and natural features of that area remain. And there is no proposed uh, uh, development in that area or improvements associated with this development application. Is that helpful? <laughs> Thank you. Certainly. Okay. Any other questions for staff? Seeing none, I'll turn it back over to Charles and Sloan to introduce the applicant. Great, Sloan, will you be running the applicant's presentation this evening? I will, fingers crossed. <laughs> it's working on it. Just gonna ask if you needed any help. So let me pull it up and I'll turn it over. It looks like Bill is ready to go. Um, so just to get us ready, I think we're going to start with William and then David. William, are you unmuted and on camera? Same with David. Bill, I think I should be ready. Can you, can everybody see me? I know it's a little dark in my abode. Great. So Sloan, I'm going to ask you to advance the slides. Uh, each of us will, of course. Um, so if we could uh, begin and uh, let me know when we're on the clock. Okay, Harmon, I, are we, am I starting for um, 20 minutes? Is that correct? Um, yeah, I think, I think we said we'd give him 15, but Bill, do you need 20? No, we're planning on 15. Um, you know, we might be a few seconds over or under, but it should be right around 15. 17.5 would okay. be that. Okay, well, well why, don't, why don't we uh, just go ahead and so we don't have to interrupt. Just uh, give them 17 minutes and, um, and, and hopefully they'll get it in. Great. Great. Okay. Thanks. Starting now, go ahead. Awesome, thank you. Good evening, uh, planning board members, city staff and fellow Boulderites. I'm William Shutkin, a resident of Boulder, principal of Shutkin Sustainable Living and an owner in the project. I'm also faculty lead for urban resilience and sustainability in the Masters of the Environment program at CU Boulder. First, I'd like to acknowledge some of our supporters. These include Boulder Community Hospital on behalf of its 2,200 employees, the Sierra Club. I think it's the first time the Sierra Club has put its name behind a Boulder real estate development. The Boulder Chamber of Commerce, 
a former Boulder Shelter board chair, a former head of the Boulder Economic Council. I also wanna thank the more than three dozen East Boulder business leaders and housing, transportation, climate and racial justice advocates who have signed up to speak tonight on behalf of our application. Sloan, please advance the slide. Or actually uh, keep that slide, uh, the first one, thank you. 5801 Arapahoe is a proposed 317 unit sustainable mixed income, mixed use neighborhood designed precisely for Boulder. Our project is aligned with over 60 of the city's most important policy goals. Advance the slide, please. Sloan, thank you. The project is designed to fill a massive gap in East Boulder for mixed income housing with 80 on-site affordable apartments and townhomes. That's 60% of the city's annual quota starting at 50% of area median income, about $40,000 a year for a single person. These units are integrated by building and by floor, a first in the city for advancing social inclusion and housing equity. David. Thanks, William. Uh, could you advance the next slide, please, Sloan? I'm David Zucker, one of the owners of Waterview and CEO of Zocalo Community Development. The project is designed to create a vibrant, sustainable place along the changing Arapahoe corridor and takes advantage of South Boulder Creek, the multi-use path, and immediately adjacent RTD bus stop and panoramic views of the foothills, Flatirons, and Indian Peaks. Next slide, please. The project is designed to generate 500 kilowatts of rooftop solar energy in a neighborhood that's been blessed with infrastructure for walking, biking, and busing to and from work. The project is designed to remove hundreds of car trips each day from Arapaho Avenue, reducing vehicle miles traveled and carbon emissions along the corridor. Next slide, please. We've engaged the neighborhood over the past three and a half years with four plenary meetings, two working groups, a site tour and project website, which is also translated into Spanish. Note that among our stakeholders are over 80 local Boulder investors. Next slide, please. Sloan. Um, and Bill Hollicky, please. Hi, Bill Hollicky with uh, Coburn Architecture. So I'm going to start by walking you through the form and the, and the reasons behind the planning that, uh, that underlines the project. The first is that we take the site and we look at all the areas that can't be built. So those setbacks, easements, the creek, floodway, the scenic easement that we were just talking about. And so that results in these white areas. So those are the areas that don't have any restrictions and they're above the 100 year floodplain. So Sloan, if you could advance, please. Um, the next issue is where do we get into the site? So we worked heavily with staff on this and staff is very clear that intersections are safest when they interact with intersections across the street. So they were, um, they, they really wanted the, our intersection to be directly across from Old Tail. Uh, that also happens to coincide with an easement for a, a regional sewer line that comes through here. And that's not coincidental. The city plans these stuff out because when things are organized this way, it's much safer. There's a question about whether access could come from the Northeast parcel. So we looked into that and staff looked into that and staff's language in, in the comments coming back was that it just wasn't viable. The reason for that is there's multi parts, uh, multi, multiple reasons for that, including um, that scenic easement that we just heard about. So it would require a bridge over the creek and the scenic easement would prevent that. Additionally, we have the floodway through there. We can't have support for the bridge coming down into that floodway. It would be a 250 foot long clear span bridge, which again, would be a major issue with the scenic easement. And then the other reason is that we don't have any right of way access up there. That property portion of Bots and neighboring property. So the city boulder standards are, you take access off the right of way into your property. There's no right of, right of way in that portion. So all of the entry, um, so all of those reasons, the entry has to be directly across Moldtail which also is the safest. So on the next slide, now that we know that that's the entry, we look at starting to organize the site. So we've got this entry, we've got Arapahoe, we've got the bike path that goes up to the north and an RTD site, all creating this little pocket, which is a great place for community restaurants, retail, community office. It's a, it's a really good place for that gathering spot. So we start there on the next slide, then we start to add, um, we know we need parking. So we add that in, but we don't want this to be a parking dominated site. It really wants to be walkable neighborhood. Those are the best kind of communities. So again, we're, we're putting the parking in a structure in the middle of the site and then hiding it so that it doesn't dominate the site. On the next slide, you'll see that um, we're, um, 
Yep, I've been lost. There we go. Thank you. So uh, again, we want to create this neighborhood, right? So the buildings are small. The streets are small. They're complete streets and it's very walkable. So we create this grid. And then on the next slide, um, we're tying that grid into the future TMP plan. So staff has identified that there may be a connection someday to the West. And we're tying that this new grid in with that future grid. So it's a, it's a complete street network, not just for our site, but beyond. On the next slide, now that we have that kernel, uh, one, of the, one of the comments and, and the great potentials of this site is how it transitions to both the open space and the neighbors. So we've started to look into that and, and we'll look into that in great detail. And the blue dots, for example, that's where the, the main community gathering spaces are, up near the commercial one, the bike path near the pond. And then the brown and green areas, as another example, are private, smaller, um, more for intimate gatherings and individual use. On the next slide, now we take that and we add in, we need commercial parking, we need parking for the townhomes. That's tucked behind the buildings and under the buildings. And we have this walkable neighborhood. And on the last slide, which is where Sloan is now, we have this really walkable place. Now we have an opportunity to make it really alt mode friendly. Now remember, um, Sloan, if you, yeah, right there, perfect. Now, um, if you remember, the people that are gonna live here are currently part of the 60,000 in commuters we have every day. So where previously they're driving five, 10, about two miles away from where they're gonna work, depending on if it's one of the 10,000 jobs in the immediate area or downtown Boulder, it's really much, much easier for them to get out of their car if they want to. So Sloan sort of went through a large portion of the things we we're doing from an alt mode standpoint. We have bike rooms with tools and pumps and bike wash. Um, if you wanna ride a bike, this is a great place to have it. We even have e-scooters. So we're really pushing the alt modes because for the first time, these people that have been driving can now get out of their cars. On the next slide, um, we came to you with essentially the same framework last time, much less developed. Uh, the planning board unanimously determined at our last concept plan that the project was consistent with Boulder Valley Comp Plan goals and made sense here. However, you did have a number of comments. So to go through some of those, we had proposed a very agricultural style architecture and planning board, I think rightfully said, hey, you know, let's, this is an eclectic area. Let's add a little more interest, maybe some industrial kind of vibe. So um, that was one comment. Said, oh, can we add some townhomes? Uh, we talked about the outdoor space and enhancing the multi-use path. There was questions about the site hydrology, direct us to go study that. Um, said you supported the parking reduction, but you were worried about left turns out of the site and you really wanted to push uh, us to continue engaging the neighborhood. And as David mentioned on that slide earlier, that's been extremely robust and has continued. On the next slide, um, this is the difference between that concept plan hearing and now. So you can see the unit count decreased, parking spaces have gone up, so the parking reduction is lower. We had three four-story buildings, now we have one in the center. We've decreased the building coverage by 10%, and we've added those townhome units that you had requested. So Sloan, if you can advance, we now have um, this site plan. And one of the, the really cool thing that's, that's working really well about the project is both the perimeter and the interior are very functional for what they're trying to do. So the inside is supposed to be this extremely walkable neighborhood and, it's, and it is. And the outside is a dropping um, a transition to the both neighborhood and the open space with highly designed, highly effective um, nodes in that open space all the way around for this community and the greater community. So on the next slide, uh, we will look at that open space. What's really cool about the open space here is that our site is at this nexus between the north-south uh, bike path green that comes down and the Flatirons Golf Course Park to the south. And our site joins the two. So it makes that open space really important. We took it really seriously. And uh, on the next slide, we can show how we uh, perfect how we we designed this. So one of the things we heard from you and staff, and, and we really wanted to focus on was not the open space just being uh, you know a bunch of green space. There's 341,000 square feet of open space on this site. It's way more than is required. But again, it doesn't mean anything. It's not designed. So we put it into three buckets. There's the very active open space and that's in orange. So that's the bike path and the dog run and the, the eating area, the plaza out in front of the restaurant and the fitness exercise um, wellness uh, building. 
All of those are, are highly active open space. And then in the brown, there's maybe a step down, right? So that's where you might gather with your friends or throw a fris frisbee, walk around. It's still moving, but it's not quite as active. And then in green is the visual uh, open space. It's really the, the visual relief. It's the natural world. It's the plantings. And so all of these things together kind of create this rich tapestry of, of um, the open space network on the site. The four black and white drawings are just representations of a few different areas. We have about 30 of these. These areas are designed down to the, we know where the shrubs and the trees are, we know where the gardens are and the benches. They're highly figured out, designed to be really amenitized, both for, for the greater community and the neighbors here. If we could move on to the next one. Tra jump into traffic and transportation for a minute. So as we mentioned, um, the, the alt mode is really supported. And in this particular case, that the, the alt mode network is very, very strong. We have the north-south bike path that's highly used. It goes right to the Flyers Business Park and all of these 10,000 jobs. We have a, a current on-street bike parking or bike lane and the new improvements to, to Arapaho will create this multimodal lane all the way along the north side. This site will build its portion of it and create the right-of-way for that. We also have the bus stop right in front of the site. So local and regional transportation, very easy to get to. If you want to take a bus or ride a bike downtown, it is extremely easy to do that. Hop on a bus, you're downtown in a minute, hop on a bus, you come back. So as a site, this site is, is very well served by all modes. Moving to the next slide, one of the things that we heard from Old Tail very clearly was they wanted to preserve their full movement intersection. They didn't want to be limited. Right now they can turn any way in or out. And just to be very clear, we are proposing no change to that. Their intersection is not affected. On the next slide, one of the concerns we heard from them and you was, hey, what is it gonna be like taking a left turn out of this development if somebody wants to head east? Now, granted, there won't be much of that. Most people will be heading west, but there still will be some. So we worked with CDOT, because it's a CDOT state highway, um, and they have very strict standards for how you do this. We work with them to eliminate that left turn lane. We cannot turn left out of this property. You can only go west. If you then want to go east, they have a left turn lane that's a standard CDOT turn lane um, that allows you to then turn into the eastbound lane and go to the east. Again, all according to CDOT regulations. That means that anybody heading east is just like any other traffic heading east past uh, Old Tail. It doesn't impact their intersection. To move to the next slide. Another thing you asked us to look at was hydrology. Uh, we have looked at this extensively, spent three years working on it with FEMA and the city of Boulder. We hired Steve Blake from the internationally known not-for-profit DHI out of Denmark. Um, and I think the, the quote at one point from staff was that there isn't another site in Boulder that has had its hydrology studied to this level of detail. Um, we know what's going to happen here. And there is <laughs> a deep, um, shelf of science for how this works. So we know, to answer some of those other questions, that due to the FEMA regulations, the way we have to model it, the very detailed model that's on this site, there will be no impact from this site on flood water on any other property. It's a federally, federally regulated uh, requirement, and that's the way it works. There cannot, if it worked any other way, FEMA would not approve it. Um, so the second question was groundwater. Again, we did borings. We know where the groundwater is. Just to be clear about this, the groundwater level is below both the foundations for the buildings and any installed utilities. We also know that the, uh, the, the soil here is essentially river bottom. So it's, it, it's strong, it doesn't compact, and it drains very well. So again, we know that there will be no impact from groundwater on any other site. Again, there is sheets of science. So I've got, we've got Steve Blake here and we've got Charlie Hager here, uh, both experts in the field. And, and Steve can answer any questions you have. I do encourage you to ask him those because I think that there's, there's so much information here that we can pass on. Uh, one more slide, please. Could you forward slides? Thank you. So to finish up on the architecture, um, this is the southeast corner where the commercial is. And um, as we spin around, this is that same plaza as you come up out of the bike path. So it's really designed to be this community gathering space. The architecture is eclectic. It has uh, eccentricity to go along with the community around it as you requested. On the next slide, the interior of the site 
is uh, has the same care given to it. And again, we're creating complete streets, as Sloan mentioned. We have sidewalks and tree lawns and parallel parking and really great buildings to walk along on the first floor. On the next slide, you'll see that the, the materials are chosen for the same reasons. Sloan went through them. They're designed to be durable and interesting and have texture and, and have connection to human scale. And to finish up on the next couple slides, the, the, the eccentricity is not just within the building, but each building is different. So again, you get the feeling that each street is different. And while the principles of good street design still apply, the whole site has a character that changes as you walk along. One more slide. On the eastern side, along the bike path, we heard the comments, hey, let's, we're going to erode the project back away from there. We'll use this wellness building as a, a sculptural element that augments the bike path. So it's a, a really enhanced edge to that bike path. And again, it's completely out of the scenic easement, doesn't impact open space. And on the last slide that I have, which is next, that, that uh, attention has gone around the entire project. So this, the tallest part is in the middle, then drops to three-story, mostly gabled roof buildings all the way around, transitions again to amenities, and then to the open space and the neighborhood. So that walks you through the project. Appreciate you listening and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay. All right, do any planning board members have any questions for the applicant? Sarah's hand up first, then Peter, then John. Uh, thanks so much for that presentation. So I'm going to follow up on the second half of the question I asked the staff, which has to do with, could you please tell me what the breakdown of dwelling unit types will be for the permanently affordable? Uh, that's a first half of a question about those units. Sure. So um, we currently have, as I, I just make sure my math is right, we have 13 two-bedroom units, two affordable three-bedroom townhomes. We have 35 one-bedroom units and 30 studios. Can so that's 80 total. Can you list that again? You go very fast and I'm typing it out. Sorry. I'm sorry. So 30 studios, mm -hmm. 35 one-bedrooms, mm -hmm. 13 two-bedroom units, mm -hmm. and two of the townhomes. And two townhomes. And again... Yes, that's Sorry, right. you said two yep. And Michelle um, Allen can also answer questions about that because for all affordable um, units that we propose and, and for anything that housing accepts, it goes through a pretty strict vetting process through Michelle. And all of that was, a, you know, we, we worked through that with housing. It's not like we propose that and that's the answer. That was a, uh, a team effort between this group and the division of housing. To come up with those numbers. And then um, can I just, uh, Harmon, can I follow up? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, so I'm, I'm curious about, um, uh, we, the city, we're seeing increasing numbers of permanently affordable developments or developments that have permanent affordable components that are not being done by the three nonprofits that the city has previously worked for. So I, could you just walk us through how how you imagine or how you know these will be managed? Um, how will, what will the criteria be? How will it be managed? How does it, the management of these permanently affordable fit with the management of the rest of the rental units? Great point, I'll start and then David will jump in and, and give you a little bit more on the management. So as you know, one of the things that's unique about this project is the fact that the units are integrated in with the market, right? So rather than, hey, the units are over here separated, managed by an entity, uh, it's all part of the same project. So David, can you chime in with how that works? Certainly, thanks, Sarah, for the, the question. Zocalo has a history of managing low-income housing tax credit projects. So that's what this, that's what this component is. The, the beautiful thing about this and something we, Zocalo is uh, eager to, uh, to continue to, um, to explore is this true integration of units as Bill is describing. So rather than a, a New York style poor door quote, um, the units are, uh, are entirely transparent and opaque. You can't tell which is affordable and which is market rate. They have the same finishes, they're the same size. There's a market rate unit next to an affordable unit next to a market rate unit. Um, so it's, it's true inclusivity. What, what's also great is that the same management, the same, uh, the same happy hour, the same 
um, programs around the pool, the same uh, learning opportunities are afforded to absolutely everyone, uh, indiscriminate of, uh, of income affordability status or not. Okay, so if I can just re, I, you didn't exactly answer my question, which uh, had to do with um, what's the criteria, like permanent affordability for what, what's the, what's the um, income level to sort of cure, I'd like to know more about that. So of the 80 units, 70, and, and Michelle, check me, please. Um, 70 units are for those earning less than 60% of the area median income um, in the proportions that, uh, that, that Bill Hallecky mentioned. And 10 of those are for those earning 50% and less of area median income. So I, I can give you the, the rents for um, uh, a uh, efficiency unit is a, about $1,000 uh, a month for the 50% of AMI units. Um, a one bedroom is um, 1,079 and a uh, two bedroom is about $1,290 at the moment. Okay. And Sarah, it just, it just occurred to me kind of a part of what you're asking. So the city of Boulder um, deed restriction guidelines don't change depending on who manages the units. So the units are still required to comply with the 20% and the 5% affordable requirements from the city and, and that's deed restricted. So we can keep Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I would, I would add that although Zocalo will own and they will lease up the units according to all of the many, many guidelines that we have in what we call our rental handbook, um, then the housing and human services staff will, um, our co compliance team will go in and they will check those records. I think they do it quarterly. They go into the offices, they pull all the records. They keep a very close eye on what the uh, managers are doing to make sure they're complying with all of our rental requirements. Okay, thank you, Michelle. I appreciate that. Sure. Okay, I'm gonna go on to Peter. Thank you. And this is a similar question. Uh, so um, the staff that was just up and maybe even Kurt and the applicant, Thank you for this. And you have um, held yourself out as a model here in the way you're integrating these units. And what we've heard time and time again is the reason other developers can't do this is because of LIHTC and lender restrictions, et cetera. How did you do it? And what did you have to change in order to do it? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I think the first thing is intention. Uh, Zocalo, where we can, when we can, builds mixed income projects. Um, it's, it's fun to be able to build for people that didn't think that they could ever live in the places where we built. Um, there's also a degree of complexity that we have uh, tolerance for that other developers don't. Um, we just finished a, um, we, Peter, we just finished up a $29 million, 102 unit affordable project and adaptive, uh, historic adaptive reuse of a neat old uh, former single room occupancy hotel, 111 years old. Um, we estimate that that project took four times the amount of staff time that um, a $110 million project in, in River North, 357 units took. Um, so we, we do have, a, I mean, for certain projects, we're going to commit the time to be able to deliver on a, um, on a really cool integration and, and in, in, integrated and inclusive project. And this is one of those where we want to spend the time. It, so it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, Michelle has been really patient with us um, in reviewing with us and supporting us as we've used in, in, in speaking uh, speaking on structure specifically. So what, what we're using is something called under Kiowa, the Co Colorado Common Interest Ownership Act. It's, it's, it's a newer version of a condo structure called a small plan community. It, it allows, unlike a typical condo, uh, where you really have to build it first and then create the condo survey. And this allows you to designate essentially future air air spaces so we could designate one unit as affordable that we will be building next to another unit that's market rate. So the small plan community, which takes significantly more time and, and we are taking a lower return as a result, um, but this is the type of long-term project that, that Zocalo seeks to build. And this is the team that, uh, that we believe has the uh, ability and tolerance to get it done with Coburn. 
So Peter, the other thing that I'll add to that from a, from a staff perspective, um, um, I think the other thing that David maybe was saying between the lines is that it, it takes resources um, to be able to do this. It costs more money in, in, in the approach to, to financing such a project. I think this is um, in, in, in one way, it's a, it's a result of the additional community benefit that we get from the height as well. Um, it's a combination of a lot of different factors um, but, um, you know, uh, David was able to, I think, make this happen by playing with all of those various factors. Thank you all. I'm going to go to John and then Lupita. Yeah, uh, thank you. Just a, a quick question. Uh, do we have a parking uh, from the uh, living arrangements such that you're charging for a parking? John, I apologize. You cut out right in the beginning. Can you repeat this, the, the question? Yeah, I'm uh, asking about unbundling parking and the living arrangements, whether, whether there'll be a separate charge for parking spaces. And I'll defer to David on that. There will be. Um, there, there will be a charge for parking. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just before I get to Lupita, I'll just follow up on that. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts about uh, doing some flex with the uh, the parking spaces? So when, for example, if you have a, an owner who has an owner space, but they're gone during business hours, and there's somebody driving in uh, who works nearby who needs the space during those same hours, that uh, you can do some multi uses, or will the spaces just be dedicated all the time? I'll take a quick step. Oh, go if, if I may, yeah, the, thank you, um, Harmon. I, I think the, the, the beauty of uh, parking um, technology today is that we can have different realms of, uh, of parking control. Um, so the, the least expensive parking, uh, which will not be terribly expensive, will be just open. Um, so there'll be a large area of the parking structure that is is open, there'll be certain spaces that are reserved, those are, those are more. Uh, those, there will be certain spaces that are reserved 24 hours a day. Uh, so in those three realms of parking, there'll be different costs associated. The, the higher the level of control, the more it will cost, mm. the, the less, the less. Um, so we expect that with our commercial, uh, our commercial tenants, that there will be a, a fair sharing of parking um, for, uh, in this reservoir of open parking. To be really quick with the numbers, we have 439 required parking spaces. We're providing 421, that's that 4.1% reduction. So we're short, City of Boulder numbers, 18 spaces. But we're also assuming, as David just mentioned, that there's a daytime, nighttime sharing. So the commercial space will be mostly, the commercial spaces will be mostly commercial during the day. And a lot of those will turn over to residential at night, well more than those 18 spaces. So while there is a technical reduction, we're providing more than the city of Boulder requirements for the spaces that are being utilized at any time during the day. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Uh, Lupita and then Lisa. Yes, my question has to do with the way that you allocated the affordable housing. And I was trying to look at the numbers. And if I were to do just a straight math, in terms of the three bedroom townhouses, that's the two out of the 22 is less than 10% that are affordable. And, uh, but if I bundle the two <coughs> bed flats with those of the three bed townhomes, because we have no two bed townhomes, uh, townhomes um, then, then, then we are about, I don't know, 50% or something like that. So I was wondering how is it that you, not without having to know all the details, because my concern here is in the terms of, you know, the size of the families that you will be able to accommodate. So I would imagine that for affordable housing, um, having only two bedrooms available, it really limits who can live in these places. And so uh, how those decisions are made to me matter because uh, it depends on what kind of affordable housing you're, um, you know, trying to, um, to provide. Uh, I know a lot of the families that I will consider live in the least um, um, uh, attractive housing in this town, 
have more than one child and have more than two child children. So a three bedroom will be more attractive than a two bedroom. So I'm just, if you can, I just guide us a little bit through the reasoning that will be very, very helpful. Sure, and I'm gonna let, um, again, the effort here is a, is a cooperative one between both the applicant team and the division of housing. So I'm gonna let William Shutkin jump in and then perhaps Michelle Allen can speak a little bit to it as well. So William. Great, thanks Bill. And thank you, Lapita. It's a, it's a great question. Um, as Michelle can uh, testify, and I think Kurt as well, you know, we've spent, gosh, over three years in negotiations. Uh, and over those three years, we've seen housing funds come and go. We've seen, you know, markets come and go, COVID. Um, so a lot has changed over time, but basically the negotiation that we, uh, conducted over these years result in what we thought was an optimal mix of housing, given um, the costs, given DOHs, the Division of Housing's goals. Um, and that's reflected essentially in the 50% of AMI units that we are going to deliver on, whereas originally we were thinking only about 60% of AMI. Um, likewise, the integrated strategy. Um, ideally, we would have liked to have provided more and bigger units across the board, but owing to, well, essentially the fact that we reduced the size of the project uh, as of a couple of years ago, based in part on staff feedback, you know, these were essentially the constraints that, that we were left with. So I think, and again, Michelle and Kurt can comment, but I think the parties agree this was an optimal mix of units um, and, uh, and, and unit sizes. Um, and, and we generally feel pretty good about it. Michelle or Kurt? Yeah, um, so if you remember uh, David Zucker, um, so there are, there are a few more two bedroom than strictly proportional in the project. And um, the thing that, one of the things that we negotiated on this project were 10 units at deeper affordability. Well, there were actually two things, 10 units at deeper affordability, which are not strictly required by inclusionary housing, um, but the developer was willing because um, to Lupita's point, you know, we can house different types of families when we can get lower rents. So um, we got 10 units at 50% AMI rents instead of, and instead of 60, so deeper affordability. Um, and the other thing that they put on the table is that for two and three bedroom units, the IH program will allow them to do them at 80% of the size of the market rate units. Uh, Zocalo put on the table that they would do them at the same size as the market rate units, so bigger than they were required. So there was a little bit of finessing that happened as William said over the several years that we've been in discussion around this project and that's, that's where, how that played out, yeah. Yeah, I thank you very much. It really does help uh, when trying to determine, you know, how deep the negotiations were and what were the give and takes. Is that optimization can go many ways, and uh, optimization can take many different parameters. So I, I know about you cannot win it all, but it, it helps understanding, you know, some of this intricacies of the, you know, the discussions you guys had, and um, so that I don't feel so bad about ending up with only two. Um, of oh, the of oh, the three bedroom ones, thank Lupita, you, Lupita. We've had three different presidents during the course <laughs> of these negotiations. If that gives you any indication of the uh, the intricacies and and the duration of this negotiation, yeah. Well, thank you very much for your efforts. Okay, go ahead, Lisa. Yeah. Um, so I know that you'll get into more details in later stages, um, and I'm sure meet code requirements. But I would love to hear. Um, a bit preliminarily around what you're anticipating in terms of sustainability. And two things that rise to mind for me are um, the landscaping, which I know is part of the detailed plan that staff called out as something that needs to come forward. Um, and I think this site, especially on the creek is interesting for that. And then also building materials and energy efficiency. So I'd be curious to hear about, you know, solar panels or, or permeability of pavers, you know, anything that you uh, typically do in your projects so that you're exploring for this one. Um, to the extent you're aware of that. I know you'll get into more detail as we move uh, through the process if the project moves forward. Well, I'm excited, a planning and building question. So I get to, I get to speak to that one, thank you. Um, 
So yeah, sustainability is, was one of the very first concepts for the site and, and it, we are gonna have 500 kilowatts of solar power on the roof. So all the roofs get solar power, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and that's combined with the city of Boulder requirements. So the, the HERS rating on the units is required to be 50, which is pretty restrictive. You then combine that with the solar power on the roofs and, and we've got very well performing units. What we've found over the years is that what we wanna start with is the envelope. The envelope has to be really good. Um, so we've actually been working with the, the preliminary construction team already to start to figure out how we're gonna hit those HERS ratings. We already have a sustainability consultant on, on site and they're already modeling the units. So we're looking at things like windows and, and wall insulation, <clears throat> how we insulate around the, the foundations and the floor because you know you can lose a lot of heat right down there. So we're, we're looking at all that. Um, we will meet or exceed that 50 HERS um, and we will have all that renewable power on site. So, so that's very exciting. Um, there's other parts of sustainability too. Durability of materials is a big deal, right? So if you have to replace the materials, now you're using carbon to do that. So we're using durable materials in metal and the brick and the hardy board that gets painted to form the siding. That's really durable. That's pretty critical as well. We'll be looking at indoor air quality. That's a little bit further down the line. We haven't gotten there yet. One of the big ones is, I once did the analysis on this. It was maybe 10 years ago now, so the numbers are probably a little tweaked. But you can take five houses or five units and make them 40% better performing or 50% better performing than code from an energy standpoint. And that's the equivalent of taking one car off the road for a year. So driving VMTs is critical, right? So one of the big things this project does is it transfers, I think um, if I remember correctly, City of Boulder Transportation is saying the average um, commute into Boulder for those 60,000 people is 15 miles. And now it's gonna be like a mile or two with the people living here. So that's the equivalent of millions of VMTs a year to recite those people that are currently commuting to this location. So while I agree with you, we do net zero buildings, the buildings are critical, planning is even more important. So that's a big part of this site as well. Hey, Lisa, could, could I uh, also add in, um, this, is, um, uh, th this is our second skin, uh, Zocalo built in 2007, the uh, 2008, I'm sorry, uh, Rocky Mountain region's first LEED certified multifamily building in, um, the, slow, in the, I'm sorry, in the um, Jefferson Park neighborhood of Denver. Um, and so we've been a leader and, uh, and learning ever since. Um, and so we, we try to track to the degree that we can uh, with, the, with the help of uh, Excel, um, where our KBTU per foot per year uh, data uh, are. And so we've been able to see over time that whereas EPA standards are about almost 50 kbtu per foot per year, um, some of our projects are getting down at 20 or low 20s per foot. Uh, we would expect that, that this will be at or below that. So every, every development for us is an opportunity, a test tube to try to do better. Great, okay. Um, so. David, did I see your hand come up, Ensign? Yeah, then um, yeah, we'll do uh, um, I, David I have, first. Um, I have a couple of questions since I uh, was here for the concept review. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the one that, that, maybe, that maybe is a little bit more um, detailed, and that is that um, this site is, is, uh, has bordering on it Arapaho, um, the BNSF uh, railway, and then we've seen the communication from Western Disposable Western Disposal, both at concept review time, and I think they sent another one this time around. And uh, I saw all the analysis that, you know, with the, the upgraded windows and stuff to and the decibel studies. So it looks like it's been addressed that way. Was there any um, consideration of the, uh, of the possibility of actually having um, some sort of a um, explicit agreement? Uh, like, um, and I, I know that even a deed restriction was mentioned, but um, an agreement from the owners and or uh, residents that uh, that there might be the possibility in an industrial zone of having some impact, just uh, just so that we don't find people down the line, uh, you know, complaining about things that are existing conditions. Yeah, that's a really good point. And there's a little known part of the code that actually requires that. So there's a there's a yeah, portion right. of the city of code that says if you're having residential in an industrial area, you're required to provide notice to anyone moving in that there may be um, existing impacts. And I think those are noise, odor, um, and other. 
I think, are what you're required. So yes, that notice is required to happen. It okay. is constructive notice and, and becomes recorded with the deed. We've also carried on discussions, David, over the last several years with Western Disposal. Um, frankly, we're less concerned than they are about the possible nuisance impacts. Uh, we've been in and about the site now for four years. We've never smelled odors. Uh, the, the problem Western Disposal had some years ago was apparently a cannabis operation nearby that some neighbors complained of. So it wasn't actually their facility, it was another facility. Um, so we're, we're frankly not worried about it. We've got a wonderful mature tree canopy. There's a lot of brush between us. I'd like to just quickly though, go back if I could to Lisa, because one of the most important sustainability, environmental sustainability assets I think of this site, which is the first part of the site that I experienced was the multi-use path. And it's the connection between that path, frankly, and the Flatiron Business Park to the north that for me, not necessarily speaking for the team, will be the biggest sign of success of this project. When we see people biking and walking from this important project on Arapaho up to their jobs at Boulder Mountain Repair or Upslope or Sovereign uh, and being able to do so at salaries of 40 to $50,000 a year, administrative staff, clerks, et cetera, that to us will be a sign of environmental success because precisely of the VMT and car trip reduction that, that we think this site represents. Just lastly, remember that the prevailing winds are from the south and west. And so odors don't come this way generally. And well, just on the odors, yeah, I, I've actually noticed uh, the, uh, I thought it was actually like hops from a beer brewery or something, but it's actually further to the north on that path. But, uh, and I've never noticed anything from Western, but, but thanks for answering that because I know that it was, multiple planning board members did want that addressed and I was just was wanted to make sure that that, that was in there. Thank you. I think I saw Sarah and then Lupita with their hands up. Not Sarah, then Lupita. Yes, I'm actually uh, intrigued to, um, uh, to learn from you guys, how is it that you are addressing that while well, we're finding out about uh, during this pandemic, the importance of indoor air quality and in your designs, how is that uh, playing a role in terms of making it safe when people, if hopefully not, but if we do end up in another lockdown, uh, I mean, I'm going around advising people about, you know, clearing the air inside and how important that is. Finally, uh, people are going to pay attention to it. So I'm wondering if this is something that has become part of the way that you design um, your buildings now with regards to, you know, the replenishment of clean air from outside? Oh, goodness, yes. COVID has changed everything, right? I mean, so that was already a, uh, a priority, but it's become a priority both for the property owners and the market. And I'll give you an example. So the fitness area, the fitness building, right, the, the health and wellness building was originally going to be smaller, but what we're finding is the residents generally in all the projects, they don't want to go anymore to like a big box gym. They want to be around something smaller that's more safe, safer, I guess, perceptively safer. Um, so we expanded it so we could put all of the exercise and fitness stuff that anybody would need in that building. But then to the indoor air quality, um, you know, that's a big thing too, because now you got to have a bunch of people there. So we worked um, pretty hard to figure out a way to get an enormous amount of outdoor air into that building. Um, so there's, there's systems that you can actually change the amount of outdoor air that comes in. And you don't always want to do that, right? Because if there's not a pandemic going on, now we're going the opposite way from sustainability because now we have a bunch of unconditioned air. But let's say this continues or let's say there's a rebound or another virus or anything else, we can change the amount of outdoor air coming into that system. And um, yeah, it's less sustainable for a while, but it's a lot safer. So, um, you know, I could go into a lot more detail. I know we're kind of well outside the boundaries of site review, I'm sorry, but it is a, it, it's a really interesting topic. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. I, just because it really goes contrary to sustainability, but it does have to be optimized as well. So I'm glad to hear that you are accounting for those things. Because it doesn't have to be done that way all the time. It's only when the time comes, you need to be prepared. Thank you. Yes. Okay, any other planning board members? David, I see, and John have their hands up. David? Yeah, the other one I wanted to ask about um, that was in the concept review uh, was just kind of interesting. And uh, there was talk about a reconfigurable parking space with removable decks uh, for the future should uh, parking change. And, uh, the, you know, it's a pretty small parking reduction. So I'm kind of interested in whether that uh, 
still lives in some form or whether that was uh, something that kind of went by the wayside? It still lives. Um, you know, we could take an hour presenting these projects to get all the details to you all. And, um, you know, we get 15 minutes. So we kind of decide what's the most important. But yeah, the parking garage is designed so that the, the concrete inside, uh, which is where the garage is, can be removed. If it gets removed, it, that actually turns the outside into two buildings. So again, that's small scale that we're trying to uh, accomplish. And then we can put another ring of, of residential inside because it's a single loaded corridor. So yeah, in the future, if we have automated cars or we're all Ubering or people just drive less, um, there could be with city approval, it would have to be an approval process, you know, another say 40 or 50 units and the removal of a large number of parking spaces. And so even more sustainable in that way. Thank you. Okay, John Gerstel. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I can't resist asking uh, you also about the pond and the water rights that might be associated with that and wondering whether you own those water rights or, or whether there's some agreement with whoever does own them. And the related to that is uh, the question of groundwater level, because the the uh, water level in that pond, I presume, is similar to whatever the groundwater level is nearby. Um, can you address that? Sure thing. So there's two questions there, and I'll let William address the first, and then Steve Blake address the second. So William, right? Thanks, John. Yes. So there are uh, rights in the ditch that feed into the pond. And so we are in negotiations in discussion with the owners of those rights to purchase uh, a share uh, or a fraction of a share, really, a very small fraction of a share. Um, and as we move through the entitlement process, we'll be uh, completing those negotiations and, and thus controlling um, uh, flows into the pond. But it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting and, and, uh, and long history. As Sloan mentioned, the open space works either way. Um, so from a regulatory standpoint, uh, the site is compliant. Um, and then Steve, can you hop in and address the groundwater, please? Sure. Um, so, you know, we, for the groundwater um, analysis- Steve, can you, can you identify, Steve, can you identify yourself for the record, please? Yeah, sure. I'm Steve Blake. Uh, I work with DHI and, and I've worked on water issues for the, for the Waterview site. And Steve, maybe video too, Thanks. if we can, if we can see that beard of yours. Sure. Great. Yep. There I am. Um, so yeah, just to to quickly summarize some of the some of the work done. So so there's been groundwater um, site investigation um, done as part of the the geotechnical reporting, um, which was done in a few phases. Um, and and groundwater monitoring wells were dug and and. Uh, data recorded for that. So I, I think that that's characterized in a way that supports the site development and, and is, you know, done everything that was necessary for, for the project. Um, you know, the, the, the variation of, of groundwater across the site, um, remembering that, you know, there's a lot of grade across the site from, from south to north um, is something that we've anticipated and, and understood in all of our, our analysis. So if there's something else that was specific to your question or a concern about that, let me know. I'd be happy to address that too. Uh, thank you. Just wanted to know that somebody had been thinking carefully about it. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we, John, we actually, we actually have a section showing where the water level is in relation to the improvement. So if you're interested, we can pull that up and show you. I, I've been looking at it. Thanks. Okay, Sarah. Uh, so I wanna follow up on something that was mentioned in several of the letters, which had to do about the uh, uh, dirt fill that has apparently been moved onto and then off of the land. And I'm wondering if you could walk us through what the purpose of that, uh, that transaction was and um, what it means for uh, the plans that you have. So William or David, can you address what happened and then Steve maybe address the result of, of how it's all working? Sure, David, I, I'd be happy to address or, or you can. Um, Sarah, basically uh, there's a long and interesting history going back <laughs> at least 15 or so years. Uh, Edward Stafford uh, is probably the, the expert of record on this. Um, 
we bought the site in, in September 2017, knowing uh, much about that history. Um, but more importantly, working with Edward and city staff, even before we purchased the property and, and after, we stated our commitment to work with city staff to remedy what had been a, an interesting fill history. Basically, the site was legally uh, filled. It was filled by, by permit uh, about 14 years ago. Uh, but some of that fill needed to be removed uh, in order to comply with FEMA rules. Um, and it was precisely that removal of some of that legally placed fill that we um, undertook. Uh, we then engaged DHI, uh, who actually did much of the flood modeling for the South Boulder Creek watershed, is also working on the CU South project uh, with the city. We engaged DHI just to make sure we were once and for all getting all of the grading uh, and the flood protection work right. And that, that's really what the last couple of years have been about. Um, so the past is, is past. What we have now is a site that is fully protective and fully compliant. We have conveyance zones that move water from south to north effectively. Um, the site itself, the development footprint uh, sits out of the floodplain. That's that was one of the, the benefits, if you will, of the fill uh, done so many years ago. Um, and, then, and, and Phil, maybe, maybe we can ask Steve to kind of jump in and explain the regulatory um, compliance. Yeah, S Steve, can you sort of explain the the mapping and modeling that was done? And sure, yeah. What that um, resulted in. Yep, happy to do that. Um, so, the detailed floodplain analysis was performed by our uh, staff of uh, scientists and engineers who really have decades of experience in modeling floodplains and, and detailed channel hydraulics, um, especially in Boulder. Um, this analysis was reviewed and approved by the city of Boulder and engineering staff, Mile High Flood District, and, and the FEMA regulatory professionals and independent review consultants. Um, it was an extensive review process over two years that resulted in the final determination. Uh, the primary goals achieved here are to restore the floodplain conditions that protect the community and meet the regional floodplain management requirements. Um, that, that's really what um, the connection to the, you know, the site grading and, and topography um, was on the site. Um, and, and so getting that right was, was where we spent our time in, in modeling, surveying, you know, doing the analysis, and then going through the extensive FEMA review process that involved all those agencies that I listed. So um, there's really no gray area or uncertainty about the outcome of the process. Um, you know, I think that the, uh, the, you know, the case resulting here is that, you know, there's no any significant impacts to the flood hydrology for any neighboring properties. Um, so, uh, you know, that's something that I think we all feel very comfortable uh, with in, in documenting and, and, um, getting out there clearly that you know we've we've done every every task and checked every box to make sure that uh, the the floodplain management requirements are fully met um, to everyone's satisfaction. Thank you for that explanation. Sure. Yep. All right. Has that generated any other interest in asking a question of the applicant? All right. So. I'm going to close up uh, planning board questions for the applicant right now. And um, given that we're going to jump into public comment next, and we've had uh, two hours and 15 minutes so far of the meeting, uh, I'm going to call a break. So those of you who need to grab something to eat or handle something at home um, can do that. And uh, we'll come back at 825 and I'll turn it over to Jean at that point and we'll start up public comment. Okay, enjoy your nine minutes.
All right, it's time to come back and uh, get the planning board meeting back in order. And we're going to dive into public comment for the Waterview project. Um, again, we are gonna need uh, commenters' names and addresses, and you'll be limited to two minutes. Uh, Jean Gatza is going to manage the process. She's going to uh, have a clock up so people can see the time. And I'll turn it over to Jean. Great. Thanks, Harmon. Appreciate that. And so, again, everyone, thank you so much for your patience tonight. Um, please bear with us. We've got lots of folks that are um, here to speak to this item. Um, I the um, the list of this of folks signed up is on the planning board website. Um, and I'll try to read names to queue everybody up, and then we'll start the um, we'll start the clock after after you're unmuted. So I'm going to go through all of the um, list of the signups, and then we'll um, if folks want to uh, use the raise hand function, you can go ahead and do that. We'll get to the folks with raised hands um, after we go through the list. So we have first up. Anna Kramer, followed by Jackson Maynard, followed by Charles Brock, followed by Megan Coles. Okay, so um, Anna, you may unmute. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Anna Kramer. I live in South Boulder. I'm a graduate worker at CU, although I'm here speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of my employer. And I'm asking you to please support the Waterview project. As first a young professional and now as a graduate worker and student, finding affordable housing within a reasonable distance of my workplace has been a constant challenge. I, along with many other graduate workers and young professionals in this city are forced to spend far, far more than the recommended 30% of our income on rent because of the lack of affordable options. Some people I know are spending up to 50% or more. We put up with substandard and cramped housing just to find something we can afford here. Until recently, I lived in a place in which I couldn't stand fully upright in the only bathroom and which had an ankle twisting hole in the floor, but hey, I could afford it, that was nice. Other friends and peers live in the shadows of Boulder's occupancy limits, having housemates when Boulder has made that illegal, or many more folks that I know can't live in Boulder at all. They've had been forced to move to the L towns or further afield. So we lose valued community members and they add to the tens of thousands of people who commute into Boulder each day. The city needs more affordable housing. We need denser housing. We need housing with good public transit and bike access like the Waterview Project. So if Boulder wants to meet its goals of reducing carbon emissions and increasing social, economic, and racial diversity, we need to actually do the work to get there. Waterview is part of that work. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Next up is Jackson Maynard. Whoops. All right. Hello, I'm Jackson Maynard. I'm a law student at CU and uh, I'm here to express support for this project. One thing that has confused me about this project is uh, in regard to the old tail neighbors and why they're so against this project. Uh, 1.5 acre mansions uh, across the road and they've brought this hired gun to confuse people about the flooding and to delay this project. In the meantime, housing insecurity is higher than ever. More and more of our black and brown members of this community are being pushed out, as are the same essential workers who kept our economy going throughout the last year. I'm disappointed that these neighbors are fighting so hard to ha excuse me, <clears throat> to have low income people, including black and brown people at Waterview. 
to our commitments to provide a diversity of housing and greater racial equity in our housing. Listening to a bunch of angry white neighbors living in mansions is not the answer. And listening to the teachers, the nurses, the transportation advocates, the climate change advocates, and the East Boulder business leaders is. Thank you very much. Gene, you're muted. Okay, I'm not sure how that happened. Um, okay, next up is Charles Brock, followed by Macon Coles, followed by Jan Burton, followed by Lori Call. So, um, Charles, let me unmute you. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you, Jean. My name is Chuck Brock. I live, live at 717 Evergreen in the city of Boulder. I'm a scientist at NOAA, where I study air quality and climate change, and I'm also a member of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, and also of Community Cycles Advocacy Committee, but I'm speaking on my own behalf tonight. Um, I've been on your side of the podium before for extensive public comments, and I uh, really want you to know that I appreciate your time and your willingness to listen. Um, I strongly support this water, water view development. We, we desperately need all the housing we can get almost anywhere. And in recent years, the young scientists I've hired at NOAA had about $60,000 per year initially coming into a postdoctoral position. They've just not been able to find reasonable uh, housing in Boulder for 30% or less of their income. They have uh, been living in Longmont, Louisville, Superior, and pre-pandemic at least, they would commute in each day, often by car. But Waterview really provides a lot more options for these early career employees. I, I recognize that by itself, it's not a solution, but it, it is a big step in the right direction. Uh, this site is already along a major transit corridor and the East Arapahoe transportation plan includes future bus rapid transit in dedicated lanes, so it will only get better. And there are already great connections to the city's bicycle network and good access to nearby jobs. There are restaurant and entertainment options within easy biking distance, although not within easy walking distance, uh, at least not yet. Uh, but this may change as East Arapahoe undergoes extensive redevelopment in the coming years. So while I very much like this develop, develop, development, I think there are some transportation aspects that could be improved. The 2040 vision of the East Arapahoe transportation plan shows raised protected bike lanes between the street and the bunk I use path. This should be included now or it won't happen for decades. And I also don't see charging infrastructure for electric cars and bikes. This is very important. We're rapidly switching to electric vehicles and at a minimum conduit should be installed so that wires can be run inexpensively in the near future and the power to the site needs to be able to accommodate these charging loads. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Chuck. Okay, next up is Macon. Macon. Members of the planning board, my name is Macon Coles. I live at 1726 Mapleton Avenue. I wanna thank you for your service on the board. Mm -hmm. What you do is so very important. The long and expensive planning process has significantly reduced the size of the Waterview project and thus already reduced its contribution to providing homes for ordinary people in our community. When Waterview was presented to planning board at concept review, 340 units were proposed on this 15 acre site, whereas that number has been cut now to 317. So this project could have made an even larger contribution to addressing the crisis of housing affordability had it not already been downsized because of neighborhood opposition. Indeed, the site review plan under submission in the spring of 2019 was for 376 units, 40% of which 150 units- and For about six or seven be, more minutes. Would be, am I okay? You're okay, go ahead, Nathan. Okay. Indeed, the site review plan under submission in the spring of 2019 was for 376 units, 40% of which 150 units would be permanently affordable. So the process thus far has succeeded in losing for this community 70 permanently affordable units. 
This project has already been shrunk too much in response to neighborhood opposition. Your duty is to the whole city of 100,000 people, not to the 100 adjacent neighbors. The design of this small neighborhood and this lovely site is exquisite. The attention to detail at street level is remarkable. The narrow streets with facing balconies will be a place as in Italy during the pandemic that people can sing to each other from their balconies. The designer of this site has designed some of the most extraordinary places in our community. Iris Hollow, Studio Muse, the Holiday Crescent around the park and many others. If neighborhood character cannot accommodate housing for working folks, then that character itself must be re-examined and stripped to its core. People not like us are unwelcome. People who aren't rich need to live far away. This is not the boulder that any reasonable person wants. Thank you, Megan. The next few speakers are Jan Burton, Lori Call, Matt Benjamin, Kurt Nordbeck, and Lucy Conklin. Um, let's see. All right. So, Jan. Jan, you can go ahead. Good evening, planning board members, and thank you for your contribution to our local democracy. Boulder's racial equity plan, recently adopted by city council, points to the city's historical use of discriminatory land use and development policies. Single family zoning, height limits, green space, exorbitant design requirements, and inclusion, inclusionary housing fees all have contributed to high housing costs. We all know the result. Our workers can't afford to live here and we do not support a diverse community. In the Waterview Mixed Income Project, we find many of the most progressive development ideas, density on a transit corridor, the inclusion of affordable housing, walkability, bikeability, proximity to many of Boulder's jobs and on-site rooftop solar. This project results in something that we supposedly cherish in this town environmental excellence and affordability. The developer has actively worked with the city to achieve FEMA's stringent flood control requirements, giving up land in the process. They have also worked with local neighborhoods to address their concerns, designing substantially fewer units as a concession. However, a few neighbors still object to something that achieves so much this project will alone deliver two thirds of Boulder's annual goal of affordable housing units and will decrease millions of vehicle miles traveled and millions of tons of CO2. The community benefit on this project is stunning and we must look at it as an example of excellence in a Boulder wide project. It's time to support something we have been idealizing for years. It addresses our middle income housing plan a racial equity plan, and so much more. This should be a template for future developments in Boulder. Please approve this project as submitted. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. I'm just gonna remind folks if um, you could please state your name and address for the record when you start. And all right, next up is Lori Call. Okay, Lori, you can go ahead and start. Let me get unmuted. Uh, Jean, can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Lori Call, Senior Director of Policy Programs at the Boulder Chamber, 2440 Pearl Street. I've had the privilege of serving on the East Boulder Subcommunity Working Group for the past two years. I'm not speaking on behalf of the working group, but as part of it, I have heard important feedback related to the area. We have 17,000 jobs in East Boulder, but only 466 people living there because there aren't housing options. When I talk to people along the bike path, many mentioned that they work nearby and would love to live in the area, but instead commute in from Lafayette and Longmont because they can't afford Boulder. Water gives us a chance to improve our carbon footprint by reducing their commutes. 
and it's strategically located off of Arapaho, so we'll further support our environmental goals by leveraging the additional transit improvements planned for that corridor. I've heard from young professionals that Boulder needs a hip new area with reasonable housing prices. Many are CU alumni, like folks we already heard from this evening, who are, were fortunate to find jobs in town. They've graduated for more modest group housing options on the Hill, but can't afford to live downtown. They are the nurses who work at Boulder Community Hospital, the scientists from Ball, the small business workforce from the Flatirons Business Park, who we want to retain as Boulder residents. This provides them with homes so they develop even deeper roots in our community. Waterview provides housing opportunities for those earlier in their careers looking for the chance to live and work in East Boulder. It's housing for young couples and growing families. It's housing for a more inclusive community reflective of a more diverse economic spectrum. Boulder was recently ranked the seventh most expensive housing market in the country. Let's provide more housing options for our workforce to ensure our residents reflect the inclusive diverse community to which we aspire. Thank you, Lori. Next up is Matt Benjamin, who will be followed by Kurt Nordbeck, Lucy Conklin, Scott Sternberg, and Mary Beth Velinket. Okay, so Matt, let me see if I can get you unmuted. Okay, Matt, you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? You can go ahead. Um, my name is Matt Benjamin. I live at uh, 2395 Vassar Drive in Boulder. Thank you, Planning Board, for um, the, the talk on this and, and uh, the conversation and uh, your service to our community. I'm speaking to you today in support of the Waterview Project. This represents a great opportunity to take action towards our stated community goals and commitments to affordable and medium income housing. Reimagining East Arapahoe is a critical step for Boulder to meet our needs of today and tomorrow. Waterview meets a ton of criteria from our Boulder Valley Comp Plan to our Transportation Master Plan, our East Arapahoe Transportation Plan, and the ongoing work of the East Boulder Subcommunity Working Group. This project has clearly met and in many cases exceeded the requirements and the needs of Boulder. Now is the time to abandon our historical exclusionary housing policies and be the inclusive community that we want to be. As we aim to reduce traffic and miles driven through thoughtful transportation and roadway designs, we also strive to lessen our carbon footprint and build sustainable and climate focused housing and buildings. We can start to step into that future now by moving forward with this project. Waterview aligns with many of our community values and goals, specifically addressing our jobs housing imbalance by being located in close proximity to two of Boulder's largest employers. It also fosters diversity and inclusion through mixed use and affordability. By building housing along a major transit corridor, which is difficult to impossible in most other parts of Boulder due to them already being built out. The challenges of housing and transportation in Boulder are real and in many ways difficult, and you all know this firsthand. Let's rise to the challenges and stay focused on the vision of our future. Because if we can't do it here, it begs the question, can we do it anywhere? I ask that we seize the moment and the opportunity that comes but once in a generation or two where we get to reinvent a vision for both transportation and housing for a large portion of our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Matt. Okay, Kurt Nordback is our next speaker. Kurt, you can go ahead and unmute. Hi, Kurt Nordback, 777 Delwood Avenue. <clears throat> Speaking just for myself tonight. I'd like to express my support for this project. This is an appropriate place for higher intensity housing, housing given proximity to transit on Arapahoe and the South Boulder Creek path. It's also consistent with the general intent of the East Boulder subcommunity planning process. Neighbors have been opposed in part because of concern over parking spillover onto Old Dick. Based on the amount of parking being provided, I think this is an unjustified fear. They have also suggested that people walking and biking on Old Tail will be endangered by parked cars. As someone who uses the street regularly for both walking and biking, I disagree completely. If Waterview residents were to park on Old Tail, which again, I doubt, that would in fact calm traffic. 
It's unfortunate that due to external pressure, the amount of housing was reduced and the tallest building in the project is now the parking structure. Nonetheless, I feel it meets the site and use review criteria and the parking reduction meets the site review criteria of adequately accommodating the demand. Boulder desperately needs additional housing. Please follow the staff recommendation and vote to approve this project. Thanks, Kurt. Next up would be Lucy Conklin, but I'm not seeing Lucy in the list. Lucy, if you're there under a different name, please um, shoot me a message in the chat and we'll queue you up next. Um, then after that is Scott Sternberg. Scott, you can go ahead and unmute. Thank you. Um, my name is Scott Sternberg. I'm the executive director of the Boulder Economic Council, which is the economic vitality arm of the Boulder Chamber, 2440 Pearl Street. Uh, first, I want to thank the planning board for uh, allowing us to speak and, and comment tonight. Um, I wanted to comment a little bit about, uh, it's been my privilege to uh, speak to local businesses and the community and community leaders over the past um, month as we've been enduring this pandemic. And one of the themes that we've um, heard very strong and very loud is that going forward, Boulder needs to see a strong and inclusive recovery. And I think many of the topics and many of the uh, points that were discussed tonight speak exactly to the both the strong and the inclusive aspect of what we need to do going forward. We've also heard the quantitative information relating to the 60,000 plus commuters that come into Boulder every day to work. Not only does that have a climate impact and a sustainability impact, it also has a very real economic impact. As we've seen now with remote working, as those commuters have not been coming into the Boulder uh, area, we've seen a decline in retail sales tax. So as we recover and as we invest in more housing such that employees can both live and work in Boulder, we certainly will have an economic uplift as well. From a qualitative perspective, we also hear from businesses that they um, need to be able to effectively source talent and source that talent locally through all strata of their workforce. And having another community that is close to the Flatiron community, uh, the business community and the business park uh, is a very important aspect to be able to create a vibrant work and play environment. Thank you very much for your work and um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Our next few speakers will be Mary Beth Billink Billinkett, Eric Budd, Thomas Volkhausen, Linda Spillman, and Gary Sprung. So Mary Beth, I think I saw two entries for you, so I will try to unmute this first one. Mary Beth, you can try to go ahead. Hi there, thank you. My name is Mary Beth Velikat, and I am one of the neighbors that has been so disparagingly spoken about this evening. Um, but I hope to, to let you know, I, I live at 1510 Old Tail Road. Um, I wanna let you know that I am in favor of the development of this parcel of land, um, as long as it conforms to the city of Boulder's own zoning and development guidelines. Uh, development of this property overall is going to be a very big improvement to East Boulder and is going to provide some clearly needed housing options, particularly the order affordable units. My concerns, which I outlined in my letter to the planning board, center around infrastructure. And given the time constraints of tonight, I'm going to focus on just one point. Um, and that is my concern with the use of a single access point from the development onto an already congested state highway. The proposal for this property has 317 units, 15,000 commercial square feet of commercial space, which means around 400 to 750 people on site at any given time. It's unfathomable to me that safety standards could allow a project of this size only one access point, particularly in an area that's prone to flooding. It's not a stretch to imagine stranding 500 people in the next flood or in the event of a major traffic incident. The problem is solvable, uh, and it has been addressed a little bit tonight um, by building a bridge over the creek to the northeast, linking the development to the intersection at Arapahoe and Cherryvale, which would provide two points of access to the development. There are other bridges over the creek, including one for the existing railroad. Um, and 
uh, I think it's crucial for the safety of both the people on who travel Arapaho every day, as well as the residents that we have two access points to this development. I urge the city to require a second access point as a condition for project approval and not to allow the parcel to the east of the, the development to be subdivided out, which would probably preclude any future access to the main site if it was determined at a later date that it was critical. That's all I have tonight. Um, I do thank you for the time and I would like the city to consider a second access point to the development. Thank you, Mary Beth. Next up is Eric Budd. Eric, you may unmute. Thanks, Eric Budd. I live at uh, the Mango Manor Cooperative in Boulder. Um, I'm the campaign chair of Bedrooms Are for People. And although this project is not directly relevant to our campaign, I want to talk about some of the similarities. Um, in nearly our, all parts of Boulder, it's illegal to live with more than three unrelated people. It doesn't matter whether or not you own your home or are renting with other housemates. It doesn't matter how big the home is or how much potential housing that that uh, house could offer. And we're working to change that law to allow at least one person to live in each bedroom of a home. So one of these arguments to uphold exclusionary occupancy limits is that people say it would cause impacts in the neighborhood. Um, that, mean, that normally means traffic or parking or other concerns. Um, and because of this perceived concern, the city denies people their First Amendment right to decide who they want to live with. And so this situation has a direct parallel on new housing developments like Waterview. So we have a development that would provide housing for hundreds of people and at least 25% permanently affordable. And we're talking about all housing types. We're talking about um, efficiencies, studios, um, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom units, which is, which is truly remarkable. And the fact that it's also um, the affordable units are integrated with the market rate is incredible. Um, I'm really impressed by that. Um, and so all I want to say is that I, I think there are some, some concerns that the neighbors have brought um, and those should really be looked at, but we can't, we can't block or reduce the scale of housing that is desperately needed um, over these concerns. We just need to work to find solutions for them. So I, I fully support the Water Review Project. It's a good project in a place that has massive potential for good transit and a lot more housing than this. Um, that could also let people work and live in Boulder. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Next up is Thomas Volkhausen. Tom, you may go ahead and unmute. Hi, I'm Tom Volkhausen and I'm speaking for myself, but I'm also speaking as a member of the Sierra Club uh, <coughs> Committee uh, Indian Peaks group, and we voted to send a letter in support of this project, and I'm hoping all the planning board members saw our letter. Um, oh, by the way, I live at 2636 5th Street in Boulder. Um, this project is exactly what uh, the Sierra Club National, the kind of project, this is exactly the kind of project that uh, the Sierra Club national uh, infill guidelines would support. Um, and uh, we're, the Sierra Club is well aware that uh, efficient urban design that supports walking, biking, and reduces automobile dependence is a major strategy for addressing climate change. The city of Boulder has declared a climate emergency. And I feel that uh, creating compact housing alternatives that support 15 minute neighborhoods within the city is critical to actually dealing with a climate emergency. And Waterview is an example of a kind of project that does address climate change. I think it's one project and it's one step in the right direction. Not only does planning board need to approve the Waterview project, but we need to make opportunities for more compact, walkable uh, neighborhood type developments like Waterview across Boulder. Um, we recently were discussing racial and economic equity in Boulder, and this is a kind of project that will allow a, a wider diversity of people to be able to live in Boulder and not commute long distances from distant communities. Thanks. 
Thank you, Tom. Next up is Linda Spillman. Linda, you can go ahead and unmute. Linda, you can you can go ahead and unmute. There you go. Oh, you got it. You can start. Hi there. Can you hear me? You can. Great. Hi everyone. My name is Linda Spillman. I live at 703 Calmia Avenue, and I've lived in Boulder for over 20 years. Nine years ago, I started a company called Fabricate. We're a small fabric boutique and craft studio located on the east end of Pearl Street. I have a staff of between five and 15 employees depending on the season. Over the years, I would get roughly half of my staff has not been able to afford to live in Boulder. I wanted to share the perspective of a small business owner who works closely with middle and lower income earners. Employees who live in Boulder, ideally within walking and biking distance to work, offer many advantages and I'll just name a few. First, they're willing to work shorter shifts because they can easily zip over to the shop. Fabricate offers lots of one hour private instruction and I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I literally have employees who drive from Longmont and Broomfield once a week for a one hour private lesson and then turn around and drive home. Employees who live in, in the city call in sick less frequently due to weather and transportation related issues, and they're consistently more punctual because they don't have to deal with unforeseen traffic issues. They don't leave their shift to move, they don't have to leave their shift to move their cars after the three hour time limit in the surrounding neighborhood. They don't compete for one of our two tandem alley parking spots. And I could go on and on, but I just want to emphasize that Waterview offers many amenities that my staff would love, such as proximity to a bike path with easy access to downtown, a community garden, electric bikes, eco pass, and a swimming pool. So to sum up, I just want to urge the planning board to, to not let our community miss this opportunity to provide inclusive, high quality, affordable housing for Boulder's teachers, nurses and retail and other service workers and vote in favor of the Waterview community. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Linda. Next up on the list, I have Gary Strong, but I am not seeing Gary in a list of attendees. Um, Gary, if you're here under a different name, please let me know in the chat. Uh, so our next few speakers, Janet Heimer, Regina Zaragoza Frey, Jack Turkin, Ryan, Ryan Bonick, Eric Maxfield. So next up will be Janet. Janet, you can go ahead and unmute. Okay, um, I may be having internet issues. I'm hoping not too badly. Um, computer is flickering. So I'm gonna turn my camera off and hope that that helps. Great. Janet? There yes, you can, there I am now, thank you. I'm Janet Heimer. I live at 2216 Bluff Street in Boulder. And I am supporting the Waterview housing because I think that there is a lack of housing for moderate and middle income families. And I, in order for Boulder to meet its plan to reduce emissions and protect our environment, it's necessary to build housing where people who work in Boulder can actually live in Boulder. The Waterview location is perfect on many levels in that it's near the creek path and the bus lines so that there's an easy commute without having to drive. The homes are going to be beautiful, energy efficient, and well-maintained because that's how the city does their housing. 
I would like there to be less efficiency housing or apartments in this complex though, and more one, two and three bedrooms, if that can be addressed. I've lived in Boulder for more than 50 years and every time affordable housing is proposed in a neighborhood, there is lots of opposition. Just because there's opposition to a proposal doesn't mean it shouldn't be approved. We need to look at the broader needs of the community and do what is right. I'm sure that there is probably some fear in the neighborhoods close by that are opposed to this. And a lot of those we hear over the years, I have anyway, when I've gone to these kinds of meetings in the past. I'm not sure what the fear is, but I know it's not really about noise, crime, or increased traffic. Because if you look at other successful projects over the last 20 years, these issues are unfounded. And I know my time is up. I'd just like to close by saying those of you opposed to this housing who live in Boulder now, you know how expensive it is to live here don't deny someone else the opportunity to live here. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Next up is Regina Zaragoza. Regina, you can go ahead and unmute. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, hi, uh, my name is Regina Zaragoza Fry, and I am a resident of Boulder, as well as a current master's student at CU Law School. Um, I am originally from Mexico, uh, but my family has been living in Boulder since I was 11 years old. Um, I currently work at Floor Nature Experience, which is located uh, on 63rd Street, close to where this project is being built. But I'm here speaking on, on my person in my personal capacity and not as a representative of my organization. I'm asking you to, to support this project because, as you know, there is a huge lack of affordable housing in Boulder. In, all, in order to promote equity and diversity in Boulder, we need to address housing as part of the conversation. If we want more people of color to move to Boulder and diversify the, the majority white population, this project is a great step in the right direction. Speaking as a student of color living in Boulder, I support this project. And that's all I have, thank you. Great. Thank you, Rashina. Regina. Um, next up would be Jack Turkin. I'm seeing Jack on the list. Um, Jack, if you're here um, and under a different name, please let me know in the chat and we'll move you up. Um, after that, we have Ryan Bonick. Um, here we go. There we go. Ryan, you can go ahead. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Ryan Bonick and I live at 3120 Pearl Parkway. I'd just like to thank the board members for your time. Uh, I'm not really one for public speaking. It honestly terrifies me, uh, but I care a lot about housing and uh, this housing project and the positive impacts that it'll have on Boulder. Uh, I strongly support the construction because it provides Boulder with a great opportunity to live out its ideals, inclusivity, environmental stewardship, and multiple usable modes of transportation. I care a lot about these ideals, which is why I care a lot about uh, Waterview. For inclusivity, the Waterview construction includes on-site permanently affordable units above and beyond the minimum requirements, right alongside and next to market rate housing. This ensures that people of all economic statuses are able to live in Boulder, and it can help improve the abysmal lack of diversity in Boulder as historical racism has led to disproportionate representation of people of color and lower economic classes. Second, on environmental impact, the addition of more housing in Boulder will help reduce the amount of incoming commuters every morning. Now, obviously 317 units will barely make a dent in the, uh, I think it's like 60,000 daily commuters that Boulder has, but every bit counts. Let's reduce the amount of vehicle miles and the corresponding emissions. Finally, Waterview's proximity to the Boulder Path Network and the jump bus will allow residents to additionally reduce their climate footprint by utilizing alternative forms of transportation instead of having to drive everywhere. Hell, they could even go car free. 
I'm asking the planning board to live by the ideals we espouse as a city and support this development. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, next up is Eric Maxfield. Eric, you can go ahead. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Maxfield. Uh, I work at 3223 Arapahoe Avenue, and I'm a past chair of the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless, and I'm a current attorney working on fair housing and eviction defense uh, in Boulder County Courts. Um, I, I'm writing, or I'm sorry, I'm appearing uh, in support of the Broad Waterview proposal uh, in my personal capacity, but my personal capacity is informed by my experience, uh, in particular with the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless. Uh, Boulder as a city and as a community is very generous in its support of services for those without homes, and we work to provide housing for the most vulnerable among us. But uh, we do also need to have a concern for the staff and social workers who support our homeless community. You know, where do they live? Uh, it's my experience that many staff and social workers in our community need to live out of the city just to be able to afford housing. Uh, but I think that Boulder is a better, more compassionate and more diverse place when we can have affordable housing for those individuals who support and nurture our community. So I'm hoping that you'll keep that in mind as you consider this proposal, continue to support adding to Boulder's affordable housing uh, and support this project. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Our next few speakers are Joanne Simonson, Perry Shapelow, Sarah Dawn Hayes, Haynes, Tila Duan, and Mark Strangle. So Joanne, let me get you unmuted. And you should be able to unmute and go ahead. Yes, um, my name is Joanne Simonson. I live in Southeast Boulder. I'm opposed to uh, residential uses on this industrial site as proposed because of the traffic access and parking plans and the very tall buildings. The traffic study is weak and flawed as no traffic counts were taken at the U-turn site and it is based on declining traffic on Arapahoe, but CDOT says there will be more traffic. Proposing a traffic plan that is a free-for-all of U-turns and crossings over lanes is insane and dangerous. The single access point and the separate access point for fire trucks are both on Arapahoe, which both will be flooded out and closed down in a flood similar to 2013 flood. The residents will be trapped and unsafe. This bad plan offers no alternative routes and no connections with other properties. Please require a good traffic mitigating plan of using Cherryvale intersection with a bridge over the creek. Cherryvale remained open in the 2013 flood. This site has poor RTD services. There are no nearby grocery stores and no all-purpose retail stores. Car use is needed, so car parking spots are also needed. The developer offers little parking, so there will be parking overflow south of Arapahoe where the streets are narrow and they are also multi-use paths. The streets and multi-use paths will be unsafe for everyone. For the building heights with a soil fill of more than 10 feet deep, the proposed extra high buildings will appear 50 to 65 feet high, which is way out of character. Please have the courage to, to deny this plan and vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Next up is Perry Shapelow. Perry, you can go ahead and unmute. Hi there, my name is Perry Shaplow and I have lived in Boulder as a renter for five years. Um, I currently live at 29 North. I'm also the board president of Mother House, but I'm here in my personal capacity. I am very much in support of the Waterview project for a number of reasons, but I love the housing opportunity that this creates for the hospital. Our nurses and other hospital staff 
are the backbone of our community. And we surely felt that this past year more than ever. Um, they deserve the opportunity to live where they work. And I'm happy to see that this project has the ability to help them do just that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Perry. Next up is Sarah Dawn Haynes. Sarah Dawn, you may go ahead and unmute. Thank you. Hello. My name is Sarah Dawn Haynes and I live at 1210 Lehigh Street and I am um, a 17 year renter in the same spot and it's given me a lot of um, perspective about building a career and a life here in Boulder. Um, I am a member of the Bedrooms Are For People team working on um, changing uh, our use of existing housing stock to use it better. And I'm also on the executive committee with Tom of the Indian Peak Sierra Club. We um, are leaning into decades of housing comprehensive studies. I'm holding the city of Boulder's resiliency strategy that was published in 2016. Um, I was part of the 100 Resilient Cities uh, training. Um, I'm also surrounded by books around um, mobilizing to save civilization. Um, I have many uh, articles and tweets of Dr. Julian Aggieman who writes prolifically around the connections between improving um, our um, communities through the potential and sharing in cities to decrease inequality, increase social capital, and to cut resource use. Um, these resources are available for um, you know, all of our community to, to review and to understand that this is um, what Boulder is about and what will help our community be um, uh, resilient into the future. Thank you for your time on this and all the city staff's work. It's been a great presentation. Thank you, Sarah Dawn. Next up is Tila Duan. Tila, I'm probably saying your name wrong and I apologize. I should know better. Um, you may go ahead and unmute. Thanks, Jean. You should know better. Uh, it's Tila Duhame. <laughs> I live at 2201 4th Street, um, and I'm extremely lucky that I live within easy walking and biking distance to downtown. I recognize that not everybody has that luxury, but I wish that they did. I have worked in the transportation and urban design space for about 15 years now, and I have long advocated for the kind of housing that the Waterview development is designed to be. It's accessible, affordable, sustainable. It's, it's not just housing, but it's thoughtfully placed along a busy and burgeoning transit and employment corridor. Uh, it incorporates the kind of mixed use placemaking that we need more of. We need mixed use, well-sited development like this to be the next best thing to doing infill in neighborhoods like mine, where we already have a stable of businesses that meet our daily or weekly needs for residents. Um, Developments like Waterview enable people to live near where they work or shop or recreate instead of driving elsewhere. The permanently affordable units, they are desperately needed. We all agree on that. But even the market rate units, they're likely to be much more within reach for lower income, lower carbon footprint families. This will likely help fill a void in housing options for both young adults who will lack the resources to buy homes in sprawling single family neighborhoods uh, as well as for adults who are aging and no longer want big houses or big yards to maintain. People who, like my neighbors, who are starting to be more reliant on, on their own neighbors to help them out and don't want to live in assisted senior living, or at least not yet. Apartment life is ideal for all kinds of people. Our low-income housing crunch in Boulder is distressing, and Waterview is a terrific option to include in a range of housing types available in Boulder. It's a great alternative to our monoculture of single-family homes that are placed far away from the places that people need to go. Our old zoning and planning and transportation patterns are deeply problematic, and we've committed in a range of community plans that Sloan described to do better for future generations by supporting projects like this. It is time to get started. I urge you to approve this proposal tonight. 
And finally, to planning board, uh, thank you for all your service in Harmon. We will miss you. Thanks, Tila. Okay, I, next up I have Mark Strangle, but I'm not seeing Mark on the list at the moment. So our next few speakers are Bill Williams, Tom Corson, Brad Peterson, Craig Ferraro, and Barbara Corson. So Mark, if you're here under a different name, shoot me. Oh, okay, uh, Mark in Boulder. Okay, I'm thinking that Mark in Boulder is Mark Strangle. Mark, if you could um, confirm your full name and address, I will. Um, you should be able to unmute now. Okay. Mark, we can, hey, can you hear me. I'm, uh, this is Mark Stangle and I live at 4738 McKinley. I'm a 43 year resident in Boulder. I've really seen it grow and I came into this presentation with a lot of questions and most of them were answered very well and I was very pleased with the presentation. I was uh, just moved into East Boulder uh, just at the advent of the flood in 2013. And uh, like many of us, I just kind of hunkered down and took care of my own business. But then later I learned much more about what happened during the flood. And I was very concerned about uh, the Waterview area when I first learned about it because it was uh, the ground was raised there, possibly displacing uh, water to increase the water level in other areas should there be a future flood event. I was also uh, very concerned uh, about uh, the fact that the water riverbed uh, ran through the golf course originally historically and uh, that I don't think that we really know what's going to happen when the next flood event occurs. So uh, then I learned more about the water view development. I looked at the, the swale that was uh, uh, intended to bring water around into the pond, but then I wondered where does the water go when it reaches the pond? And so I, I think there's some engineering questions uh, that are remaining. Um, I've also have concerns about the traffic. Uh, I know that the Rapo traffic is very high and that the eastbound uh, to westbound uh, transition is going to be very difficult for residents. I am a, a, an engineer and I've been working in uh, for the city with the city of Boulder as a rental housing inspector for over 20 years and very familiar with many housing issues and I understand the desire to have more housing. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, um, is everyone still seeing my timer? Okay. Thanks. Okay, great, Mark. All right, next up will be Bill Williams. And this is William Williams. You may unmute. Bill, you can go ahead. Okay, and I'm, I'm seeing the name William Williams and asking to unmute. Okay. Um, Bill, if you're there, you can please try to unmute. And if not, we'll come back to you. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep moving. Um, after Bill Williams will be Tom Corson. Okay, wait, am I unmuted? You are, you can go ahead. Oh, finally, okay, I'm sorry about that. I, I live within 600 feet of the Waterview uh, property, and I agree with most everything that's been said about the need for housing, especially affordable housing. When I came here in 1984 uh, as a young orthopedic surgeon, uh, you know, I could afford a house because I sold a starter house in the Twin Cities. But even in 1965, though, when my senior partner came, the staff had to 
find a place in Broomfield or Longmont or Louisville where they could afford a house with uh, you know, a quarter acre or an eighth of an acre, a small yard for the dog and the kids and parking for themselves because usually both adults worked and then later parking for their kids. Uh, my problem with building at the Waterview site is it's right in the middle of the floodplain and it flooded in 2013. It flooded at a later time than we flooded uh, along Old Tail Gap or Cherry Vale and along 55th Street and back into the West Valley because of blocked pipes by uh, previous owners of Waterview at Arap Arapaho, diking the property so that water was impounded by Arapaho Road and backed up south uh, through the West Valley. And I believe this property will flood again in the near future. And uh, there is a poor access to get out because uh, the road, when water spills over Arapaho Road, will block the access for people coming out. So uh, that's the reason I believe nothing should be built other than a park at this site. That's it. Thank you, Bill. Okay, next up is Tom Corson. Tom, you may unmute and go ahead. Unmute, okay. Am I on there? Yes, you are. Hello? Hello. Okay, my name is Tom Corson. I'm a retired CPA. I live on Old Tail Road. The topic is Waterview traffic problems that can be corrected. Please follow along on your Arapahoe Avenue map. During Mr. Shutkin's presentation on February 11, it came to my attention that the proposed traffic plan causes a very dangerous situation and is seriously flawed. In order to exit the Waterview property to go east, one has to go west. While going west on Arapahoe, one must cross three lanes of traffic going at least 45 miles per hour to merge into the U-turn lane to go back to the east all within 100 yards. To complete the U-turn, one must cross two eastbound lanes and will probably also have to use the shoulder. Traffic is traveling east at 45 miles per hour and prior to COVID, there were seldom an opening for a U-turn. To maneuver a U-turn under these circumstances is extremely dangerous and create a hazardous situation on Arapahoe. Next, traveling, traffic traveling east on Arapahoe and trying to enter the Waterview project from the west will have to compete with vehicle, vehicles exiting Old Tail, turning west onto Arapo. Existing Old Tail, exiting Old Tail and trying to go west is already a difficult task. This dangerous traffic pattern lends support to adopt the original PUD that shows the ingress and egress to 5801 Arapo to be from Cherry Vale be a traffic bridge over South Boulder Creek. Using Cherryville would eliminate the profound negative traffic impact of the proposed traffic plan. If the develop is indeed out of the floodplain, a bridge is now feasible. The bridge will cost the developer money, but will create a safer environment for everyone. If the developer is truly interested in working with the neighborhood and public, as Mr. Shetkin stated, then Socala should correct the dangerous problem being created. I'm asking the planning board to address the traffic problems. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tom. Okay, next up is Brad. Mm -hmm. Brad, you can go ahead. Can you hear me okay? You can. All right, thank you, appreciate it. My name is Brad Peterson. I live at 1457 Old Tail Road. The argument we were hearing this evening is that all Waterview opponents are NIMBYs and that Waterview should be, uh, should be adopted because of the number of affordable housing units. It is simply not true that the people who live on Old Tail and the surrounding neighborhood are all NIMBYs who are opposed to affordable housing. The opposition to Waterview is that the project is too tall, it is incompatible with the surrounding areas, 
and there are too many externalities that are caused to be borne by the surrounding neighborhoods. Because Waterview is extraordinarily tall and dense, it has many units. And because at least 25% of the units are required to be afford affordable, that results in 80 affordable units. That's great if the project is consistent with the Boulder Municipal Code, with the BVCPA, and the other community rules that we have all adopted. But you don't ignore the community-based values in the BVCPA and the Boulder Code simply because a project has affordable housing. That is, you don't start by looking at the number of affordable units and then ignore all of the criteria that are controlling. The planning board members have agreed to make criteria-based decisions. What are examples of the controlling criteria that we have all adopted? Under the code 9214, the applicant must demonstrate that the height of the buildings is in general proportion to the height of existing buildings and that the project relates well to the existing buildings in the immediate context. There is nothing higher than 35 feet anywhere in the surrounding areas. Nine of the 10 proposed water view buildings are in excess of 35 feet and one is 54 feet, four inches. That's not consistent. There is no reason to grant Zocalo a variance. It's doing nothing more than providing the bare minimum, even though it promised 40% in the land use review is reduced that to 25% now. And there is nothing in the Boulder Valley uh, Comprehensive Plan guiding principles that it's satisfying. Thank you for your time and appreciate your, uh, your courtesies. Thank you, Brad. Okay, our next few speakers are Craig Farana, Barbara Corson, Brian Gray, Dan Williams, and Gordon McCurry. So Craig, you're up next. Let me get you unmuted. You should be, you should be ready to go. Yes, Jean, can you hear me? You can. Mm -hmm. uh, Craig Ferraro, 1711 Bluebell Avenue. I teach graduate level courses on real estate at the Leeds School of Business. One of my classes attends a planning board or a city council meeting every year. For those of you on the board for a few years, you may remember my class in a meeting concerning the change in use of a cabin at Chautauqua. Two years ago, we heard about the removal of an overlay limiting development on the Lower Hill area. This year, you heard about Marpa House. In the debrief on the overlay discussion, a student told me he didn't understand something. The city of Boulder wants more housing. Why does it make it so difficult to allow more housing to be built? It led to some interesting discussion on supply and demand and zoning policy. So I'm here to ask you the same question. We know that Boulder needs more housing. Why are we making it so difficult to have more housing built? Waterview is an opportunity to build more housing. Other speakers will talk about what Waterview will bring to Boulder. I want to talk about one asset of Waterview which, that can be overlooked, a great development team. I met David Zucker over 30 years ago when I moved to Denver. And although we don't see each other very often, as a real estate professional, I have followed what David and Zocalo Community Development have accomplished in building both market rate and affordable housing. David is a developer who does what he says he will do which we all know is not the case with some developers. And from what I've seen, the entire development team knows Boulder and is committed to develop a project which is great for the city and everybody who will live in Waterview. They've had numerous meetings with neighbors and made significant modifications to their overall plan in response to those meetings. So what I ask you now is to approve Waterview as proposed. It's a great project that brings inclusionary affordable housing to Boulder while reducing traffic and it will be developed by a committed, experienced development team. Any city would love to have this combination. Let's get housing built in Boulder. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Okay, next up is Barbara Corson. Let's see. Barbara, you should be able to go ahead. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, my name is Barbara Corson. I'm a 50 year resident of Boulder and I've been a teacher for 30 years and I'm now retired and I live on Old Tail Road. To begin with, the proposed Waterview project has approximately 15 acres of land of which only the front south 6.9 acres are being proposed for the actual development of 317 dwelling units. My calculation shows a density of approximately 46 dwelling units per acre on the proposed buildable acreage. 
In Socalo's presentation on February 11th, Mr. Shutkin stated, Mr. Shutkin stated a density of 21 to 22 dwelling units per acre. Why the discrepancy in density calculation since there is no development on the Northeast portion of the land? Only 152 dwelling units should be allowed on the buildable 6.9 acres. The proposed development of 317 dwelling units is not suitable for 6.9 acres. The development belongs on the entire 15 acres. I am for affordable housing, but it needs to be on 15 acres. Why wasn't the entire site used for the 317 units to achieve 21 units per acre as Mr. Shutkin stated? For this site review, what is the true verifiable density of this development without wetlands? My second objection is to Zakala's plans to reduce the city of Boulder flood limits for high hazard and conveyance. In 2013, my home was flooded. No one could access my home and we were unable to leave. The majority of the water from South Boulder Creek floodplain empties directly into 5801 Arapahoe. This proposed project would create a damming effect, increasing the flooding risk to the adjacent properties to the west, east, and south. The proposed site has been denied development several times since 2001, 20 years ago. What has changed other than four to 10 feet of fill dirt to elevate the development even higher? The proposed development only creates a more dangerous situation for this entire area. Because of all the problems involved, 317 dwelling units are not suitable for 6.9 acres. I ask you to the planning board to please review the, um, these issues. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Barbara. Next up is Brian Frey. Oh, I saw Brian. There we go. Brian, you should be able to go ahead. Great. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, my name is Brian Fry. I am a young professional in the Boulder community at 1975 30th Street. And I'm here to voice my support for uh, this project. I've heard some folks say that uh, we can't look at affordable housing before considering the criteria, bringing up the numbers and the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. And I just want to give a point of clarification that the Waterview project meets more than 60 different provisions from the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, uh, Transportation Master Plan, and the climate commitment. Uh, but really what I'm here to talk about is the people, the essential workers, the backbone of the Boulder economy. Um, these are folks that really are struggling uh, to be in the Boulder community and are forced elsewhere. Affordable housing is a crisis in the Boulder community, and I will support any project that will help us take strides to meeting our affordable housing goals. And this project does that. Um, you know, th this project has already cut the affordable units by, I believe it was 40% uh, due to opposition on this project. Uh, but still, there's quite a few affordable units that it can offer. Um, and I, I really believe we have to talk about the affordable housing component that this project brings uh, first. And that is why I support this project. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next up is Dan Williams. Dan, you can go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dan Williams. I live at 1375 Redwood Avenue in Boulder. Uh, 1375 Redwood is a single family house. I've lived here for about 15 years. Uh, when I moved to Boulder, it was expensive, but still achievable for a youngish professional who wanted to come and bring his family here. And that was an exciting possibility. And what we've heard in the last few years is that's not the case uh, for young professionals who want to move to Boulder. And what Boulder desperately needs is ways to make the reality that I had and many, many of the people uh, on this meeting have had, which is to have an affordable place to live. And the Waterview Project does that. It does that in an incredibly thoughtful way. I'm at a point in life now where I have uh, young adult children and 
I talk with them about where they would want to live. And the sad reality is Boulder is not a community they could live in because it's too expensive for someone just starting out to live in. And that's reflected in Boulder's population, which is getting older and older and older. And if we want to make Boulder to uh, Boulder's future to be an inclusive place for people like we found it when we all moved here, we need to support different types of communities than the ones we moved into, i.e. single family housing is not going to be the future of Boulder if Boulder is going to have a diverse community, including young people and old people and including people of color along with white people. Just briefly, one issue we heard about was water, both hydrology and in terms of flood issues. And I will say I was uh, really impressed with the presentation tonight, which shows that these issues have been studied. FEMA has signed off on the flood issue and Steve Blake did a great job explaining the hydrology. That's the science of it. I understand there's some anecdotal views about what people saw, but when science looks at it, this is a project that is consistent with the, the water interests in terms of flooding and hydrology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Okay, next up is Gordon McCurry. Gordon, you may go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Hi, my name is Gordon McCurry. I'm a professional hydrologist hired by some of the residents near the Waterview property to look into hydrology issues. And I'd like to touch upon three of those this evening. The first is that the first is that the modeling included in the 2019 Lomer application report, which presumably was the report used in the modeling, excluded any flows in the West Valley. Thus, the Lomer itself might not accurately reflect flooding in the area. As we've heard and seen, the Waterview property was inundated in the 2013 flood, and that flood is, is, was less than a 100-year event. While the 100-year flood mapping shows the central part of the Waterview property to be dry, this further suggests that the current flood modeling is incorrect by not including West Valley flows. The Lomer thus does not appear to recreate the historic patterns of flows from off-site. Uh, I encourage the planning board to verify the accuracy of the flood predictions in this regard. The second point is that the current development plans do not upscale the sanitary sewer main. This could put undue burdens on the existing systems. Uh, the utility report itself recommends the sanitary sewer main to be upsized from a 36 to 42 inch uh, diameter pipe, but this is not in the plans. The third issue is that the environmental site assessment report for the site states that asbestos and leachate field residuals are both likely to exist in site soils. Um, these should be investigated and remediated as part of the development so that Waterview construction workers and residents are not exposed to these contaminants should this project be approved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon. Okay, next up is um, our next few speakers. We have Stephen Brandt, Craig Peterson, Christopher Cox, Hannah George, and Benjamin Holland. So next up will be Stephen Brandt. Stephen, you can go ahead. Uh, thank you. Stephen Brandt, uh, 2195 King Avenue. And I'm also an investor in this project, although I'm speaking on my, for myself and not as a uh, project representative. Um, I think it's important to know that uh, a project like this in our town doesn't come along very often. And with 80 local investors uh, supporting it, I think it speaks to uh, not only the, the needs that have been so eloquently described by others, but also the opportunity that we have to leverage what we're fortunate to have in terms of a, a fairly uh, well-off population that looks at these opportunities and says, when we have something that checks off everything that Boulder's been talking about for the last 10 or more years, it's a, probably a good uh, opportunity to get involved with and something we can be proud of. Uh, the project has everybody's talked about in terms of the market and the uh, affordable housing opportunities, supporting the uh, employment in East Boulder, the LEED certification, the sustainability, the integrated mass transit, the multi-use trails, 
the uh, multi-use project with retail commercial, the decrease in inbound commuting. I'm not sure we could create a list more thorough than this. And I would strongly uh, res and respectively ask the planning board to uh, approve our application and move this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I, next up, I have Craig Peterson, but I'm not seeing Craig Peterson on the list. Craig, if you are here, please shoot me a message um, in the chat and let me know if there's a different name that you're under. Um, after that, we have Christopher Cox. I am not seeing, let's see. Oh. Okay, not seeing Christopher Cox. I see a Chris, but I am not sure if that is Christopher Cox. Um, okay, I know I do see Hannah George. So we'll go with Hannah George. Hannah, you can go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Planning Board and your staff for um, and staff for your service to our community. My name is Hannah George and I live at 4665 Ingram Court in Boulder. I am a farm worker, a volunteer snow shoveler for elders, a native plant gardener, an avid hiker, and your biracial neighbor who would benefit from affordable housing. Boulder and frankly the entire nation needs more affordable housing that moves us closer to the inclusive vibrant, sustainable future that we need. The proposed Waterview project is attractive, inviting and ideal for creating a diverse, sustainable and wonderful community. Waterview is within biking distance of both organic farms and urban amenities. Isn't that the Boulder dream? It sure is mine. While I lament the decrease of affordable units from what was originally proposed, I applaud the project as a step in the right direction for more folks to enjoy all that Boulder has to offer with smart, very habitable density. It seems like we all agree on building more affordable housing. Let's stop outsourcing affordable housing to other communities and force essential workers to commute from the communities and start building Waterview and other affordable housing in Boulder. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Okay, I think we've got a few of the next speakers are not here either. So um, I'm not seeing Benjamin Holland, who's next on the list, um, or Caleb Schauf. Let's see, is Caleb here? Okay, I see um, Amanda Stark Rankins. Here we go. So Amanda, are, uh, I'm wondering if that's one of these other names, um, Benjamin Holland or Craig Peterson. Ah, Ben Holland, I see. All right, Amanda, or um, Ben under Amanda. There you go. You should be able to let go now. All right, can you hear me? We can. All right, wonderful. Sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, my name is Ben Holland. I'm a Boulder resident. I've lived here for over 10 years and I work at the environmental nonprofit Rocky Mountain Institute or RMI. I'm in support of this project because it is very much in keeping with the views and priorities of RMI's urban transformation team, which is a team that among many things is focused on reducing emissions by reducing uh, dependence on automobiles and improving the way we design our communities. So many of our peers in the climate community are waking up to a realization that in order to address climate change, we must rethink the way we design our communities. To put it bluntly, there's simply no pathway to meeting our climate goals if we do not embrace an alternative to the status quo, which has been autocentric housing and development policies that more or less require people to own a vehicle and put undue burden on those that cannot afford to own a vehicle. Transportation, of course, is the largest source of emissions in Colorado and in the US. And while technologies like electric vehicles will play a critical role in addressing those emissions, we still need to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And in fact, our team's analysis, analysis shows that under the, even under the most optimistic electric vehicle adoption scenarios, we'll fall, fall far short of our climate goals unless we reduce VMT. 
And as Bill Holicky mentioned earlier, the project, this project prevents or provides tremendous VMT reduction be benefits compared to the status quo. And of course, Arapaho is a critical transportation corridor. And a key element of that corridor is a bus rapid transit line that will provide high quality, frequent service to the heart of our city. However, we cannot reasonably expect that we'll fully realize that vision without providing the kind of walkable mixed use development that the Waterview project represents. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Ben. Okay, next on the list, I have Caleb Scalf, and I'm not seeing Caleb on the list. So then our next few speakers are Linda Spaulding, Lisa Spaulding, pardon me, Clark Atkinson, Donald David Glover, Katia Lord, and Brian Smith. I apologize. I um I think I'm just getting a little tired and not quite seeing all the letters correctly. So Lisa, you're up next. You can go ahead. Thank you, Jean. I'm sure you're tired. <laughs> I, I live at 1135 J Street, and I would like to focus on the 4,500 87 square foot restaurant, brew pub, or tavern in building one. It's supposed to have 144 indoor seats, 50 outdoor seats, and the potential to stay open until 2 a.m. We know there are very few units that could accommodate families, the two and three bedroom units. And two of these two bedroom units are directly above what will be a bar from 10 to two if these hours are allowed. The build, building one is zoned RH4 and under the land use code, that use is NA or non, not applicable. I assume the additional specific requirements referred to by not applicable would apply under restaurants, brew pubs, taverns with outdoor seating within 500 feet of a residential use model. This is the size, 500 feet is the size of a long block. The apartments are directly above this large space. The only concessions to the residents would be the seating capacity outdoors would not be larger than indoors, parking requirements, and limiting outdoor music or entertainment until 11 p.m., and requiring the observance of the city's sound levels, which all of you planning board members will understand, are almost impossible to enforce us even in the middle of the city because you were all at the River and Woods hearing. I would just like to know how this arrangement realistically will accommodate the grocery clerks, nurses, auto mechanics, bus drivers, and teachers and their families who must get enough sleep to wake up in the morning and go to work. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, next on the list I had Clark Atkinson, but I think he's part of the um, applicant team. That, is that that's correct, Clark? That's correct. And so many others have spoken thoughtfully regarding the values and uh, heart and soul of this community. I'm, I'm going to yield the time. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Clark. Um, next after that, we have David Glover. I am not seeing David Glover on the list. David, if you're here, please message me. Um, and then after that is Katia Lord. I'm not seeing Katia either. And then after that is Brian Smith. Uh, Brian, okay, you should be able to go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? You can. Uh, my name is Brian Smith. I live at 3840 Broadway in Boulder. Uh, thank you for giving us the chance to speak uh, about this water redevelopment. Um, I'm in support of the development. I've lived in Boulder for over 15 years. Um, for the past 10 years, I've been a key decision maker in two or three small businesses that are based in East Boulder, located within one mile of 55th and Arapaho. Every single one of these businesses has employed between 10 and 15 people, and we've always struggled to retain employees. I think it's important to note that these employees are not hourly workers. Um, it's a range from hourly workers in the warehouse 
all the way up to people that are making six figures as executives with over 10 years of experience. They cannot afford housing in Boulder. And this is commonly one of the main reasons they cite for leaving the companies that I've worked for. Um, I support this project because I want to live in a diverse city. And I think that the small business community in Boulder is critical to having a diverse ecosystem that is um, not as white as Boulder is right now and uh, includes people who do things uh, that are not working for Google or other major tech companies. Um, I hope the planning commission will carefully consider this project and approve it so that we can uh, have the future that everyone wants. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Brian. Okay, next on the list, we have Lisa Andron Peterson, and I'm not seeing Lisa in the um, list of attendees. Um, Elizabeth Don Williams asked to be moved down. And let's see, no, the next speakers after that are Kathleen McCormick, Judith Renfro, Mark Bloomfield, Will Tour, Karen Holweg, and then we'll come back to Elizabeth Don Williams. So I think then next up will be Kathleen McCormick. Kathleen, you can go ahead. Oops. Uh, there you go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Hi, good evening and many thanks to the planning board members. I'm Kathleen McCormick and I've lived for 28 years at 3055 11th Street and raised two kids here when middle-class families could still do that. As a journalist, I've written articles and reports on affordable housing for the Urban Land Institute and the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. I also chair the Boulder Arts Commission and affordable housing is perpetually the number one concern for the arts community. However, I speak tonight for myself in support of the Waterview Project and all the folks who work in Boulder but can't afford to live here especially our amazing essential workers. Waterview would create a new neighborhood like the Holiday neighborhood in an area of East Boulder that has very little housing and many thousands of jobs. The site meets Boulder's criteria for a 15 minute neighborhood. It has a bus stop on Arapahoe, a major transit route, and it's linked to Boulder's walking and biking trails. This sustainable low carbon neighborhood would be mixed use with small local food and service businesses a community center and garden and open space. It would be intentionally mixed income, now rare in Boulder, with 80 deed restricted permanently affordable rental homes of different sizes mixed in with market rate rental homes. The developers are not paying in lieu or building the affordable units off site. Waterview is exactly the scenario that leads to more diverse and cohesive communities. It's a shame that as a concession to residents south, south of Arapahoe, so few essential workers, workers will get to live here. Some 54 affordable units were backed out of the plan, buildings were lowered, and parking spaces increased. Parking gets land rather than people. We need many more workforce homes, and I respectfully urge you to approve the Waterview plan to advance toward the inclusive and diverse community we and our comp plan say we want to be. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay, next up is Judy Renfro. Judy, you should be able to unmute. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, my name is Judy Renfro. I live at 1460 Wonderview, south of the proposed development, and I'm one of those terrible people who opposes it. I compliment the developer on a beautiful presentation and rounding up so many diverse people to support it. However, I don't believe that this really small unit type of development is what Boulder needs in terms of housing for its young professionals and entry level workers. But more than anything, we, I oppose it because of the urban use and the restaurant, which is just so incompatible there with amplified music on the outdoor patio until 11 o'clock at night, the patio being five feet from the sidewalk. And as Lisa Spalding pointed out, one of some of the 
affordable family units above that. It's just extremely incompatible and not very useful. And that has been very much overlooked in everybody's presentations. And my request would be that this part of the plan be sent back to the drawing board and instead something more useful, such as a convenience grocery store, maybe a luncheonette for workers in the area and other convenience shopping be placed there. Um, the other thing is that the East Boulder subcommunity plan so far has been very concerned about the conveyance zone for the floods all along Rapaho. And none of the concepts on the city's website show more housing, more development in that area. This one may just stay there sticking out like a sore thumb all by itself. And I don't think that's appropriate for one person to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Okay, next up is Mark Bloomfield. Mark, you can go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? You can. Great. Mark Bloomfield, I live at 289 Seven Hills Drive in Boulder. First, I wanna say thanks to Planning Board for the hard work that y'all do. I'll include staff in that as well. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Just a couple of quick disclaimers. I'm a Boulder County Planning Commissioner, but my com comments tonight are my own. In a former career, I did some energy analysis for Waterview, though I'm no longer involved in the project. Waterview is an excellent opportunity for Boulder to start walking the talk of racial and social inclusion, of environmental protection, of 15 minute neighborhoods. We're fortunate that we have a developer that's in alignment with many of the goals of the community and has the ability to execute. Um, I'd ask planning board to look out for the interest of the entire community, especially the workers who are a fundamental part of the fabric of Boulder, but struggle to be able to live here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, next up we have Will, Will Tour. Um, let's see, as Will, I am not seeing Will on the list at the moment. So then we have Karen Holweg, uh, Chelsea Castellano, and Elizabeth Don Williams. So Karen, are you, st Karen still here? Okay, Karen, you can go ahead. My name is Karen Holweg and I live in South Boulder in a townhouse. I have followed and, and commented on the project over the last couple of years and my interest stems from my involvement in South Boulder Creek flood issues. I have two water related concerns about the Waterview project. First, the wetlands and natural areas. Sloan and others have noted that they will, that the wetlands and natural areas will be protected We've seen how open space in mountain parks and private lands have been degraded by the use of hundreds of residents and, and dogs. So my question is how will the proponents protect the wetlands and natural areas um, that as proposed? Second, um, Bill Holicky said that the project is out of the 100 year floodplain but given flood risks, as mentioned by the CU Environmental Studies student at the beginning of the meeting, um, said, what will happen to the structures in the inevitable 200 to 500 year floods to come? Um, and how will the development deal with those 200 and 500 year floods? These issues need to be addressed because the Boulder Valley Comp Plan says that floods larger than the 100 year, year event will occur, that uh, the city will help people protect themselves from flood hazards and um, will protect aquatic wetland and riparian ecosystems. So I'm eager to hear the answers to these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Okay, next up I have Chelsea Castellano then Elizabeth Don Williams, then Rebecca Davies. Okay. Okay, Chelsea, you can go ahead. 
thank you. Hi, I'm Chelsea Castellano. Uh, I live in South Boulder. I'm a sustainability professional at a federal lab. I'm on the board of Boulder Transportation Connections, and I'm an organizer with Bedrooms Are For People. I'm invested in this community, and while I haven't lived here for 43 years, I do believe that my more recent experience trying to find um, a desirable and affordable place to live may be more relevant than it, than it was in the 1970s. Um, but if Boulder wants to welcome diversity and young families and graduate students and um, and artists and scientists and the working class into Boulder, then you, the planning board, have to give us more options and opportunity to, to live here. When my husband and I were looking to buy a home in this community that we love, you know, there were about three or four listings on the map that we could afford. And so um, we just need more housing in Boulder. And this is such an excellent project that um, has addressed all of the key issues that we have said we want addressed in housing. It offers uh, 600 places to park your bike, um, a brew pub, which is an amazing Boulder amenity. I live just a few blocks away from uh, from Southern Sun and I wish it was a little closer. So I think that would, that would be amazing. Um, the on-site affordable options, the renewable energy, the location. Um, there's just nothing about this project that doesn't address what we have been saying we want in housing projects. So I just urge you to, to walk the talk and approve this project um, as it stands. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Next is Elizabeth Don Williams and then Rebecca Davies. Don, you can go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Dear Planning Board, I live in Southeast Boulder. I work as a nurse in this community and I've lived in Boulder for 60 years. For over 40 of those years, I have worked alongside nurses, firemen, EMTs, police officers, and other essential workers in this community. I am in the support of affordable housing in Boulder. I would like to ask the planning board to please require the developers of this development, Waterview, to place a bridge over South Boulder Creek so there's a safe second ingress and egress into and out of the Waterview neighborhood. This will create the safest situation, not only for this development, but for all the neighbors and the Arapaho corridor and every single car traveling on this corridor. I would also like to ask the planning board to consider requiring the developers to replace half the efficient efficiency units with permanently affordable two and three bedroom units and townhouses that would better support the community's need for affordable housing and support our essential workers and their families, most of which actually have families. I understand this would decrease the number of units, but I work alongside many of these essential workers and they actually have a families that they would like affordable housing for in this area where they could commute very quickly to work. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Dawn. Okay, Rebecca, I saw your hand up before and I see it down now. I'm just gonna, um, okay, I'm not seeing Rebecca. So um, I am not seeing, oh wait, oh, jumped up. It's a long list, everybody. Thanks for bearing with me. Trying to get through the list. Okay, very good. Rebecca, you can go ahead. Thanks, can you hear me? We can. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Rebecca Davies and I live in South Boulder at 33 South Boulder Circle. Um, it's a, a multi-unit building, it's three stories um, and it's a wonderful place to live. Um, I think about how if this building and the ones around it were not um, approved to be built uh, a few decades ago, then I, you know, wouldn't, I wouldn't have, um, you know, I wouldn't be able to afford to live in Boulder because um, it's these kinds of units that, that make it possible for me um, to rent here and stay here. So I, I really want those, that, these kinds of opportunities to be available to, to more people who would like to live in Boulder. Um, and that includes many of my colleagues. Um, I find it, um, you know, really unfortunate that I actually a lot of my colleagues um, live too far from work to be able to bike. And I, I work at a national bike advocacy organization. And I, although I speak for myself and not my employer, I, I think it's just telling that 
um, in Boulder, an organization that advocates for better bike networks is um, a place where a lot of employees actually can't, af can't afford to live close to work and therefore they themselves cannot bike to work. Um, I also see through my work how um, there's often a disconnect between people's desire to have a city that's great for bikes and active transportation, which includes walking, um, and also, of course, public transit, but don't reconcile that with the fact that you need enough people who can live close to things to walk and bike to, <laughs> to make those systems viable. Um, if people have to live too far from the places they need to go, then they're not going to choose things like biking, walking, and even public transit um, if the commute is too burdensome. So it's really important we start building our housing to reflect the kind of transportation systems we want. Um, and I think the kind of housing that Waterview offers is, is the kind that I have enjoyed in my own experience and, um, you know, really want for more, more people in Boulder. So I support this project. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, I see no more raised hands. If anybody else who has not had a chance to speak yet could please use the raise hand function now. Oh, here we go. There's a few more. All right, let's see. Okay, I've got Lynn Siegel. Lynn, you can go ahead. Now, I agree with everyone here that's spoken today, but I can't believe that after all the years I've been here, since 1987, no one is still talking about the aerial perspective of planning. And this is the planning board. Of course, we need more affordable housing for all of the jobs that we have in town, but we continue making jobs and then we continue with more housing. And guess what? Each house that comes has jobs that go with it. All the jobs of the construction workers, the, all the jobs, the, uh, the library, their percentage of library, the rec center, all of the infrastructure, all of the other jobs, all of the retail. This is like uh, built. It's a great design. It's beautiful and everything. I'm not crazy about Kwanzaa hat style, but that's not the issue. The issue is this is the worst example of sprawl like on a highway and then you go on a side street it's like a cul-de-sac these people that live here are not just going to ride the bike trail into boulder every day this is not a destination to go to yes boulder's a nice place but there are other nice places that other people have to start cities at not in boulder Boulder's already done it too much in the wrong direction. It's this is a reaction to too many jobs to start with. What don't all of you people that testified and all of you staffers and all of the board people and the city council people and the consultants and the developers not understand about that? There's an indelible de demand there's, it's never going to go away. And these tiny units are not efficient. They are not. No, please. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, next we have Claudia Hanson Theme and David Adamson. Claudia, you may go ahead. Thank you, Jean. And good evening, members of the planning board. My name is Claudia Hanson Theme. I live in North Boulder. In the Boulder Valley Comp Plan, we have committed to increasing affordable and attainable housing, as well as to compact car light development. And projects like the Waterview move us closer to these goals. When I look at East Boulder today, I see sprawling office parks and haphazard car-oriented development, but I also see potential. I see the South Boulder Creek and surrounding wetlands as environmental amenities. I see future transit improvements on East Arapahoe, and I see space for real neighborhoods in this evolving economic engine of our city. East Boulder needs 80 units of affordable housing. It also needs the remaining 237 market rate apartments because the chasm between our permanently affordable housing stock and our acres of luxury homes is large and growing. 
The water view will provide homes for many people who already are in Boulder, but as commuters rather than, rather than residents. And having them closer will help both them and our community. East Boulder is also a place to commit to ambitious transportation goals. Boulder has completed long range planning for the Arapaho corridor with bus rapid transit, protected bike lanes and pedestrian improvements. All concepts emerging from the East Boulder sub community planning process include a transportation hub and transit oriented development at 55th and Arapaho. If we're serious about these changes, it makes sense to approve housing that will benefit from them. I'm disappointed that what you're reviewing tonight is a watered down version of the original concept with less housing and more space for cars than we ultimately need and want, but that is the nature of compromise. Meanwhile, I'm thrilled by the breadth of support at this meeting tonight, housing and climate, climate advocates, employers and workers, graduate students, the bike people, all speaking for members of our communities who, who so often get excluded, whether by housing policies or by the lengthy and highly technical nature of these reviews. I hope you will approve the Waterview proposal tonight, and I hope it becomes an anchor for and a model of what we can do in East Boulder in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Okay, next up is David Adamson, followed by David Scott. David, you can go ahead. David Adamson, I live at 815 North Street. I'm the executive director of Goose Creek Community Land Trust, which is promoting the kind of mixed income and mixed use housing um, and um, community that William Shutkin and David Zucker have very ably promoted over a long period of time. And there are few developers willing to do the beautiful work of bringing us together. And I wanna thank them for their work. I wanna thank all the beautiful people who spoke in favor of it. And I'm certainly in favor of it. And I wanna thank the planning board and staff. Um, it's an exhausting process to do this. It's, we need to make it easier. And I want to thank Harmon Zuckerman for his service. Um, he's an authoritative. The, at the last planning board meeting, he really spoke so well about what planning board can do and the really limited discretion to help us make this process easier. And I hope he will commit the rest of his life <laughs> once he gets off the board and has a couple of nights to himself to how do we make this easier? Um, Malcolm Gladwell talked so well about what happened in a Chile in an earthquake in Chile when wealthy people invited the not so wealthy into their homes. And I, I want to recall that kind of situation a little bit, um, thinking about the folks who have been uh, speaking against the project. And I want to thank them as well. And I, I, this whole process has been beautiful. And coming back to Harmon, I want to say we should have a process that brings us all together. All of us love this town. And I think if we had a better process that allowed us to work together even more intently than the meetings do, we would um, see that we are in a huge natural disaster and we have to work together. We have no choice. Let's have a process that helps us see that we have to have more folks in this town. We can do it beautifully. We can do it in an environmentally sound way. And we can do it knowing what we all know is that people who want to live here are folks that you wanna be with. Who wouldn't wanna be with Hannah George? I don't know her, but oh my God, these young people who insist like I did on living in Boulder are, 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 are you know, worth getting together with. And we can have a process that brings us together on the land. So. Thank you to everyone. Let's work together in this very difficult time and we will be glad we did. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, David Scott, I saw your hand up before. I don't see it up now. I'm gonna just um, hit allow to talk if you can let us know if you would like to speak. Can you hear me now? 
We can. Okay. One, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, this process. I think it's important. Um, we do need more affordable housing. Uh, every day I see people that, uh, you know, would love to be in Boulder, but they're leaving because they can't. They're the people that provide our key services. You know, we've heard a lot of this this evening. There's not a whole lot to add, but you know, there is a dramatic need and our community cannot survive, not the community that we love and that we came here for, if we don't solve this problem, we can't just be a community of people that are the haves and importing the have nots to do the work. Um, thanks for the process. I again, want to thank the, the planning board for listening to this. It's a long evening, but it's really an important project and hopefully it's the beginning of projects on the Eastern Arapaho area where there's a lot of opportunity to take uh, stock of commercial property that could be built into a very nice community that be a, a real significant part of Boulder. So thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, I am seeing no other hands raised at the moment. So if folks would like to address the board, now is the time to raise hand or let me know in the chat. We really appreciate everyone hanging in there tonight. Um, looks like we've still got 60 attendees um, with the meeting and uh, some very, very thoughtful commentary um, from everyone tonight. Thank you. All right, um, Harmon, I think we are done with those who would like to address the board. Okay, thank you, Jean. Thanks for all that, um, probably 46 or so people who spoke that you took care of. Um, can you pull your timer down so we can see each other a little better, please? Okay. Thank you. All right, well, um, so we heard a couple hours worth of public comment there and um, we still have three minutes reserved for the applicant to make rebuttal if the applicant has anything specifically that they want to respond to based on what they heard. And, uh, and after that, I think we're gonna take five minutes. So uh, I'll turn it back to, it looks like Bill Holicky is unmuted and his team. Yeah, and we have a couple of slides that'll help um, talk about the water issues. So I think Sloan is gonna load those up. Okay. And um, so I'll do a quick, uh, a, a few quick points and then turn it over to Steve. So um, I'm starting now. Uh, so there was a question raised about a second access. There is an emergency second access on the southeast portion of the site that was vetted by Dave Lowry and Boulder Fire, and that's for fire ambulances in the case of an emergency. Um, traffic pattern uh, was raised along Arapaho as a question. Just a reminder that that is a CDOT highway, and so that has to be um, done according to CDOT standards. And CDOT has um, very obviously a high degree of safety involved in their standards. Um, questions about whether the projects meet the criteria. One of the things that we forget when we look at these projects is that we worked with staff for three years to make sure every site review criteria was met. And staff did find that they were and mentioned that at the beginning of, of the outset of the, of the presentation. Same thing with the compliant criteria. So that's not accidental. That was a three year process with staff to get there. Um, remember with height, there's, all, there's only three buildings that ask for a height exemption. Two of them are only three stories and the fourth is the high parking in the middle of the project. Um, and we did do environmental testing on the site. And there is a very small amount of cleanup. But other than that, the, the site is clean. That septic pipe needs to be removed. Um, Steve, for the water. Sure, thanks. Um, so uh, on the, um, you know, on the slide here, we're looking at uh, kind of a combined groundwater and floodwater setting. The site configuration is shown here in the schematic plan section views. During field monitoring, groundwater levels are indicated well below the proposed improvements as shown here. In flood conditions, the site cross-sections show the flow area available across the site, including the open space, the adjacent swale, and South Boulder Creek corridor. These paths provide for effective drainage of high groundwater, such as seen after a significant rainfall or flooding event, and will not impede local or regional groundwater flow. Next slide, please. For the lower uh, South Boulder Creek Valley, the floodplain setting reaches a mile in width. Um, as you can see on this section um, and, and the accompanying plan, the existing site is above these levels and the proposed improvements do not impact either surface flood or groundwater flows. 
The, uh, the flood conveyance has been actually increased to accept more water from Arapaho. The high hazard zone has been reconfigured in extent based on the results of the modeling according to COB criteria and, and code requirements. This is an issue of science. It's well understood and studied for the site and is based on the data and evidence obtained during our team's analysis. The hydraulic model is actually um, a hyper detailed 2D model extending from Highway 93 to Boulder Creek. So where the flow goes is well established. In fact, the flood mapping was found to reasonably estimate the 2013 flood extents, even though it was a much different flood event. The analysis has also included the 500 year event. These are requirements that have been met through the FEMA process and included in the resulting mapping. The, the analysis also considers that pipes and culverts less than 36 inches in diameter be blocked to provide a more consistent, um, more conservative, higher estimate of flood levels to ensure flood protection, even with debris and sediment impacts. Uh, next slide, please. We took a, 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 uh, an in-depth look at the 2013 flood event for you know, a, a number of reasons. Um, given the importance of this, we've analyzed the data from the 2013 flood event and its impact on the site and the vicinity. We used all available data and resources from satellite and ground imagery to rainfall data and reporting developed by the city of Boulder and the state of Colorado consultants. Some of the key results and data sources are described here. We won't go into them in detail, but the point really is that for the lower region, um, you know, we're looking at rainfalls that for a 24 hour period exceeded a 500 year event. You know, they basically had in two days, 12 or 13 inches of rain. Um, and that's in addition to the, to the flows coming um, down the main channels of uh, Dry Creek Ditch and South Boulder Creek. Um, if you go to the next slide, I, can, I could show uh, a few images that uh, from this analysis. Um, if you could just advance one, thanks. Yep. Yeah, and then we're going to need you guys to wrap it up soon because yep, you're, no problem. you're getting over your three minutes. Okay, yep. I'll just say here, what we did is we looked at, at the, the data used in the, in the city of Boulder analysis um, directly um, for the 13th and 14th of September and tracked the, the inundation areas. And what we found was that the flooding was observed for adjacent areas, but um, given the, uh, the, um, the, the, the data that was available, there was no signs of flooding for, for the, the uh, Waterview site. Um, and, and I think that's consistent and, and documented these materials that are, are provided to the planning board and to the community. So I'll, I'll stop there, thanks. Thanks, Herman. If there's any other questions about water, please don't hesitate to ask. Thanks all. Okay, we'll do. All right, well, then I think I'm going to call for uh, five minutes, and uh, we'll be back at 1028.
Hi folks, we're on break. We should be coming back. Uh, the board should be coming back in just a couple minutes. I'd just like to remind folks that it is our protocol for the virtual meetings to not put questions or comments in the chat um, to the panelists. Um, the board can't have these side conversations or side questions. Um, it's very distracting um, for their consideration. So I'm gonna ask folks again to please refrain from doing that or I will turn off the chat, thanks. All right, everybody, we're back. And thanks to everybody for sticking it out and for uh, for all the, the good work on the presentations and answering the questions and asking the questions. And um, now it's time for us to deliberate now that we have all the information that has been pre presented to us up to this point. So is there any housekeeping matter or question that is burning in a planning board member right now before we jump into uh, looking at the key issues. John? So, yeah, um, you'll want to unmute. Okay, here I am now, sorry. Uh, there you are. Uh, and I'll, I'll uh, stop my video. Um, just to, I wonder if I could just ask a couple questions directly to staff that uh, should uh, be very quick, but it would be good to yeah, clarify yeah. a couple of things. Yeah, yeah. go um, ahead. Yeah, the one is regarding uh, traffic and access issues. And that is whether, uh, according to the general safety code of the, of the city, whether one access point uh, plus that auxiliary point that was mentioned briefly to the uh, southeast uh, is appropriate and adequate according to city code and practice. And and the, other, the other question on that is regarding left turns that several people have pointed out seem very complicated uh, and whether the city has any views on those two issues. Edward, do you want to take so I see both Charles and yeah, Edward's here, so. Yeah, I can address both of those. In terms of the access, um, yes, the single point of access meets in all code requirements because of the uh, additional emergency access that satisfies any 
requirement under the fire code for additional access. It is not unusual to have properties or projects of this size that do have a single access point. And in fact, the access code presumes that you will uh, start by a single access point and then uh, only be granted a second if demonstrated need. So it does fully comply with all requirements of the city as it regards access. In terms of the left turn and the, the U-turn, um, while it may not be a real normal circumstance in, in all places, it actually does occur in another spot in Arapahoe, just further to the west. And um, we have no, no records of it being an unsafe move or a problematic move in that location either. Um, it is more and more common well, in to see that the when you have uh, restrictions on left turns or uh, medians uh, that are restricting things to right in, right out in long stretches. We have uh, no reason to believe that it's unsafe. The analysis has been done. We concur with it. Um, as you've also heard, we've shared that analysis, not just within the city, including our tra transportation and mobility staff, but also with CDOT and everybody does find it acceptable. We actually believe that that particular design um, has uh, fewer challenges than a left turn out of the access point would have, given that you can make a move across only one direction of traffic and then enter into that lane uh, for the U-turn and be watching for the other direction of traffic. So we are comfort comfortable and confident that it's a reasonable solution. Thank you. Okay, obviously we, we have a lot more uh, curiosity around um, this project that we need to get satisfied. I see more hands going up, Sarah and Lupita. So I actually just want to follow up with Edward on that question because it dawned on me as the subject was coming up about the U-turn required if you were wanted to head, ultimately head east. There's also a U-turn required if you're heading east and need to go back west to get into the entry, to get into the driveway. Um, and that U-turn would be at Cherryvale, I guess. So I'm has that also been studied, Ed, Ed? So there is actually is a left turn allowed from Arapahoe into the access site for Waterview. So that okay. eastbound does not have to make a U-turn movement. There is a left turn lane as a part of that intersection. So it's what we call a three-quarter movement. So it allows that left in, but it doesn't allow the left out. Okay, thank you. Lupita? Yeah, so following up on the questions regarding this um, intersection, the in and out. Um, I know that this is conforming with the idea of aligning the entrance to this subdivision or development uh, to be a, along uh, uh, Old Tail Road for safety reasons. That, that seemed very clear to me. Um, it, it makes total sense. But um, I was wondering if this is something that the city at some point will consider to have like a a traffic light right at that intersection um, just for additional safety. And what would that take? So I don't know if this is something that is considered. It's not supposed to be part of this kind of project. Um, and uh, the, other, the other part was kind of along the same uh, lines that I, I've been in this city for over 10 years and I've seen a number of places and I live in many other cities and going Ex exiting or making only turns in one direction is very common. So um, I don't find this very problematic because I've seen it so many times in this city and many other cities. But uh, I'd like to know from uh, our city officials, maybe Edwards knows some of the numbers of, of places on this city that we have this condition. I'll start with the first question in terms of whether the intersection at Old Tail and with the access to Waterview will be signalized. Highly likely that it would ever meet the requirements uh, that are in place to have signalization installed. And even if so, its proximity to the signal at Cherrywood creates some challenge in terms of the operations of Arapahoe. But I uh, don't see that, that there's any likelihood of the traffic counts ever meeting the, the requirement or the standard for signalization. All right. On the second one, you know, I can't give you a, a number in terms of access points, but I know it's not unusual in many projects to look at restricted access, whether it's restricting the left or in many places we have restrictions that are right in, right out. And it's a fairly routine and regular occurrence as we work on development projects as part of looking at uh, safety and circulation needs and trying to um, really weigh them together to come out with the right outcome. Uh, thank you very much. I really yeah, appreciate like your answers very much to the point exactly the way i like them thank you good um 
So I'm going to just ask a question, Charles or, or Sloan. Um, we heard a member of the public complain that the project uh, wasn't pre-wired uh, for charging stations or solar. Um, but it's my understanding that that's a code requirement. And while it may not be uh, highlighted in the plan, it, it, it is, the project is so pre-wired and, and does have charging stations, is that correct? That's correct, so it's a requirement. Yeah, so it's a, it's, a requirement of, sure. it's a requirement of the recently adopted uh, building code. So they'd have to demonstrate that at the time of building permit. Okay, thanks for that. All right, any other questions for staff before we can get on to uh, key issue deliberation? All right, thank you. All right, so, you know, there's a lot going on here um, that, that could take a while. So I'm gonna try to streamline it to the extent that I can. Um, and that you're willing to go along with me and that uh, we're in accord to move forward. Otherwise, you know, let's have a vibrant discussion. Um, there are four key issues. And the way I read it, three of them really have to do with site review criteria and one with the use review criteria. And, and the, the third one is the use review criteria. And it has um, a number of different components to it because of the different use reviews that are embodied in the, the one use review that we're voting on. I think the simplest one for, for us to start with would probably be key issue four, which is simply the parking reduction piece that's within the site review criteria in 9214H. And so I'm gonna take a negative poll and, um, and ask is, is, anybody, um, is anybody wanting to discuss this um, and, and feeling like they're not ready to find that 4.1% uh, vehicular parking reduction meets the criteria of uh, 9214H2L. So uh, thumbs up if, if you think we can move forward on that one without uh, a ton of dialogue. Okay. All right. Um, then I think let's go back to key issue one, um, which is, does the project meet the applicable site review criteria in general um, in 9214H? I'll take hands. Any comments? Okay, let me turn it around. Is there anyone who feels the project does not meet the applicable site review criteria? Okay, I'll take that as a no, and I'll take that as planning board feels that the project does meet the, the site review criteria. And we can come back to these and talk about them a little bit more. I just wanna get through um, sort of as, as much as we can, and then we can go back and take them in order. Um, so let's talk about the height modification. This is key issue number two. Does the requested height modification meet the site review criteria, including criterion H2F, building design livability and relationship to the existing or proposed surrounding area? Um, negative poll, is there anybody who feels that the mi height modifications requested do not meet the site review criteria? Okay, so let's, let's jump to the use review piece. Um, and my computer just froze up. So I, I know what the key issue is. It's <laughs> does, the, um, does the project <laughs> on balance meet the site review criteria, the use review criteria? in 9215. Um, and, you know, just to remind folks, you know, this has to do with a variety of uses that require site review in the given zoning districts, for instance, residential in an industrial general, um, uh, uh, commercial in a residential, and so forth for the different uses that are being proposed. So is there anybody who feels that the pro proposed uses are not consistent uh, with the use review? Sarah? So I I'm have, um, a, uh, yeah, so the answer is yes. I, I am concerned about the, um, uh, the, the, I'm not concerned about there being a restaurant in an RH1. I'm concerned about the size and the hours and would like us to consider some kind of condition that would um, bring it more into compliance with what's actually allowed in RH4. And then I also, I. I don't know that there's going to. I don't know that there's anything I can do about this concern, but I am concerned about the very high number of efficiency units. Um, uh, I just think a broader 
a broader part of the community would be served by um, more one bedrooms and two bedrooms than than by basically I think it's like 60 percent 67 percent of the units are efficiencies or something um, I don't I sounds like there was such a complicated formula to get to where they got to that it just may not make a bit of difference but um, I am concerned about the high number of efficiency units John yeah uh, my thoughts are closely related to Sarah's um, maybe I better make myself invisible here again um, <laughs> I I was also wondering about a condition that the uh, the apartments directly over the restaurant um, should not be the uh, the affordable apartments. That uh, that it shouldn't be those who pay the lowest rent who suffer the highest noise and uh, irritation from a restaurant. So so these are conditions related to Sarah's. Lupita. I'm, I'm wondering since, you know, this is about development and this is really, I, I, I'm gonna turn to you before you disappear, well not disappear, but you abandoned us here, um, uh, Harmon, on guidance regarding, you know, when, when this development, if the development goes forward, how do we recommend or make, uh, I don't know, is there anything that we can do to, I don't know, encourage strongly the developer that the people that they get uh, to take on this unit really go through a, an equity lens like the city's looking at so that we don't end up with, oh, I'm sorry here, you know, one same kind of people. So that at the end, instead of really increasing, because everybody talks about the diversity that we lack, uh, yes, that's very true. But when we finally rent this unit, is there something that can be done? Is the uh, planning board in any position to require or request, encourage any language that we can use to, to, to so that they can have very seriously consider the racial profile of, of, of the, the renters in this place? I mean, if you're asking me, I, I'd say that the, uh, the, the comprehensive plan, um, the, the portion of your site review criteria that talks to comp plan compliance, um, you know, on balance complies with the goals and policies of the comprehensive plan, um, you know, might get you somewhere into that realm when you look at the goals and policies related to resilience and, um, and equity and diversity um, and, you know, whether you could craft a condition of approval, um, you know, that it didn't run afoul of, of some kind of law and, uh, and that was reasonable and that the applicant would accept, um, you know, that would speak to meeting those policies, you know, it takes some creativity. And, uh, you know, if, if that's something you wanna spend some time on, tonight, uh, then we certainly can look at that. Well, I'm looking at you because you're said, the lawyer. I said law and then Hella, Hella popped up. So why don't we yeah, listen right. to what she has to say too. So, so Hella and you, like I said, you have a lot more uh, you know, experience on that. I'm, I'm just an engineer, so I, I want numbers and I would like to have a, a reasonable you know, percentage of people because we had a very long line of people claiming that they are here supporting this project because they want diversity, they want to support our our values. But you know, invariably, we don't get what we say we want. So I think this is one of the ways where we can actually make it happen. And everybody who spoke about it tonight should be supporting what I'm saying right now. This is what we really need to get to. You know, walk the talk. And and if you. If our lawyers here can help us craft a condition that will be, you know, uh, I, I will really appreciate it. Yeah, it's difficult to create a condition that makes a classification based on race. 
and, and it doesn't matter in, in what direction it goes. Um, there's very strict review standards that apply um, and, and it's really hard to meet them. And I think it would be very hard to meet them as part of a discretionary review. Um, you, would, you, would have, you have to be able to show that there was distinct discrimination and that you're remedying that and the numbers would, would have to correspond according to what the discrimination was and so forth in this particular area. And I don't know that we have that information here tonight. So I think you can strongly encourage. Um, That's what I was using that language because I know we can, we can go completely all the way, but I really do think, especially since we have such a large number of people tonight speaking about these things, I, I really think that this is when we, we as a city really can come across that we don't just come and say these things, that when, when push comes to shove, we actually do it. And so I think this is a prime opportunity, but in, in terms of, you know, we'll, we'll use the language that we can use. And I, 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 I don't, maybe I, I feel well enough based on what I heard today, all the people speaking about it in favor and then the way the presenter or the, um, the developers spoke about the project, all the intricacies of what they're trying to optimize I, I feel comfortable that they, they hear me and they will do their part, even just saying and strongly encourage may be sufficient for them to just remember, you know, that this is a prime opportunity to really show what this city is supposed to be about. Herman, could I add in something there? Yeah, Herman, sure, go ahead, Kurt. Okay, yeah, so, uh, so two things. Uh, um, so, so our department, as we do um, um, compliance with affordable housing projects, we ensure that they're in line with um, uh, the Fair Housing Act. Um, so that's you know ensuring that um, there isn't discrimination um, in renting the units, um, which is slightly different, I think, than what you're asking for. Um, but I also mentioned um, across the city, um, the 20. 2,700 affordable rental units that we have in our city. Um, the, the racial diversity of those units is, is more than, than twice um, the racial diversity of our community. Um, so I think there's been um, you know, demonstrated success over a number of years that we're making progress in that direction. And um, uh, as part of this department, I think we really appreciate your um, your input around that, as well as those who um, spoke um, about that this evening. Thanks, Kurt. Appreciate that. Okay, um, so let's just go back to the use review criteria for a minute, because um, that seems to be the area that uh, that needs to have a little bit more conversation. Um, so it looks like uh, besides Sarah and John, um, folks are generally in uh, accord with the staff recommendation that the uses are consistent. Is that correct? Or does somebody else wanna raise an issue? Okay, well, David, in that David case- David raised his hand. David had raised his hand. I don't know what, you're, you're muted. Go ahead, David. Well, I, um, I don't know if we wanted to discuss uh, those issues in more detail, but I don't um, have any, uh, I, I, I actually don't have any concerns. I was going to talk a little bit about the restaurant, but we can do that more if we, if we want to get into the detail of it. Yeah, I think um, let's do that when we get to, we're going to go back through the issues in order right now. And so um, I'll kick it off that, that I think that as far as key issue one is concerned, the project meets the applicable site review criteria. And so things that, that really stood out for me were um, the all the usable open space, uh, the, uh, the sensitive design, the high quality materials, really good architecture, the complete streets. Um, I think a lot of that um, fits into our uh, transportation goals and our city building goals, our 15 minute neighborhood goals, and the mix of uses uh, really work for me. I thought, you know, we've, we've talked a lot in the past about, um, well, aren't you gonna build your parking garage so somehow you figure out ways to drain it even though the floors are all flat because someday you might need to build apartments in there. 
well, this project took a really interesting approach with the, the single loaded hallways. And so there's just an interior hallway and then all the uh, apartments that wrap the garage um, are just uh, that, that on that one side of the hallway. And so, you know, it looks like they can just dismantle the parking decks on the inside and, and double them, or well, maybe not double because the interior diameter is probably not as big as the exterior diameter, but at least they'll get um, a number of new apartments loaded by that same hallway. And uh, that, that's really neat solution. So I like the, uh, the project for a number of reasons um, and affordability of pro provision of affordable housing is one of them. Uh, the fact that there are 182 um, efficiency units, but only 35 of them are deed restricted affordable sounds to me good actually that you know we're probably getting 182 deed restricted or non-deed restricted we're probably getting about 182 affordable units out of the efficiencies because i don't foresee efficiencies becoming unaffordable but i could be wrong and then on top of that another another 45 affordable units so potentially over 200 of the units in the um, the buildings will be affordable for people who are making 60 70 or less percent of ami so for the, all those reasons, and probably some more if I thought about it, I think the project meets the site review criteria. Anyone else want to add in? Sarah? So I, I agree that uh, given the very, the modifications that are requested are, are, are applicable given the um, permanent affordable housing on site. I do have a couple of concerns um, that uh, I had before Karen Hallweg had mentioned them. Um, I am concerned about, uh, the presence of the dog run right near the wetlands. And um, just curious, that, that concerns me because I do think that raises the potential for um, some contamination of what are apparently very active wetlands. Um, possibly there is a, there does seem to be a quadrant in the southwest corner that is not developed and it seems to be a sort of a grassy knoll and perhaps the developer, the applicant could consider transferring the dog run to that part of the, of the um, parcel. Um, uh, and I do have these concerns about the, the U-turn, but, you know, according to, to Edward, that is, uh, that fits with um, CDOT code and he's not worried. And if he's not worried, then I won't worry about it either. Anyone else? David, and then Lisa. David, you'll have to unmute or I'm gonna just go to Lisa. <laughs> Take your mute off, David, there I you go. I totally uh, lost my, ma my mouse pointer there. It was really crazy. Uh, so I'm um, sorry about that. I hate to delay things. That's okay. And, um, yeah, I, I, I will just say that um, I, I agree it meets the site review criteria. Um, uh, I, I do think that um, the uh, three-way uh, ingress, ingress, egress point is something that we talked at length about at concept review. And to me, this is actually <clears throat> a really great outcome. Um, it very nobody mentioned that it actually prohibits people from going straight across the Rapaho from this development into Old Tail, which Old Tail um, people wanted to make sure that people didn't cut through that road to get to places. So now nobody's going to be going across when they exit this site onto Old Tail Road. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, it just shows that no matter what you come up with with a traffic solution, there's always going to be a a story about why it isn't good. But uh, but honestly, I think that um, this is about the best I could have asked for. And it's exactly what we asked for at concept review. Uh, so, and I do think that fits into the site criteria category. Um, and uh, as far as the dog thing, it is across uh, um, the multi-use path from uh, the open space uh, area around South Boulder Creek. So it's separated by a concrete uh, maybe even two. I, I don't know, but I, I know it. But I just wonder if that. Uh, I, I guess I don't know what sort of uh, concerns environmentally come from dogs running running around in a place that's near near a uh, waterway. But if it's separated by, a, I, I can think of all kinds of places in Boulder where we have 
parks that people use with their dogs and stuff separated by by a multi-use path and uh i've never heard of concerns about contamination so i'll, I'll just throw that out there um so and it, and it seems like a nice place for it because then people can go on and off the multi-use paths from where they're exercising their dogs so i, I didn't quite see that but you know i'd be interested what others think hold on before you respond sarah lupita had her hand up Yes. Well, so I don't have a dog, but I do have a garden and I do get gifts left behind in my garden, which I work with my hands many times. In fact, this afternoon I was picking up and I noticed some dog left me a, a memento that I don't appreciate. Uh, but I imagine that, you know, in this city, we do have regulations that owners are supposed to pick up after the dogs. I will imagine that even in this development, those rules apply because I do believe what, what um, um, I'm sorry, Sarah brought up is real. You know, you can have contamination of waterways. Now that we're going to be necessarily drinking, I don't know what the use of that water, but that is real. And, uh, but I think that, that uh, those rules still apply in this area, right? That's my only point. And, 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 and vent a little bit because I just have to deal with this again today. I don't appreciate it. <laughs> and certainly another issue is, is runoff and whether the dog park is graded out towards the waterway or not. And, and I wouldn't even consider uh, conditioning the project without hearing from the engineer first about that and, and where the, the water does go that flows across the surface there. So um, Sarah, you wanted to say some more? I was just going to respond to David. It's not the creek waterway I'm concerned about. It's the pond waterway, and it's that is not separated by. At least it didn't seem to be on the drawing separated by some sort of concrete barrier. I think it. And again, I as Harmon just said, I don't know what the angles are, um, uh, but um, or the grade is. So, so it's the runoff into that pond, which the uh, which Sloan indicated in the memo is part of that active and vibrant um, um, uh, wetland. Yeah, that might be the case that uh, if, if, if uh, it would be, I know that there actually is a connector to on that corner as well to the multi-use path. So uh, there may also be something over there, but yeah, it's something that could be considered. Is it or maybe just uh, if somebody wanted to offer a condition that would be that we that it assures that um, that there's no runoff, <laughs> you know, before permitting or something like well, that. Well, so so as, as part of the site review, the applicants already submitted complete grading plans. So why don't we just ask the applicant's engineer if they're here, if if that runoff is controlled. Bill, I don't know if you want to assign that task to answer that question to someone or if you've got it. I was just asking if that was a question. If it is, yes. Um, Charlie Hager, uh, or can you be available to speak about how that works? Yeah, um, sure. Well, yeah, Charlie, yeah, we were just wondering if, if the dog park area runoff was controlled through the site grading or if, if it could possibly run into the, the pond. Yeah, I, I believe it, working with the landscape architect, it's going to have some type of a curb wall around it and a fence. And I believe all of that, we can look at that again during the tech doc process, but the uh, generally would be collected. And, and I believe that uh, the, approximately 95% of our, of our developed area will go to uh, our water quality areas before sheet flowing off towards the north to the pond. And anything, uh, that area will remain native grasses. So it'll be a nice, filtration area headed towards the pond, but I believe that water is going to be collected. And the other note is that the dog run is fenced and it's since it's a professionally managed property, they do remove, I've just gotten confirmation, the dog waste is removed um, daily. So it's not like uh, uh, the description of like somebody's private yard where it gets left there. So, um, and it's also has the curb and it's grade separated with a fence. Sarah? 
I just want to follow up with Charlie, if you don't mind coming back. I'm, I'm not a water engineer, uh, but so when you say 95% uh, will be moved in the direction of the pond, I'm, I'm, yeah. paraphrasing, I'm paraphrasing what you said. Um, not, I'm sorry, yeah, the, let, me, let, me, let me clarify that there's the natural pond and that whole area back there will, will remain, on, uh, we're not doing any grading back there, but on site, I think we have five detention or detention slash water quality basins or areas that are part of the development that uh, per, per the city regulations, Edward staff and his group, we will, uh, we take our stormwater and we run it through on-site detention water quality areas per the codes before releasing it off of our developed area. And when it gets released off the developed area, it gets released into what? The western, the west side of this will be uh, released into that west channel, as you see there. And on the east side, where we can, we're going. There is an existing storm pipe on the uh, along the east side, and part of that, and the rest of it will go to the uh, north. And it'll be released. And where anywhere we have a release pipe, we have to create a natural, recreate a natural sheet flow out to the uh, vegetated area out to the north and essentially replicate the existing uh, drainage characteristics in terms of the, the uh, flow rates. And so Charlie, just, you know, Sarah's looking like she has more questions, but maybe this will help. Um, this water doesn't go out of these pipes, doesn't come out of these detention basins and, and sheet flow out of these pipes into any of the waterways, either the pond or the, the creek, until we're in a basically a, a flooding situation where there's okay. you know enough water that it's actually not just percolating into the ground. Right, Charlie? That's right. And I would say in general, we will go through and meet all of the stormwater, the uh, design construction standard for the city, work very closely with Edward staff to make sure we're meeting all of the stormwater runoff requirements. Again, that means detaining our flow to replicate the natural, the, the current conditions flow rates and also running it through a, a very extensive water quality area. It's typically a rain garden, sand filter type system that helps slow the water, cleans the water, cools the water, and it allows it, frankly, to infiltrate in those rain gardens before being released from the, the developed area. Those rain gardens are the places that correct, collect the waste, whether, the, whether it's wrappers or other kinds of waste, and they have to be cleaned now and then. So that's the system, to answer yeah. your question, Harmon, directly. Before the water goes into the creek or the pond, it has to, by code, go through a water quality system. All right, so are, are we thinking conditions or are we thinking to move on to key issue two? Or does anybody else have any more comments to make about the analysis key issue one? Oh, Lisa, way um, in please. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just say that um, overall, I think it does um, meet the use review criteria. I think when we were back on that one, uh, a ton of work has obviously gone into this. It's been pretty meticulously um, worked through. Um, although I appreciate some of the questions folks are asking, I also think the market demands what the market demands. And, you know, if they're having trouble leasing some of those larger units, that might be something for us to think about overall as a city in terms of, you know, who, who feels like they can afford to live here. But I'm not sure that forcing larger units, if they can't rent them now, is necessarily going to fix anything. Um, so yeah, um, I, I won't, a lot of what I kind of think is good about the project has already been touched on by other board members. Um, so I won't repeat those things, but I do think that it meets uh, use review criteria. Okay, just to make sure we're on key issue one around site review criteria and you said use review a couple of times. Yes, did, I think that's because you mean site review. So yeah, that could be, that could <laughs> very well be. Peter. I had to restart Thank my you. laptop. So I was gone for 90 seconds or so are we we were on three key issue three did we dispose of that and now we're going back up i think so well, if, i was looking at if three you, while if you were only gone for 90 
Well, Lisa and I are on the same. I think page you must have been gone for more than ninety seconds. We haven't been on use Kyushu three for a while, but uh, you know, we're going to go back. We did go back to Kyushu one, and we're uh, we're working our way through that. So, Peter, do you have any uh, any thoughts on whether the uh, any anything to add to the question of whether the project meets site review criteria? I agree that it meets site review criteria. It is a shame that. Now I'm going to save that for the joke for later, Harmon. Keep going. All right. Great. Oh, your last we'll, your last round. We'll we'll be uh, waiting for the joke with bated breath for sure. Uh, in the meantime, does anybody have anything more to add on key issue number one, or shall we jump? Okay. I'll just, so, add, I'll just Sarah, add, does that mean? I'll, I'll just add that uh, um, I was impressed with the handling of the uh, uh, noise and odor issue that was brought up at concept review. I, I, I wanted to commend the applicants for, for uh, addressing that and having a, a really good answer for that. Thank you. That's great. Um, Sarah, does that mean that you are satisfied around the uh, water quality and treatment yes. um, to the point where you're not going to suggest a condition? Not okay. going to suggest John, a condition. John, are, are you as well? No, I'm, I'm satisfied. OK, then let's move on to key issue number two. So we've got three buildings out of the 10 that are uh, looking for a height modification. The basis being that even though they're not um, in the blackened areas on Appendix J that would allow for a site review based uh, uh, height modification, more than 40% of the floor area is dedicated to affordable housing units in each one of those three buildings. And, uh, and so that's the basic, um, synopsis of the issue. Does anybody have anything to, uh, well, uh, we, we said before that no one had an issue with the height modification. Does anybody want to expand on that a little, embroider on that a little? Use my favorite girthalism. Okay, Lupita put her hand up. Yes, I, I, I was looking at um, the issue with the parking, which is, you know, the main um, building that require the, the high modification. I mean, there were some other ones, but that was the one with the largest number of feet. And I thought, given the great job that they did and put it in the metal, make it work and, and the potential future uses for that structure, I thought it was just well done. So it, 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 it just merits, um, you know, an approval for that, at least for that part. I thought it was I like good ideas. I think that's what was one good idea of many, but definitely that one. Yeah, I think this is an area where, you know, we, we heard um, as we talked about community benefit, um, several members of the development community spoke to the fact that they can't sell height um, and that, you know, the, the, uh, the key to getting more affordable housing was to allow more density and intensity of use and not simply height. But in this case, I think um, the, the height modification has allowed for more affordable units uh, on this site. And so it actually worked um, to achieve that goal. And, uh, and I think that it was done in a way that, um, that is really uh, compatible with the character of, of the area, the eclectic uh, character of the area. So I, I think it, it meets the height modification requirements. David? Yeah, I agree uh, completely with that. Um, I, maybe now is a good time to point out that um, because, uh, now my assumption is that because of the 40% floor area requirement for this, that that means that the lion's share of affordable units will be in buildings one, two, and 10. Uh, which, uh, if we're going to talk about <laughs> distributing, you know, playing around with that, and, and I don't know if all of them are. Um, it could be that um, they're just enough to get to 40%, and there might be a few in the other buildings. I'm not sure if we heard that, uh, but I just want to point that out if we start to talk about uh, trying to determine whether affordable units would be on this in the same building with the restaurant, because that's building one. And I, I don't know if if, um, if if somebody wants to answer whether there are affordable units outside of buildings one, two, and ten, or if we needed to put them all there to meet the height thing. Maybe. Yeah, I, 
I can address that for you, David. Thanks, um, all of the affordable units are in buildings one, two, and 10, with the exception of the two townhomes. Yeah, okay. In order to meet that 40% floor area threshold. Thank you. So, okay. uh, if Go I ahead, can uh, yeah, inquire, please. so does that mean that the apartments just above the restaurant are likely to be uh, the affordable apartments of that size? More than likely. So I'm, I'm just I'm just trying to think of how to take that into account with the with the noise that can be anticipated. Yeah, I mean, you think of it this way: buildings one, two, and ten are approximately. Well, they're they're between they're about forty five percent affordable. You know, put coming close to to half of that of those buildings are affordable units. Yeah, just to, to illustrate the numbers, um, we have a bit more than 50% in those buildings that are market rate. So John, to answer that question, the majority of the units above the restaurant will be market rate, but um, it's a slight majority. So, and I'm thinking of the ones directly above on the, on the second floor. Uh, is that gonna be distributed between market rate and uh, affordable? Yeah, so one of the interesting things about housing's purview over affordable housing is that in this particular case, they also have purview over where those affordable units are. So one of the reviews that Michelle has done is looked at the locations of each affordable unit, which was part of her site review submittal, and approved equivalency. So in other words, and maybe Michelle, I should just turn it over to you, how you look at what the equivalent unit locations are. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear that. Yeah, well, as you know, it's pretty rare. <laughs> Well, this is the first time we've had affordable units distributed in a rental project. Um, so that's just one thing. I can't say, well, we always do it this way because it's the first time we've done it. But um, we have done affordable units many, many times in condo projects where they're for sale units. And um, yeah, so I just ensure that the, co the code does allow them to aggregate them into building, into a couple buildings. And that is to allow for um, a light tech project um, it wasn't specifically for this situation. Um, they're still doing, they're using Litex in this project. If you're familiar with Litex, they're in low income housing tax credits. Um, but the, but I look, when I look at how they're distributed in the building, I make sure that they're spread out, that they're not all in the least desirable places. Um, you know, that we have corner units, um, both affordable and market. So some of the corner units, the more desirable corner units are affordable units. And, um, and I did that in this case and, and approved the location of those units. Okay, so- Within the buildings, within the buildings. Okay, so above the restaurant on the second floor, it's not all uh, affordable housing units. No. Okay, that's, that's what I wanted to learn. No, okay. and that's sort of the, the approach that we take, which is that if there are market units there, um, and, and then we can put some affordable units there as well. And John, it actually went the other way. I think from like, if you think about the downtown where everybody wants to live above the restaurants and in, in the hustle and bustle, Zocalo felt that those market, that was desirable from a market rate standpoint and the concession um, that they felt was actually allowing affordable there. So that 50-50 split came from the other direction from their leasing point of view. So it's just interesting how it's perceived. Okay, well, it, one can quibble about whether you, you want it or not. I just wanted to make sure there was some reasonable distribution there of there, I can assure you. And affordable. Okay, thank you. Or that's what John, I, I'll that's tell what you what I, I hear, John, when I look at the plans. When, first of all, bravo, Michelle, that, that that's really amazing, um, the way you've distributed that and, and bravo to the developer for giving you the purview to do that. Um, it sounds uh, terrific to have a project that, that has um, affordable units distributed like that. But you know, I'll also point out to you, John, that I lived over BART intentionally and exclusively for most of my 20s and half of my 30s. So you know, just there are people who do prefer that. Well, I, I I'm not one of them two. anymore. I have <laughs> two, and that's why I'm, I'm aware of the implications. 
Uh, Harman, it's it's yeah. really exciting. Can I just add one more quick item? Sure. To this Go ahead. At least not at least today we have not contemplated sort of a, a really rowdy you know um, restaurant scene. What we've really been thinking about the last several years, and we've in fact talked to restaurateurs, is more like a, a cured or a Babette's bakery. A, a place that's really elegant and nice. Um, in fact, we heard from the neighbors, they'd love a spot where there could be poetry readings. Um, so we've always sort of talked about poetry readings versus rock bands. Um, and we've talked about, you know, baking bread and pizza and wine and beer versus, uh, you know, some kind of more active and, and loud sort of use. Um, you know, that might change. We, we, we don't have the program finalized, but we have a vision of a, of a, of a mixed use building where the restaurant use is is really quite elegant and and kind of earthy and not something that we think will become a nuisance. Well, God bless your good intentions. I hope you succeed. <laughs> we've we've dealt with some <laughs> restaurant noise issues in the past yeah. that make me very cautious. So let's um if if we're Peter, go ahead. I have a quick question following on that piece. Um, I hope it's the right place for it. It has, I've heard in certain conversations and circles that make, that managing um, communities where the, the units are integrated like this is uh, often can bring up more management issues than not. And I don't know if the developer has experience in other cities where they have done this, this integrated uh, setup. And if so, um, what kind of management plans are in place for that? It's uh, something that you know, I learned about and heard about just through policy discussions. Uh, so I'm curious about that. And if anyone from the city had a point on that, especially since this is new, but um, from what I've heard in other jurisdictions, it happens. Uh, can, can you can you elaborate on your question further? Because I, I have the I have in fact opposite experience um, with with managing mixed income projects. But what what have you what you answered you my you answered my question that what I had heard uh, in policy discussions is not something you've experienced in the real world. So I, I can I mean this is this is really interesting for this and and I'm sure that this group will 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 be interested in it. Um, Zocalo has built, um, I think there are seven or eight IHO containing projects in downtown Denver and Zocalo built, or I, or I built um, four of the seven. Um, and so I, I think the most interesting of these was, um, was also actually the first LEED certified project, River Clay. Um, and in that case, um, what we found was that there was, as far as just the marketing, um, there was a lot more interest in the property because it was really clear. We we advertised the fact that it was a mixed income property. Um, it was it was for sale, um, and we sold out in January of 2009. If anybody remembers uh, the the economic strife of 2009, it was a it was not a good time to be selling condos. I think that lead certification, and and a manifest commitment to uh, to mixed income were the two drivers that, that got us to close out in January. As, as, far, as, um, as far as management goes, um, what's interesting is that um, when we think about, um, when we think about uh, bad debt, people that aren't paying rent, um, typically that's um, in, in any given market for a market rate project that's perhaps somewhere around 4%, 3%. Affordable, uh, affordable units, and, and Michelle and, and Kurt could affirm this, are typically half that rate. Um, so the, the affordable units are so rare, and people recognize that. Um, so it's this, this rare commodity really is, um, is, is cared for. We, we have not had any issues. In fact, it's only been, I think, general, and one of the reasons we want to do this is um, that with I with hey, a few David, IHO, David, yes. I'm, David, I'm going to cut you off. I, we we got to get back to deliberating, but thank you for that information. 
Um, any other questions about the, uh, okay, David and fine. Yeah, thanks for um, the reason that I brought that up here was that we were talking about the, the affordable housing and the height thing, but I knew it would inform what we're gonna talk about in the next one. So thank you for that little diversion into the restaurant for a bit. Um, I do wanna just point out too, that as we consider the constraints, um, as many people from the public and have pointed out uh, tonight, uh, those constraints were made tighter because of the negotiations that got us to this point. We had 40% across the site in co a concept review, which would have meant that those could have been just uh, put in all the buildings. So there's these trade-offs. And so I just want to point out that this is the trade-off that happened from reducing, uh, you know, adding some parking and taking away some, some units and, uh, and things like, and, and just the, and, and also uh, reducing the, a building. So uh, anyway, just wanted to point that out. Great, thank you. Any other comments on the special uh, standards for height modification? Okay, and let's move to um, the third, and I, I, the only sticky issue of the four major issues that, uh, that we discussed, at least from our negative polling the first time through, um, which is the use review criteria. And I'm just going to, you know, quickly go over um, the the uh, proposed uses which do require a use review and why it's in front of us for a use review tonight. So there are five of them, and the first one is efficiency living units over 40% in the RH4 in the IG district. And uh, and I think that, you know, I, I'm going to also just probably make my only comment and just tell you how I feel about each one of these uh, as I go. And so, you know, I, I agree with staff that this is um, a criterion that's been met. And I talked about it a little bit before about getting some sort of built-in non-deed restricted affordability through the 40% uh, ELUs. Um, the second uh, criterion is, is uh, professional, technical, or other offices within the RH4 zone district. Um, I have no problem with that. Uh, you know, in general, this if, if we have an issue with jobs housing balance and too many jobs, yes, there are a few jobs in these offices, but there's also an opportunity for people to live and work in the exact same place and to create more of a 24 hour neighborhood and activity during the nine to five hours, which I think makes this a better neighborhood. And, and so I'm in support of that. The, uh, the third is convenience retail sales within the RH4 zone district that requires use review to be approved. And, um, and I think 317 units uh, at 50, you know, 58th and Arapahoe um, be a good idea for people to be able to walk out of their building and get to a convenience store without having to get into their car. So I think that is very well met. Um, the restaurant, brew, pub, or tavern within the RH4 zone district is the fourth use review uh, that's being requested. And uh, I'm not that concerned with with uh, noise. You know, it, I think generally we where we have um, restaurant uses or brew pub uses in residential high zone districts, they have use review requirements, like they have to have the noise shut off by 11 o'clock. We have that condition here already. And, you know, there's not really a lot uh, out east on Arapahoe to provide a place for folks in the neighborhood to go and, you know, get a bite to eat, uh, see each other, meet some friends from the community. So, you know, I don't want to condition the restaurant and brew pub to the point where, you know, everybody's got to go home at seven o'clock and, uh, and, you know, go back into their houses again. I think it's a nice idea to have a place where people can go out and meet each other. And then finally, residential uses within the IG zone district, probably the one I have the most heartburn with, you know, I've been a champion for maintaining as much industrial zone property as we can in, uh, in this community and not converting industrial uses to residential uses. Um, but a lot of that is, you know, driven by the fear of a community that's less resilient because it doesn't have the, um, the types of uses that are available in the IG. In this case, we're talking about vacant land, so we're not replacing anything. And, and I think by creating uh, affordable housing at the scale that this project is creating affordable housing, while we may be losing potential resilience in industrial zoned land that could house, you know, some kind of a, a firm that might you know, build something, make something, or fix something, um, we're certainly providing housing for people who can do all of those things or who are more likely to do all those things than, um, you know, folks who, uh, 
have million multi-million dollar houses i guess um you know i think having a place where uh working class folks can live is a big piece of resilience and so i think that's uh that works for me as well so i i find that the um the application meets all of the criteria for uh use review for all five requested use reviews and i'll turn it over to the board sarah and then david Okay, so um, I would agree with you on everything except the restaurant brew pub. Um, uh, I'm just going to, as always, read what I've written because uh, that's the easiest way to keep track of um, yeah. all of these code issues. Um, so uh, the applicant is requesting pretty significant variance or modification uh, um, from what's in the code, they're requesting 4,000 plus square feet with a potential operating hours between 6 a.m. and 2 a.m. every day, while the criteria, criteria in the use table, which is a little confusing, um, states that um, an RH uh, under 9-6-1, RH4 does not allow restaurants, brew pubs, taverns over 1,500 square feet and which close after 11 p.m. Um, and requires use review for the same category up to a thousand square feet and that close no later than 11 p.m. or up to 1500 square feet or which close after 11 p.m. So there's actually no, um, no um, allowing for a, um, a, a, a site this large. My problem is actually not the size of the of the, the proposed size of the restaurant. It's the hours and the potential noise. And I guess my the condition I would like to suggest is one that has specific hours and um, that are that perhaps are a little more stringent than um, are currently in the conditions. Um, and my rationale for that is this is still this is going to be a primarily residential community and as a residential community, even though when you were 20, you might've wanted to live over a bar, hopefully- Even this 30. Is be, or even 30, you apparently needed less sleep than I did. But, um, uh, and I lived in New York for a long time, so I know from noise. But um, I just think we wanna make sure that this is a community where families with young children can can live and, and the kids can get sleep. And so, I, I mean, I can, come up with hours, but I would suggest that this, I'm fine with the 4,500 square feet, but I think it should close at 11 and maybe outdoor noise end at nine or 9.30, um, at least during the week weekdays and maybe slightly different hours on the weekend. So that's the kind of condition I'm thinking about. So before we get too deep into the condition, let's just ask Sloan if, you know, uh, out of the 4,500 square feet um, for, this broad set of uses, if a restaurant came in that wanted 2,400 square feet of it um, and had a plan and needed to apply for building permits for the tenant fit out and stuff, would they go through their own use review and would planning board get another bite at that apple? Um, so are you asking if they are modifying what they're proposing, would they have to go through another use review or an additional use, additional restaurant? Yeah, I, I, I'm asking if um, if these are sort of outer limit conditions um, for anything that could possibly go in there, but depending on the use that that actually goes in there based on tenancy, um, would 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 uh, at least staff and possibly planning board see it again. Right. So that's a good point. So I would just point out, as um, the applicant pointed out, is. These are really written to be very broad purposefully so that they can accommodate a future tenant without going through a use review. Um, some of our experiences in like the transit village, it, it, they just have a hard time finding a tenant that can fit that exact um, conditions of approval. But from an applicant's perspective, they're designing the building, as you can see, to accommodate a restaurant. So these are very broad conditions purposely, and I think they probably support you cutting it back. I also just wanted to point out that the restaurant is in the RH4 district, Sarah. Okay, so did I, did I say RH5? Yeah. I no, RH4. so you were reading the, the um, IG zone. 
Oh, was I? I'm so, so it, it's allowed with use review. Just just wanted to clarify that. Uh, I think what I have here is use review requires use review for this category. So that's I mean I okay okay but uh, but it, there is no there is no allowed for a forty five hundred square foot restaurant. Um, so anyways, I fair enough. I appreciate the correction. I really do. Um, and I would like to have a condition that limits hours a little more uh, tightly than the condition that has currently pending. So who is next, David? Yeah, I, um, I, yeah. am I muted? No, I'm not. <laughs> no, you're good. Know, it's, um, it's, um, okay, yeah. Let me just start by saying I, I really wanted to um, echo a lot of what Harmon said with regards to the uh, BDCP policies. And I just wanted to read the one that supports the residential and IG district, because I'm not quite as worked up about that as, um, as I think um, some of my colleagues might be, um, mainly because I've not seen a whole lot of data that shows that if we add a little residential next to, you know, in, adjacent to the industrial that uh, I haven't seen a lot of data that says what the negative outcomes are uh, with regards to the existing industrial. Um, but the, um, <clears throat> the criteria that I see is, uh, is necessary to foster a specific city policy as expressed in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, including without limitation, historic preservation, moderate income housing, residential and non-residential mixed uses as appropriate locations, living quarters uh, for special populations. So that, that um, specific city policy is what I, why I think that we are really uh, pretty much moved to allow the ELUs in the residential and IG district. So I, I just, I'm pretty convinced with that. And I, it sounds like there's planning board support for that, but I just wanted to read that. Um, with regards to the restaurant, I mean, this, this proposal has been going on for a long time and we put these guys through a lot of hoops. Uh, there's, there's, there's no existing next door neighbor right on that corner. Uh, we do a really good job of making Boulder very, very conservative with regards to nightlife. Uh, and I just um, don't know that I can support uh, continuing to just like have a knee-jerk reaction that we can't allow some flexibility. We've got Basta in the Peloton that's a highly loved place to go have dinner. I haven't heard anybody in the Peloton complain about it. Um, if you move into the Peloton, you know it's there. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm really kind of, I, I'm, I'm against adding conditions. So I'll just put that out there as a, as a strong statement. Otherwise, I think I'm in agreement with my other planning board members. John. Well, I, Harmon, I think you, uh, you described the situation very well, and I agree with your analysis. But I also agree with Sarah's regarding uh, the concern about uh, noise. And I think uh, an 11 o'clock uh, no noise barrier is entirely reasonable. Um, and in fact, uh, an, an, an external nine o'clock limit on uh, on broadcast noise is also reasonable. Anyone else? Peter? I agree with David. So one of the things I, I would point out is that um, they don't know exactly what they're, they're gonna get in, in terms of tenants. And so, you know, the, the idea that the, the youth has to be closed between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. sounds like, wow, they can operate 20 hours a day. But, you know, I don't foresee there being one restaurant likely that would operate the 20 hours a day. But what, wouldn't it be nice if you lived in this neighborhood that there was a coffee shop that opened up at 6? where you could get your cup of coffee that would be allowed under this use review as a restaurant. And then say a brew pub or a tavern where you could go get something to eat, you know, late at night and then stay there until two when the bar closes, um, you know, or, or one, I don't know. Um, but that, I think that's the idea that there, there's a multiplicity of uses um, that are being proposed and without a use review that leaves room for all of them, um, it's difficult to, uh, to find those tenants and to get that mix. Um, so, 
you know, as far as maybe uh, limiting sound or, you know, the outdoor dining um, to certain hours, um, maybe, uh, you know, I'm not too hot on the idea, but if, if there was a majority of planning board, I might be swayed, but the, um, the approved use shall be closed from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. seven days a week. I actually think that's fine. John? My concern is the noise, not whether it's open. So it, as far, you know, if it opens at six and goes until two, that's fine as long as they're not uh, making loud noise and disturbing the neighbors. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on how to accomplish that or, or if you don't share that goal, Lupita? I, I just wanna, I, I concur with John and and Sarah regarding the timing, especially with families, um, the, they can be open, but it just be conscious of, of disturbances, especially with families being in the building. If it's a, you know, a, a, another building uh, separate from housing is, is that's not a, a big of a deal, but when you are in the same building as presumably flat families, then I think it's, it's a different story altogether. Uh, so just maybe curtailing a little bit uh, in terms of the noise, the opening hours is not uh, the, the real problem here to me either. Lisa, I'm, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Uh, where <laughs> do you stand on this? I think similar to, to what we heard from Lupita and others. Um, it feels a little bit like a solution in search of a problem, but at the same time, I don't want us to set ourselves up to have a problem and no way to manage it. Um, I'm not that concerned about a place being open late. I think I, I'm kind of a night owl. So, you know, I think it's nice to have a coffee shop or, you know, somewhere where you, or a nice bar where you can sit and be there late into the night if you want to be. Um, uh, and I think that's part of a vibrant and safe community, actually, to have more places that are open later into the night and have activity on the street and so on. Um, but I also appreciate the concerns around noise. It sounded like the intent um, or hope was to attract tenants. Um, and by that, I mean, um, not residential tenants, but uh, of, you know, folks who are coming into those spaces to operate uh, restaurants or so on, um, who would be compatible um, with the use of residences. So um, I, I could kind of go either way. You know, I, I feel like on one hand, we're kind of trying to legislate something that's not an issue yet. At the same time, we certainly see this sometimes coming up as a problem elsewhere. Um, you know, so I'm comfortable with, you know, something around the noise. Um, Cause if we don't deal with it now, we'll probably have to deal with it later. Um, but I don't see a need to restrict operating hours. So what if, what if it was a condition that was something like um, no amplified noise outdoors after no amplified noise after nine and no activity outdoors after 11. What's the existing, we, I feel like we retraced these steps once before where there mm -hmm. are rules in place, right? Well, the, the six to 2 a.m., 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. I think is the state regulations. No, um, and I mean, then noise decibel levels. Well, the noise decibel levels are based on the zoning district and how much noise can be measured at the property line. And I don't know whether it's 65 or 55 decibels in this uh, zone district, but it's something that can be measured. It's either one of those numbers. Um, so, you know, that's not going to be a condition because that applies everywhere. But, you know, if you can measure a noise that's louder than the code allows, then there's a violation, period. But uh, right now, the condition as it's written is that there shall be no amplified sound on the outdoor patio after 11. And there's no limitation on amplified sound inside. There's only the 11 o'clock limitation on outside. Um, so what we're hearing is uh, that these three planning board members uh, would be interested in limiting the time uh, where sound can be amplified outdoors and also maybe indoors.
Well, the indoor sound, presumably it's the building has been built in a way that that sound is not gonna, right? Bill Halicki, I see you nodding. <laughs> yeah, and I just wanna say that, that uh, the applicant is, um, is good with what you're suggesting. Um, 11, 11 p.m. non-amplified cutoff and 9 p.m. amplified cutoff. Um, so if, if that's a condition the board wants to pursue, that that's fine. And I would just say, like, just think about still yards, all the changeover, trying to get a restaurant that actually worked there, trying to find a tenant to fill the space is, is going to be challenging. You know, it's a, it's a new spot. So the, the greater the flexibility, the better, just as was mentioned, like maybe a coffee shop, maybe something later. But, um, oh. but that, that suggestion for that uh, noise modification is, is fine with the applicant. Anything else you can provide for flexibility would be helpful for making it a good community spot. Okay, <laughs> um, that, th thank you for passing that along. Um, so I'll, Harmon, should I make, should I propose a condition or start writing one out? So when it's time to propose one? Yeah, if you want, that's, that's fine. I mean, we'll, we'll get to the voting in a minute, uh, it sounds like. I, I would just say that, you know, we had a, we had a very controversial uh, planning board hearing two weeks ago with a neighborhood that wanted quiet and we, we made the, the quiet hours start at 10. Um, you know, I, I, I heard you say nine for no amplified sound and 11 for, for no non-amplified sound. Yeah, but this is not an apartment. This is not the same thing as Marpa House. This is a bar. This will be a restaurant slash bar slash tavern. It'll be something where alcohol is served versus people's. Yeah. I just think it's, a, I think it's my own personal feeling is it's a different beast than MARPA. And I don't, I would hope that it wouldn't, what I keep going back to is what, the situation that we had with- um, River and Wood. River and Wood, thank you so much. Um, and, you know, we spent hours on that and um, it'd be nice to not do that again <laughs> um, without imposing yeah. on the, the um, applicant's ability to, to for there to be a restaurant tavern or bar in there but i'll stop right there peter are we worried about the residents of the development or are we worried about neighbors who don't live there because if they have a problem with the noise people won't live there and they'll find a tenant who will abide by the rules that they need in order to have a viable business no one's being conscripted and forced to live there they'll choose to live there and they won't live there if it's too noisy. If that's what we're worried about. I don't think it's a problem. I think it'll police itself. Well, that's, I, I, Peter, I think that's a flippant and, response personally. It, it, we've just, we're, approved, we're, we're voting on something that's gonna have 80 permanently affordable units. So they're, so they're gonna be people who don't have particularly large number of choices about where they can live. And what we're hoping is that this is a community that will have young couples with children like it's just about I mean I, I realize that there I is get that this. I get that you were you were talking about River Woods and then Marpa and those were about the neighbors not in, internal so I wanted to clarify what lines we're talking about here because they started to get blurred for me thank you yeah I think that's David yeah one thing that we um did talk about with uh, River and Woods uh I believe uh, was um, also different hours uh, on the weekend. I mean, by the way, I'm happy that people are not pushing to uh, limit the open hours. So that was probably my most sticky point was I was getting nervous about this idea of trying to, <laughs> you're trying to make a restaurant uh, have to close so early. But, um, but yeah, the, um, we talked about having different hours on the weekend and uh, the weekdays too. So that's always a, a possibility if, if, if it sounds like the applicant is somewhat flexible and if we want to uh, try to come up with something that's a little more flexible on the weekends. Uh, I don't know how people feel about that as well. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. And, you know, I heard the applicants say that they would, they would accept the condition, but would appreciate additional um, flexibility and that without the flexibility, it's been hard to tenant at the steel yards. And so I don't want to set them up for that same issue. So, you know, I, I, I guess that at this point, I'm hearing enough appetite for a condition on the planning board that I'd really focus on coming up with 
a little bit of additional flexibility within a condition or conditions um, and then see if we can get folks to agree to that. Lupita? Yeah, I'd like to draw um, on the experience of those of you uh, who have who had children, especially those who had the opportunity to live in a in, in a more um, in, in housing that is uh, alongside this kind. I, I lived in my in you know separate houses, and when my children were young, we lived in rural upstate New York, where I had no worries about who could hear me. Um, and so, but I, I am um, I'm appreciative of having to live because I'm in Boulder now I can hear people talking outside my 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 house and and I live in a separate house I don't live in in, in a in an apartment building so I will imagine it's worse in there so for those of you who have had still remember what it was like to have children and having to deal with noise if you ever remember or went through that just kind of think about how helpful would that been will have been having you know earlier quiet hours as opposed to 11, whether it's nine or it's 10, because I think that's where we're going. Really, we just want to think in, in advance to support this new tenants so that I can have a good, a good experience there. At the same time, we don't want to harm the opportunities for the, um, you know, for the developers to find a business who wants to do business there. So I think we got to just maybe think a little bit more and, and provide the best of solutions for both, you know, for both the, the, the developer as much as the future tenants. Peter? I would add that those are shifts, those later shifts are shifts that people can work who may not, it's also employment opportunities and it's the ability, some people that is their means of living as well as servers, as, you know, so there's a lot that goes into it, taking away, I agree with the noise thing. And I think there are ways, I think we're on track with the noise. And I like what David said about open hours, flexibility in that regard. We don't, uh, we do need those types of options in Boulder and there are not many other options in that area at all. You will get in a car otherwise. So this will limit car trips and it could provide employment and a vibrant spot and we, as long as we have the noise um, uh, guidelines that the applicant is happy with, I think we're, I'm comfortable. So are we, are, are, Sarah, are you suggesting just modifying um, condition 4C, there shall be no amplified sound on the outdoor patio after 11 and changing 11 to a different time? Um, yeah, because I'm not hearing support for um, limiting the, out the evening open hours from two to something lower. I, I presume that the applicant will make a decision when it discovers, when he or she discovers whether there's an appetite for a restaurant to stay open until two in the morning. Um, so here's what I here's here's what I write wrote down based on what I was hearing, and totally change can all can be changed, which would be that. Um, Sunday through Thursday, uh, no outside amplified music after 9 p.m. and no inside amplified music after 11 p.m. And then Friday and Saturday, no outside amplified music after 11 p.m. and no inside amplified music after midnight. What do you, what, how do people feel about that? So I, I'd be concerned with uh, the inside amplified music Okay. limitation because I think that um, if you're sit if you're having a late night meal at a restaurant that stays open till one and then at 11 o'clock the music stops okay it gets awkward you know like why <laughs> would you even keep the restaurant open all right so just focus on outside amplified music How to, uh, yeah there's I mean there's a big difference between um, live uh, rock and roll band and uh, and just uh, uh, music like jazz music playing over a PA system. Right. <laughs> so, so, you know, and, and I agree. Yeah, shutting off at eleven, uh, some jazz music playing over a PA would be really jarring. I will imagine also maybe this Bill can mention to this about the the special dispositions 
in terms of noise in, in places like restaurants, I'm sure the acoustics are, you know, somewhat safeguarded in this kind of environment. That's yeah. a question. I think Bill no wants to mention something about that. You want to go ahead, Bill? I don't have to, but if that's a question, I'm happy to. Um, well, yeah, I think I mean, Sarah had already kind of prompted you about talking about insulation of sound about 10 minutes ago, so you might as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the last thing that anybody who's renting apartments or, or flats or, or um, units needs is, you know, a noise problem in those units. That's a, that's a really good way to have empty units. And, and remember, half of those units are market rate. Um, so that concern that it would only apply to affordable units, it wouldn't be true. So, yeah, there are... Um, there are building code standards that we have to follow that relate to how much sound transfer there can be between floors. But in the case of someplace where we're doing something like a, a restaurant that could be noisy downstairs, we would expect to take considerable extra steps to make sure that there's not gonna be that problem. Because again, you know, I'll just speak as the architect, right? If I design a building and the client comes and says, hey, you know, all these people can hear thumping bass all night. Well, I'm not gonna be in business very long. So. Um, you know, we've already actually talked about that with that pre-construction team I mentioned earlier and um, talked about using things like hat channel and dropped um, uh, drywall and insulation and, you know, resilient flooring under the flooring. There's all these things you can do to isolate the sound. I just realized I was starting to get geeky about it, so I'll stop. <laughs> um, sorry. But yeah, uh, you, you know, so I think that there's a difference between inside and outside noise for sure. All right, so, well, thank Bill, thank you very, very much. Um, uh, so, so having eliminated inside, it's the propose, a, pro a proposal would be um, Sunday through Thursday, uh, no outside amplified music after 9 p.m. And then Friday and Saturday, no amplified music outside after 11 p.m. Sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, it sounds pretty good to me, too. I see Lisa's thinking. <laughs> Works for me. I, I would accept that. Okay. All right. I'd be happier with 930 than 9, but that's just because it sounds better. I don't know, for some reason. Would, nine, would 930 make more people happy? Okay, we'll make, we'll make it 9.30 on the, um, Sunday through Thursday. All right. Okay, so are there any, good job everybody. Is there anything else in use review that anybody wants to talk about or can we go to the fourth and final key issue? Okay, so the fourth and final key issue is just that 4.1% parking reduction. And it, uh, I just want somebody uh, other than me, because I've done all three, uh, sort of throwing a bunch of stuff on the record, but I like it when we create a robust record. So, um, David, if you want to handle um, giving some good reasons why uh, you can support the parking reduction um, and get that on the record for us, and then sure. if anybody else has any comments, that would be great. Yeah, we, re we routinely uh, support parking reductions much higher than this one. Uh, there. We have seen the uh, the bike uh, parking, the bike share. Uh, we've seen uh, electric vehicle uh, stations, all kinds of things uh, to uh, encourage um, efficient use of cars. Um, we uh, the Eco Pass program. They're right on the bus line with a station right in front of the, the of the uh, development, and there's a multi-use path going off in multiple directions. So um, I think this parking reduction is not only in line with the comp plan, but it's what the comp plan would expect us to do. So I'm just kind of sorry it went down from 18.6 to 4.1 uh, at the expense of dwelling units. So yeah, I, I would support it. Any other thoughts, comments, additions to David's analysis? Okay, well then why don't, um, it looks like what's going to happen here is we're going to um, have a motion. Uh, and the way that suggested motion language is written, the site review and the use review are both uh, to be uh, approved in the same motion. So whoever makes the motion, um, you're going to want to uh, 
you're going to want to make the change to condition 4C of the conditions of approval that Sarah suggested. So I will uh, say if, if there's no more deliberation, I'll entertain a motion. I'm trying to find the conditions of approval. It, um, Sloan, do you by chance remember what page it's on? Sorry, I, I did, don't have it open. Okay. Um, I think they were around page 24. Uh, 25. 24, 25. It's 25 of 185. It's on page 188 in your pa in the full packet. Okay. Uh, All right, so I think that the, the condition you want, Sarah, is on 27 of 185. It's condition right, 4 looking, C. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Oh, yeah. 27 of 185, yep. additional conditions for certain uses. Okay. Yep, page 27 at the 185. All right, so I'll, I'll make a motion. If any chance right. someone could put, because I have this page open, could someone else bring up the language of the motion that I'm supposed to, I have to read out on, yeah. on the shared page? Yeah. Or I could, I could read it for you, but uh, I mean, that's kind of awkward, but I, I guess. But let's so, let's see if we can, if, if staff can just put it up on, on the screen for Sarah right now. I'm working on it. <laughs> Sorry. We've been here. Gotta, we've been here. We've been here for five hours and fifty-six minutes. We can <laughs> we can wait another minute. And I should mention, I don't know, you know this, but Sarah is in New York City. I'm in Washington, DC. I know. Oh, she so is, she's in the she's East, East Coast. Coast. It's two only two later than two in the morning. It's only two AM here. Oh no, you're not there for the the trials. I hope you weren't there. No, no, I'm here. I'm here to visit family. Um Okay, so um, I'm making a motion to approve site review case number LUR 2019-00021 and use review case number LUR 2019-00022, incorporating the staff memorandum uh, and the attached criteria checklists as findings of fact and subject to uh, the conditions of approval recommended in the staff member memorandum with one change. That change is condition 4B. E. Uh, B. And then it says, yeah, 4B. Oh, sorry. 4B. Oh, B. 4B. Right. 4B. Sorry. The, right. uh, the, the new condition is there shall be no amplified sound on the outdoor patio after 9.30 p.m. Sunday through Thursday, and no amplified sound after 11 p.m. on Friday and Saturday. A second. Okay, we got a motion from Silver and it's been seconded by Ensign. Is there any discussion to the motion? Okay, and I'm gonna make that the motion of the planning board. Um, the planning board, uh, planning board moves to approve site review case number LUR 2019-0021 and use review case number LUR 2019-0022, incorporating the staff memo and the attached criteria checklist as findings of fact and subject to the conditions of approval recommended in the staff memorandum with the following change to condition 4B, which shall read there shall be no amplified sound on the outdoor patio after 9.30 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 11 p.m. Friday and Saturday. I'll take a roll call vote. And uh, David? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Lupita? Aye. Peter? Aye. John? Aye. And Lisa? Aye. Aye. Okay, so the motion passes seven to nothing. And with that minor change to the uh, staff recommendation, the project's approved. Congratulations.
Thank you very much. Thank you for the really long evening and all the hard work. And, and um, you've heard me mention this before, but this was three years of staff's life. So thank you. <laughs> um, um, and like I said, it was it was really a team effort to get this all uh, into all the site review criteria. So thank you to staff. Thank you to you. And, and we really appreciate it. Thank you for not giving up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. This is this is exciting for us. It really is. We've wanted to be in Boulder, um, so thank you, guys, for getting us one step closer. I think that this is. Uh, I think we're going to do really well in the city, um, and I think that we're going to bring some new ideas and inclusivity. So thank you. Thank awesome. You. Remember, nine to nine thirty every weekday is Harmon Zuckerman <laughs> time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Harmon. Congratulations, Harmon, on your your successful tenure as as planning board chair. We'll we'll miss you. I'll miss doing this, and I'll miss uh, staff, and and miss my fellow planning board members too. Thanks to uh, all planning board. We really appreciate your your support and oversight. Thank lastly, you. specifically, thank you, Sloan. <laughs> thank you, she's and Charles there. and Edward, the whole the whole gang. Thank you. Carmen, can I ask who seconded that motion? David. Yeah, it was David. So Thank Sarah you. Sarah and David. I missed that. Thank you. Charles, do you have anything to say or, or shall we move on to the next item? Yeah, we have one matter tonight um, and it's just an informational um, on an update for the um, police master plan. So it's just purely informational at this point. If there's any questions or comments, Chris Ranglos um, listed his information at the end of the memo. Um, you can reach out to him directly with any feedback um, or any questions. Thank you. Okay, so that was that was uh, the matter from the planning director. Are there any other matters from the director? Nothing. Who is, who is, is here himself. The, um, the, the only other matter from the director is just uh, to say thank you for your contribution to the city of Boulder uh, and your tenure on the planning board. So thank you, Harmon. Well, Jacob, I'm really looking forward to uh, watching uh, the department blossom and continue to flourish under you. And um, it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure. It really has. Well, I guess I'll, I'll pile um, on that, Harmon, and, um, you know, not just, I, well, first, I'm really happy that we could send you off with a six-hour meeting. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> before, I, I, I thank you for your service to the board. You know, the past five years have been really pivotal in Boulder, and I think you've really significantly contributed to some very transformative projects, I think, that have helped implement years and years of intentional planning efforts um, in Boulder. And that's everything from your work on, you know, the early bits of um, the, the first parts of the Transit Village, 30 Pearl Spark, um, you know, through a, a set of uh, comp plan updates, um, you know, a major update and a uh, midterm update. So it's quite a body of work. Um, and it's just so clear that you're passionate about the work and high quality, sustainable design and um, more than anything, I think the community and its future. So I really appreciate your thoughtfulness and your leadership and your willingness to always engage in difficult discussions um, and your contributions to Boulder's planning legacy. So um, I, I think we'd all be remiss if we didn't thank your family for uh, sharing you with us on these late Thursday nights. <laughs> and I hope that there's a time where we can all celebrate together in the future. So um, I think we're all gonna miss you. I, for one, am really also gonna miss your gratuitous use of the word foment. Um, <laughs> But thank you again for, for your service. It, it's been a heck of a run. Oh, Charles, that's just too sweet. Thank you so much for those words. I really appreciate that. Lupita. Yes, I wanted to say thank you. And I, I promised myself that I was going to have a toast in your name today. <laughs> so I had to run out there and get my little one. It's just little Porto. It's nothing special. I, I'm not a big oh. fan. I'm a very light drinker, but I wanted to make this as special uh, just for you. Thank you. I've learned a lot. Um, uh, even though we had challenging starting points, I think we come a long way. And I, I really appreciate all the learning that uh, you have so generously imparted on many of us. And we can count on you on uh, um, teaching us every time when we need to be taught stuff. And so I, I like I said, I really enjoyed uh, my time in the board. I think I've learned a lot. 
and I can see, I think in, in a more clear way, how we can come to serve this community coming from very different places and converge in a place where, where truly what we want is what's best for the city. We just need to contribute differently. So thank you. And, and I hope to get to see you doing all their stuff for the city along the way. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lucia. David. Yeah, and I'll join uh, the pizza in a toast, although I'm pretending there's something in here. And uh, <laughs> I just wanted to acknowledge your fabulous leadership um, over the last year and um, as the chair and also your guidance uh, throughout my tenure on planning board. And uh, Peter and I joined the same time four years ago. Uh, you've been a, a real role model for us, someone to really kind of um, model our behavior after uh, your ability to um, to lead the team and to help us stick with criteria, stay with the plan, uh, and get things done is just um, amazing. But so you 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 do that with a sense of discipline, but also giving us a chance to also express our personalities and to contribute uh, in ways that are you know beyond just the criteria as well. So I think that you strike a wonderful balance, and uh, we'll really miss having that. Uh, uh, that uh, that rudder that kind of guides us along. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm, I'm also looking forward to the dinner. <laughs> well, the, there is no way the dinner is going to be as sweet as listening to all you and the nice things that you're saying. Oh, Harmon, um, that is sweet. Thanks for <laughs> taking care of us all this time and using the experience you had as a in the department in Tahoe. And I think what you brought, uh, you know, just the constant respect for staff and modeling that I think was, was amazing and was something that, you know, I noticed right away when I joined, I didn't know what I was stepping into and there was a lot happening at once and something you held steadfast to was um, just um, respect for, you know, all the parties. And even when, uh, as Charles said, your willingness to engage in some of the difficult conversations. So at this time with you, uh, I mean, I'd have been, you know, on top of Mount Schlitz, but it was, uh, it was close for me. So thank you. <laughs> thank well, you. I'll say I've, hey, I've, John. I had, oh, oh, sorry. oh, go ahead. No, Harmon, um, I just want to say you've done a, a fantastic job of chairing this uh, planning board. I've uh, never seen anything like it. And uh, I just am envious of that ability, but uh, congratulations on doing such a wonderful job. And, uh, well, part uh, of it is just because I, I, I enjoy to... it. I enjoy the, I enjoy being with you guys and, and it just, uh, it makes it easy. Lisa. And Lisa, the person we haven't met yet in person is gonna say I something. know, that's what I was gonna <laughs> say. I'm, I'm sad that one, that, that you're rotating off and I was on for such a brief period of time with you and two, that we haven't actually gotten to have meetings in person. So we definitely have to have that dinner slash celebration. Maybe, maybe we could do a, you know, move from one location to another and check out some of these new restaurants and things that we've uh, dealt with over the last couple of years. Um, so yeah, I, I really, I appreciate your attention to detail, Harmon, and procedure. Um, that is such a gift to have someone leading um, in that way and kind of knowing, um, how the meeting should run. I think it's something that being the people that we are, we sometimes uh, buck a little bit at, but it actually uh, enables us to get work done in a really appropriate way um, in a way that serves the community and without going as late as we might otherwise go. So um, we will miss you very much, um, but I look forward to seeing what you do next um, and to actually getting to see you in person sometime in the not too distant future. Well, you know, I, I spent four years on planning board with uh, with drinks as a normal thing after the board meetings, okay. and uh, and sitting in that room together and eating lunch and, or eating dinner before the meeting together with staff and uh, and each other, and then I I got my last year where I decided I'd be chair and I didn't get to have drinks with anybody and I didn't get to eat dinner with staff and with the other planning board members and never got to sit and chair a meeting at the dais like uh, like all the chairs before me. So there's, there's some disappointment for me in the way that COVID changed my experience of being on planning board, but it'll go back. 
and it'll be special again. So in, in that way, of being out, um, that you actually, um, as co vice chair, I can attest to you did not miss one meeting in the last year. And I never had to chair a meeting. I just, I forgot to mention that. So but you I got mean... to, you got to do some pretty cool uh, chair like stuff, um, you know, <laughs> running parts of meetings oh. and things. And you did <laughs> such a great job on our letter, Sarah. So Harmon, um, I wanna thank you personally. We also had a bit of a rocky start um, and, um, but you, you uh, taught me a great deal and gave me some wonderful advice um, at the very beginning, which I have sort of pedantically tried to follow in terms of uh, always following, always offering up the code that I wanna reference. Um, and just the only thing I'll add to everything everyone has said is that you, um, led us this year impeccably during an extremely difficult time. And um, uh, you made whatever, you made what you're doing seem quite easy. And I just wanna uh, uh, thank you for that. Well, you're very welcome. Um, well, I don't know what else to say, but thank you all. And, um, and so let's finish up the meeting. Uh, is there any, any right. other matters from the planning board? Yeah. Harmon, I just want to mention one thing nobody has mentioned is your sense of style. I'm going to miss your <laughs> the rock a vest, so I'm going to miss that. Thank you very much. So, but thank you for keeping things together. You make my job easier. So, thank you. Very Maybe we should make that vest like something that gets that gets passed down from chair to chair to chair. <laughs> <laughs> the, and, the oh, official, and, the official. You change your mind now, vest. David. And you know what? We always take a picture the last day of that someone's. Oh. So I'm going to take a picture. <laughs> exactly the dais. Everyone smile. You can also screenshot it, Cindy. No, then she won't be have her phone in it. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's true. Okay, you ready? Here we go. All right, good. <laughs> How do I screenshot? How would I screenshot? I know on a Mac. What's the command? Are you on a, what are you on? What's Just your anyone who can do it, do it. If you're on a Mac, you do shift Apple 4 and drag your mouse across the part you yeah, want. Yeah, but it's something else on a. I don't know. I already got, I already got one, Cindy. I'll send okay. it to you. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> Harmon, what are you going to do with your next well, Thursday? Um, I don't know. Actually, I my last Thursday was amazing. The law school put on a, a CLE, a continuing legal education thing on race in Boulder um, with a number of really powerful panelists, including uh, former Mayor Penfield Tate's son. Um, and it was it was really eye opening um, and sad, uh, but uh, sad because it seems like most of the, the folks who all were people of color who were on the panel said that they'd experienced more racism in Boulder than anywhere they'd ever lived. Um, and, uh, and so that's hard to hear. Um, but yeah. not to not to be on, you know, too somber notes. So what am I doing next Thursday? I don't know. Maybe I'll just, you know, hang out and watch you guys. And uh, joint sessions. There are going to be joint sessions. I know. And you can, <laughs> yeah. you can be the whisperer and tell us, no, now that's yeah. when you say so-and-so. <laughs> so you know i'm not allowed to appear in front of you for a year oh so i won't see you guys for a while um let's go to other matters from the planning board are there any any matters from the planning board okay uh hella we haven't mentioned hella and um it wouldn't be a night without saying thank you hella you did so much um over the last five years for me and you even you know did some great work tonight and i just enjoyed talking with you and and having you here so thank you so much well i i wanted to thank you too um for the five years of service and i've i've been there for the five years and i've really enjoyed working with you i think you know that um and i think i'll see you in the future in a different role and i'm also looking forward to that Um, anything else from the city attorney's office for, for the board? Nothing else. Okay. 
All right. Well, it sounds like we've done a lot of debriefing. If there's any more debriefing that anybody wants to do, uh, Lupita? I just want to say thank you to anybody from the public who stuck it out all the way to <laughs> 10, uh, 12, 14, 12, 15. I am impressed. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. I'll, I'll, just mention, I'll mention that the, um, am I muted? No, I'll mention that the nope. uh, uh, municipal building where we're going to be meeting is uh, being renamed after Penfield Tate II, who was a city, uh, a city council member in the 70s. Uh, there was a recall election uh, against him uh, at the time that actually succeeded in, uh, in recalling one of his colleagues who was a gay man uh, after he uh, uh, sponsored the, uh, or after, yeah, after he sponsored the uh, non-discrimination for LGBT people, one of the first uh, jurisdictions in the country to do that. And there was a recall election, which he survived. And now the municipal building is being named after him, which I think is amazing. And that's going to happen in a couple months. But he only survived the recall. One of the things his son talked about at the, at the thing last Thursday was how by signing on to that um, non-discrimination legislation in Boulder um, take, made himself unelectable after that and didn't get reelected. And he mm -hmm. did run, but he didn't win. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Uh, calendar check. Any uh, issues? Cindy, you want to? Um, I won't be here on the 16th <laughs> or the 18th. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> well, we have a meeting. <laughs> um, so the planning board um, interviews were tonight. Um, so we will find out next week or the week after. I can't remember what selection date is, but we'll find out what happened. Um, so the 18th, we will meet our new person and they will, we'll do all the adoption stuff and all that. And, um, and then the 25th, so the 18th, we have a regular meeting. The 25th is your first workshop for the bias and microaggression uh, workshop. And, um, and it does look like we're gonna be having um, a joint session with TAB regarding East Boulder subcommunity um, on April 5th. It does look like that's gonna happen. It, okay, Monday. Mo it's a Monday. Yeah, and it would just be two hours. I think it's from six to eight. I'm nailing that down. Okay. I think it's going to start at six and rather than five, but I think six. All right. Anything else? Just thanks to Cindy. Okay. Well then. Yeah. Okay. Thanks okay. to uh, to everybody. What's that? Somebody wants to say something, Peter? No, just oh. waving goodbye. <laughs> okay. A very special group and uh and it's been a very special time and um and you have a very special staff working with you and just uh good luck and bye and we'll see each other again soon. Adjourn. Thank you, Harmon. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Stay Thank you. safe and